You know, optometry is really a special profession because we do see so many patients, again, double the amount of what, a, uh, of what goes for a primary care visit. So, and we've been doing a great job of expanding our, our horizons. You know, we've had many uh, speakers over the last years that have written books, bestsellers in the field of integrative medicine, but we haven't had a speaker like we have today. Uh, it's, it's not often that you get to meet one of your heroes, and Dr. Gonzalez is really one of my heroes, and I really appreciate him coming here. I think everybody in this room knows somebody or has been touched by cancer by, in, by, at some point. Yeah, I guess it's one in two males and one in three females will have cancer at some time in their life, and nothing could be scarier than the diagnosis of cancer. So today we have the guru of integrative medicine in the field of cancer. I'm going to let Dr. Gonzalez uh, uh, give you his own bio, but I've been following his work for, for a number of years, and I've listened to him being interviewed, and I hope he'll talk a little bit about the politics of cancer and about the, uh, at Sloan Kettering, about the, the story of the Grateful Dead and when he was interviewed a little bit about Steve, Steve Jobs. So with that being said, I'm going to introduce the great Nick Gonzalez. Thank you. Very kind. I want to make sure my mic is working. Is it working okay? I have a whoop right there. <laughs> Hear me okay? Yeah. Loud enough? Good. Well, thank you for that very kind introduction. You know, when Carrie and Richard first reached out to me some months ago, initially I was a little surprised because I, I realized they're optometrists. And I, I asked them, do you have the right Gonzalez? And Carrie said, absolutely. You're the guy we want. And then I learned about your conference, which is quite remarkable, where you have a variety of innovative physicians coming in here to lecture you. I think it's great. Also, I'll say this. I've lectured in, over the last 20 years from Singapore to Israel at all kinds of conferences at all different levels. Many of them are not run well. This is one of the best run conferences I've ever been at. From the beginning, it was effortless, where I didn't have to worry if the plane reservations were made. It was all done to try and make my life easier. So I really appreciate that, Carrie and Richard, for making it so easy. Now, first, an introductory comment. I'm going to talk somewhat, it will sound like a history lesson, but there's a reason. And I promise by the end of four hours, which I realize is a long time and I appreciate your being here, you'll understand why I've done this, because it'll put everything in perspective. And I will weave my, my biography through the history as we go through it. I am trained as conventionally, uh, conventional oncologist. My fellowship was in bone marrow transplant, which is about as aggressive oncology as it can be. But in my office, I do something completely different. It's all nutritional. I've completely changed career tracks. And as you'll see, as I go through the history, you'll find out why I did that. Now, it's terrific that people are getting in, interested in nutrition, like Kerry, for example, is telling me how you know, he's reading constantly about nutrition, both professionals and lay people. And there really, there's been a real explosion in interest, both in the conventional medical world, in the journals, as well as in the popular press. But that's where the confusion starts. Every six months, there's a new book that's a bestseller, and often it has the word power in it, like power carbs, power fats, power protein. And the proponents, the authors, propose that this book, this diet, these supplements are the perfect diet supplements for everybody, whatever your size, shape, form, geographic origins of your ancestors, genetics, religious beliefs, political beliefs, whatever your background, this is the diet all human beings should follow to be protected against the major degenerative, both major and minor diseases of Western civilization, things like allergies, arthritis, asthma, cancer, diabetes, heart disease, hypertension, even to some extent mental illness. The problem is, each book that comes out, each million seller, contradicts the book that came out six months earlier. And in the conventional scientific literature, it's equally as confusing. There'll be a study that says vitamin E protects against prostate cancer. A year later, vitamin E causes prostate cancer. And it's nice that some conventional physicians and researchers are getting interested in nutrition. The downside is they're as confused as the lay people. A lot of this, you know, there are three trends, in three basic trends in nutrition. You have the trend of Pritikin and Ornish, I understand Dr. Ornish spoke here a couple of years ago, who believe all humans, again, whatever their size, shape, form, genetics, geographic origins of their ancestors, political beliefs, religious beliefs, should be on a completely vegetarian diet. The Pritikin diet, which was the subject of a million-selling book back in the late 1970s, is completely vegetarian, 75% carbohydrates, 
15% protein and less than 10% fats, all from plant sources, no animal products whatsoever. And they believe fervently, and Ornish to this day believes fervently with great dedication that all humans should follow this diet, and should they follow this diet, they will be protected against all the minor and major diseases of Western civilization, allergies, arthritis, asthma, cancer, diabetes, heart disease, hypertension, even to some extent mental illness. Then you get my friend Bob Atkins, now deceased. I knew him very well. At one point, he even offered me a job in his practice. And he had a completely different take on human dietetics and nutrition. He believed all humans, again, whatever their size, shape, form, genetics, geographic origins of their ancestors, et cetera, should be on a high meat diet, high fat diet. And the Atkins diet is virtually the mirror image of Ornish. It's about 70% fat, all from animal sources, largely saturated fat, horror, horror, as yeah, Atkins was a big proponent of saturated fat. 15% protein, mostly from animal sources, and less than 10% carbohydrates. And Bob believed to his grave, fervently, with great devotion and dedication, religious fervor, that all humans should follow this diet. Should they follow this diet, they will be protected against all the major and minor diseases of Western civilization, allergies, arthritis, asthma, cancer, diabetes, heart disease, even to some extent mental illness. Then you get the third trend, Gerald Reven at Stanford, very smart academic physician. He's the proponent of the insulin resistance metabolic syndrome. He coined the phrase metabolic syndrome. And many of you know what this is. You know, every six months there's a book on belly fat, how to lose belly fat. Well, that refers to the insulin resistance syndrome. And Reven's a very smart guy. And he pointed out that the, the current Western diet, which is loaded with refined carbohydrates, white flour, white bread, white rice, white spaghetti, the average American eats 164 pounds of white sugar a year, synthetic foods, chemicalized foods, poor quality fats, trans fats rather than the natural omega-3, um, essential omega-6 fatty acids. And because of this diet, we get this paradoxical situation where the beta cells of the pancreas, whose job it is to produce insulin, which drives sugar into the cell so it can be used for energy, get overused. And what happens is with any hormone, the receptors, if you produce too much of the hormone, get resistant and get resistance to insulin. So the pancreas keeps pouring out insulin, the blood sugar keeps going up regardless, and you get the paradoxical situation of high blood levels of insulin, high blood levels of glucose, and you get a whole series of events, you know, with high total cholesterol, low good cholesterol, HDL, high bad cholesterol, LDL, high lipoprotein A, high triglycerides, hypertension, abdominal obesity, that's classic for insulin resistance, and eventually diabetes, type 2 diabetes, which is becoming an epidemic. And Reven said, absolutely, it's because of our diet. And his suggestion about the diet all humans should follow, whether their size, shape, form, genetics, geographic origins of their ancestors, political or religious beliefs, is kind of a Mediterranean diet with a variety of foods. Fruits, vegetables, nuts, seeds, whole grains, some fish, some poultry, even some red meat, some dairy products, good quality fats like the omega-3s, the natural omega-6s. And should all humans follow this diet? Reven believes fervently, and he's a very smart guy, that we will be protected against all the minor and major diseases of Western civilization. It gets to be real confusing, and believe me, patients come into my office having gotten interested in nutrition over the last 10 years and read 75 books, and they're as confused as, as you can be, and it doesn't help them, and they have almost anxiety about what diet, to the point they get afraid of food, which is not helpful. A lot of the confusion in the nutritional world, whether you're talking about the lay press or the conventional medical literature, could have been resolved if only the scientists and physicians did their homework, went to the libraries, and read the anthropological nutritional research particularly the work of one man, Weston Price. Now, some of you may have heard of Weston Price. He's virtually unknown in the academic medical world, is somewhat well-known in the alternative world, and some people have actually read his book. He wrote a book in, 19, well, first edition, 1939, second edition, 1945, Nutritional and Physical Degeneration. Weston Price, like a lot of innovative uh, medical scientists, was not a physician, he was a dentist. He grew up in Ottawa, was born in 1870, a long time ago, went to University of Michigan Medical uh, Dental School, and after dental school, went back to Cleveland, Euclid Avenue, and opened up a general dental practice. But he was a really smart fellow, and he was observing his patients in practice, and what he noticed, which is a very astute observation, is that each generation, and he was following generations of people in his practice, the grandparents, their children, the grandchildren, their dental, their dental status seemed to be worsening, that the kids had far more crooked teeth, they had gingivitis at an earlier disease, far more cavities than their parents who had far more gingivitis, periodontal disease, cavities, than their parents. Now, he had been taught in dental school, as dentists still are taught today, that dental disease, where they're talking about dental caries, gingivitis, periodontal disease is just part and parcel of being a human. It's part of our innate genetics. And we're so fortunate that we have Western dentistry to take care of all our dental problems because primitive traditional people get dental disease, dental pain, they commit suicide because they don't have dentists. 
And he had accepted that dogma, but it didn't make a whole lot of sense to him that within three generations, in his own practice, he could see a deterioration of the dental disease. And he said, it cannot be genetic, it has to be environmental, it has to be diet. And he became a great student of the changes in the American diet just in the 50 or 60 years since he had started practice, going back to about 1850, and he realized there were extraordinary changes in American dietetics and nutrition. Beginning about 1850, first, industrial scientists perfected the refinement of grains. Part of that, old grains were basically whole grain. You very often got your bread products from local baker, local farmer. But in the 1850s, they perfected the refinement of grain, which removed all these the dirty brown nutrients and left it with this kind of pure white Play-Doh. And industrial bakers loved it because it was so easy to use for mass production bakery. And they loved it. So that we get the refinement of grains that became really the predominant form of breads by, the by 1900, 1910. Also, the sugar intake increased enormously. In 1850, the average American ate three pounds of sugar a year. By 1900, it was 30 to 50 pounds. Currently, it's about 164 pounds. And these were extraordinary changes. Also, the beginning of the 20th century, when price was in practice, we have the development of industrial food technology, the canning of foods. Now, the trouble when you can foods, foods tend to lose their color and flavor, so no one likes to eat them. So they developed chemicals going back, you know, 90 years, like sodium nitrate, which we now know is carcinogenic, which preserves flavor and preserves color. So chemicals were started to be an answer, added to food, which allowed food and technologists to can foods that would last for years. We also get the development of industrial agriculture about 80, 90 years ago with the use of synthetic fertilizers, and even the beginnings of pesticide, although the great explosion of pesticide uses after World War II. By 1910, 1920, industrial farmers were using pesticides. And these were enormous changes where we started to have the development of synthetic foods that could last for years on the shelf. And Price said, this probably is the cause of the, dental, the change in dental health in my practice. He decided to do an experiment. This is the difference between geniuses and the rest of us. They think of things that none of us would ever think about. He decided he would travel the world, major undertaking, and seek out traditional cultures and traditional communities that still lived according to traditional agriculture nutritional practices. Now, this is a study that could not be done today because there are very few traditional cultures and traditional tribes and groups living in isolation from the influx of Western civilization, Western industrialized agriculture, Western industrialized food technology. But in those days, they did exist. And he would spend seven years beginning in the 1920s. I mean, he would come back and forth to his practice in Cleveland. But he spent a total of seven years with his wife traveling the world. And he would, initially, he was interested in the extent and incidence of dental disease, but he expanded his concern to include other degenerative diseases that in the 1920s and 30s were already becoming epidemic. Allergies, arthritis, asthma, cancer, diabetes, heart disease, hypertension, even mental illness, the things I mentioned earlier. And what astonishes me in the 1920s and 30s, all of these traditional groups, wherever they were, were under the aegis of some Western country, and they actually kept good medical records, and they had public health officials and physicians and public health nurses that would go into these traditional communities and uh, try and determine the incidence of various diseases. And then he decided he would study these isolated cultures and then go into the towns and cities where the descendants of these isolated people had adjusted to and adapted to the Western way of eating with white flour, white bread, white rice, white spaghetti, canned goods, synthetic goods, chemicalized goods, industrialized agricultural products with pesticides, synthetic fertilizers, and see if there was any difference in the incidence, yes, of dental disease, but also the other major degenerative, minor and major uh, in illnesses that were already becoming predominant in the West. And his travels, fascinating guy, would take him from the Arctic of the Eskimos to the High Andes where he studied the Inca descendants, to the Kenyan Plains where he studied the traditional Maasai, to the High Swiss Alps where he studied the traditional Alpine herders, to Polynesia. And in each of these places, he would interview hundreds of people living according to the traditional lifestyle and descendants, descendants of these traditional people that were living in the towns and cities and eating the Western, the Western way. And he interviewed dozens and dozens of doctors, took thousands of photographs of, of patients' teeth, both the traditional people and the people living by Western uh, nu nutrition and dietetics, took pictures of their teeth because his first concern was dental disease, and you can see the structure. And he, his book is a really fascinating book. It's small print, 526 pages, first edition 1939, last edition 1945. It is available from the P Price Pottinger Foundation in San Diego. They've kept his work alive. And he has dozens and dozens of photographs in the book. Now, it's very complex. That book should have changed the course of medicine, should have changed the course of nutrition, should have changed the course of dietetics, and should have eliminated all the controversy that in 2014 still exists, both in the lay press and the conventional medical literature. Very complex, and I've lectured for hours about price, but it can be summed up in six basic 
Six basic points. First po point, sorry Ornish, sorry Pritikin, sorry Reven, sorry Atkins. Human beings did not adjust to a single diet, that human beings adjusted to, adapted to a variety of diets, depending on the ecological niche in which they live and the, logically the food that was available. And for example, if you look at the Eskimo diet, kind of interesting. Well, you know the Department of Agricultural Food Pick, uh, Pyramid, seven servings of fruits and vegetables a day, five servings of grains at the top of the pyramid of animal products. Well, that's great, but if you're an Eskimo, it doesn't apply. Up in the Arctic, think about it. There is no growing season, there is no fertile soil, there are no fruits and vegetables. Yeah, there's some berries, but no real fruits, vegetables, no nuts, seeds, grains. What there is is a lot of fatty animal products. Fatty fish, fatty caribou, fatty seals, fatty, wol fatty walruses, fatty whales. Up in the Arctic, the fish and the animals are very fatty to insulate them from the cold. And they have long winters where it's hard to find food, so they need to be insulated. So it's all fatty. The traditional Eskimo diet had actually been studied by Willemir Stephenson at the beginning of the 20th century, about 20 years before Price. He was the first American, the first Westerner actually, to live among the Eskimos. He was Willemir Stephenson, Scandinavian by descent, but he grew up in a ranch out in the West and was an American trained anthropologist. He was one of the first anthropologists to actually go out into the field. Most of them were ivory tower, you know, ivory tower thinkers that would think what traditional peoples lived like rather than going to see what they actually did live like. He went and lived with them. And the first thing that amazed him, he was an anthropologist but very well trained in biochemistry. You can see that in his writings. He realized they lived on an odd diet. It was all meat. And it, he estimated, he had training in biochemistry. It was 80% fat, 20% protein. And it was all from animal sources. No fruits, vegetables, nuts, seeds, and grain. They seemed to thrive and do well on this diet. Now, he had been taught in biochemistry that no human could live on an all-meat diet. It was told absolutely impossible. And when he first wrote a book about the Eskimos, when he returned after 10 years of living with them and talked about their diet, no one believed him. Of course, it makes perfect sense that the Eskimos are going to live on nothing but fatty meat because that's all there is up there. The Eskimos had been studied later by McGill University, about the time Price was studying them, 1929, 1934. They sent teams up into the Arctic. Indeed, they were living on an all-meat diet. Indeed, it was about 80% fat. Much of it saturated, horror of horror, saturated fat. They did fine with it. So you get that diet. Then you go to the high Andes, where you have the Inca descendants. And theirs is a, a grain-based diet. Lots of quinoa, uh, corn, some fruits, lots of tubers, some animal products, fish from the high Andes lakes. They had llamas. And they knew how to use llamas. They would use llama milk. They would turn into yogurt cheese, all kinds of fermented yogurt, product, yogurt products. They would eat llama meat, meat. So they had some meat in their diet, but it was basically grain-based. You go to the Kenyan plains, you study the Maasai. Maasai, interesting group. They have a diet that consists of primarily raw, raw milk, blood, and some meat. But it's primarily a milk diet, raw, not homogenized pasteurized, which completely changes the nutritional content. When you pasteurize milk, you heat it to 230 degrees currently, ultra-pasteurization. The average Maasai warrior price realized drank a gallon of raw milk a day, a lot of it saturated. It was a high fat milk, some blood, and a little bit of meat occasionally, but no fruits, vegetables, nuts, seeds, and grains. Now, they lived in a tropical area, so they could have grown crops, but they chose to live on this milk, blood, and occasionally meat diet, and they seemed to thrive on it. A completely different kind of diet than the Eskimos. And Eskimos never saw a cow, Eskimos never saw a grain, the Maasai never saw a grain, they never saw a whale. Completely different diets. You go up to the high Swiss Alps, traditional Swiss Alpine herders, which still exist to some extent today, were very wise about how to use pasture. They knew instinctively, although they didn't know biochemistry or what nutrients were, that the early spring rapidly grown grass was the most nutritious. And they would follow spring as it went up the mountainside and the snow melted, bringing their cattle up the side of the mountain so they could graze on the early spring grass, the rapidly grown grass, which was most nutritious. And their diet centered around milk, raw milk, again, not pasteurized, homogenized, cheese, yogurt, occasionally meat, but not a whole lot of meat. And they had a very dense, nutrient-dense, whole grain bread that they would use with their cheese. And they seemed to be completely adjusted and thrived on this diet. You go to the Polynesians. Polynesians never saw a cow, never saw a whale, never saw a grain. Their diet was coconut-based. And they were very adept at using coconut, coconut meat, coconut milk, coconut cream. They would ferment the coconut milk and make their own yogurt, yogurt cheese. Yes, they had some fish. Yes, they could hunt a boar and had some animal protein occasionally. And yes, they had fruits that would grow in the, in the Polynesian islands. But it's basically a coconut-based diet, and they were very shrewd and very smart about how to use coconut. Although, again, they didn't understand nutritional biochemistry, but they knew how to use the coconut to get maximum health benefits. So you have all these different diets, and humans adjust, adjusting to, adapting to, and apparently thriving on these diets, contradictory, contra, in contradiction to all the dietary experts that say one diet for everybody. Price's work 
70 years ago completely disproved that. Second point, no traditional group ever lived on a vegetarian diet. Sorry, Pritikin, sorry, Ornish. All traditional groups believed that it would be dangerous to live on a vegetarian diet. Even the ones that had a high percentage of plant-based carbohydrates, like the high, high Andes Incas, their descendants, knew that you had to have some animal protein. Also some value in animal protein and some value in fat. Now the amount of animal products would vary from diet to diet. The Eskimos and the Maasai diet, completely animal products. You go to Polynesia, they had some fruits. You go up to the high Andes and it was largely grain-based. But they also have some value in animal products. None of them thought a vegetarian diet was wise. None of them followed a vegetarian diet. Third point, none of these diets was absent of animal fat. All of them saw some value in animal fat. In fact, most of these traditional cultures who were not talking to each other because they were all isolated, that was the whole point, would feed the pregnant women animal fat. They saw some value, some health-promoting benefit to doing that. Instinctively, they knew that this was beneficial. They also saw some value in animal fat. Now, the amount of animal fat would vary enormously from the Eskimos, which was 80 percent. Maasai was 70 to 80 percent. So you go to the Polynesians where it was high fat, but it was coconut bay, maybe 30, 40 percent. The high Andes Inca descent, maybe 20 percent fat. So the amount of fat would vary, but they also had some value in it. None of them were, low, were particularly low fat. Fourth point, all of these diets, of course, relied on locally grown, locally harvested, locally hunted food. That was the whole point of Price's study. It was studying isolated cultures, isolated tribes, isolated communities, completely cut off from Western industrial agriculture and Western food technology. They didn't have access to trucks and, and highways and airplanes, et cetera. They relied on the local food, and it was all in a natural state. They didn't have industrial food technology. They didn't have refined grains, refined foods, processed foods, canned foods. They didn't have any of that. They relied on locally grown, locally harvested, locally hunted, and its natural form as possible, which, of course, is the most nutritious. It hasn't been tinkered with industrial food technology. Fifth point, all these groups saw some value in raw food and some value in fermented food. They didn't understand nutritional biochemistry. Edward Howell was the great American researcher who spent 50 years of his life studying the value of raw food. And he pointed out when you cook food, you destroy some vitamins like vitamin C and folic acid and some of the minerals like calcium when you cook it become less accessible. But you destroy all the enzymes in food. Now we don't tend to think of enzymes as a nutrient. Every cell, whether it comes from a plant or an animal food, has hundreds, even thousands of enzymes as part of the cell's normal metabolic machinery. And how will maintain that those enzymes could be absorbed like a vitamin or mineral, help the body repair, rebuild, even fight disease? The trouble is they're very heat sensitive. Not only is there some vitamin loss, not only do some minerals become less available in cooked food, but you categorically destroy all these enzymes. Above 117 degrees Fahrenheit, these enzymes in food are neutralized. So he was a big proponent of raw foods. He's the grandfather of the raw foods movement. My friend Carol Alt has written three books on raw food. I've written the introduction. And there is some benefit to that. And the traditional peoples saw that. And they also saw some value in fermented food. Now it's interesting. We now know when you ferment a food, whether it's an animal product like milk into yogurt or cabbage into sauerkraut, you're producing healthy bacteria. You know, our gut has over 600 species of bacteria that are necessary for normal health and integrity. A lot of those bacteria really have important functions in immune function. I read a study about three weeks ago where there's a substrain of lactobacillus that lowers cholesterol, and some doctors are beginning to believe high cholesterol is the result of the overuse of antibiotics, which knocks out the normal flora, knocks out this subspecies of lactobacillus, and cholesterol levels go up. Over 600 strains. Five years ago, they thought there were 300 strains. There's now up to 600 different bacteria that inhabit the gut, over 100 trillion bacteria in our gut alone. Well, the traditional people didn't know that, but they knew that there was some benefit in fermenting a food. When you ferment a food, animal or plant, you're basically creating nature's own probiotic. Probiotic is normal, healthy bacteria. For example, the Eskimos didn't have cabbage or beet to ferment, but they would ferment fish. Now, when Stephenson first studied the Eskimos, he was kind of grossed out about them. They would bury fish let it rot for six weeks, come back and eat it, and this was their version of dessert. And they suggested that Stephenson should try this. He said, oh, you know, over my dead body. But eventually, you know, he, he adapted their diet, and on a dare did try it. He said it was actually delicious. And of course, it was fermented, and it provided a lot of healthy bacteria. And the Eskimos, though they did not understand probiotics and bacteriology and microbiology and nutritional biochemistry, knew that that food had a health benefit. The high, Indies, the high, the high uh, Inca descendants in the Andes would ferment the, uh, the llama milk and make their own yogurt. Yogurt is a good source of naturally occurring, needful, healthy, health-promoting, normal bacteria. 
Masai are very interesting. They live in a tropical area. Earlier I said they eat a, drink a gallon of milk a day. They don't have any, they did, traditional Masai didn't have any refrigeration. Remember, the point of the study is he was studying isolated people. They didn't have access to electricity or refrigeration. Yet they had a way of fermenting milk that had been handed down from generation to generation with a starting culture that would preserve milk in tropical climates for up to weeks at a time, and it wouldn't sour or go bad. So they, they relied on fermented milk. It wasn't just plain milk. It was very wise, very effective. The Swiss herders up in the high valleys, they would make yogurt and cheese, ferment milk into uh, cheese. The, now the Polynesians didn't have milk, but they would ferment coconut milk. They had their own cultures to make their own yogurt and cheese out of coconut milk. So they all had some fermented food. That was the fifth point. And the sixth point, the most important, that should have changed the course of medicine, did not, unfortunately. As long as these traditional peoples followed their traditional diet and relied on locally grown, locally harvested, locally hunted food, they had enduring good health. Now, it sounds like, you know, some Rousseauian, you know, Rousseauian idea of the primitive noble savage. Nothing to do like that at all. This was a scientist who kept impeccable records that are still in the Price Pottinger Foundation out in San Diego, 2014. You can contact them. They have a website. And they have all his records and documents, thousands of pages, tens of, I guess, tens of thousands of photographs. First thing he noticed, and this is a dentist caught his attention, is these traditional peoples, well, they didn't have orthodontists and dentists because they didn't need them. They had perfect teeth perfect dental structure. And the idea that all these traditional people died at age 20 was wrong. He has a picture, uh, a photograph which we have of a 90-year-old Polynesian with perfect teeth, no decay, age 90, perfect dental arch, uh, no gingivitis, no periodontal, virtually absent in all these traditional cultures, wherever they were, from you know, the Arctic to the high Andes to the Kenyan Plains to the high Swiss Alps to Polynesia, perfect teeth, no decay, perfect dental structure, no gingivitis, no periodontals. Gosh, I envy them so much. We in the West don't have that at all. Secondly, the incidence of both the minor and major degenerative diseases, allergies, arthritis, asthma, cancer, diabetes, heart disease, hypertension, were virtually unknown. There was, even the uh, Western doctors who were keeping records on these traditional peoples remarked that they, they just had no cancer cases, even in the elderly people, wherever it was, from you know, the Polynesia to the, to the Arctic, there was no cancer. Now, Stephenson wrote a book in 1960 called Cancer, Disease, of Civilization, where he remarked that the, there was no cancer whatsoever in the, in the Eskimos until they moved into the Western towns and started eating according to Western civilization, which even 80, 90 years ago they were starting to do. That none of these diseases existed, and it was really quite remarkable. Now, when he studied the people, the descendants of the traditional cultures who had moved into the westernized towns, all hell would literally, literally break loose. Even in the first generation, when they adopted the westernized way of eating, epidemic dental decay, crooked teeth in their offspring, gingivitis, periodontal disease, lost teeth, allergies, arthritis, asthma, cancer was becoming epidemic even in the 20s and 30s in these westernized towns and cities. Um, diabetes, heart disease, hypertension was becoming a high, high, high blood pressure, heart disease during the 20s and 30s was starting to increase exponentially. And no one knew why, some, you know, some extraordinary thing. Well, of course, it was the diet. Even mental illness. Now, it's interesting. Stephenson had remarked when he was studying them you know, before Price that the Eskimos had no word for depression. And he described kind of Western concepts of, you know, 19th century romantic, Byronic depression, melancholy, suicide. They had absolutely no comprehension of what that was. You know, with all the bounty of nature, how could someone be so depressed? And Stephenson believed, wise man that he was, that perhaps a lot of Western mental illness is nutritional in its base. Abram Hoffer, a good friend of mine, now deceased, died at 92 a few years ago. He was an MD, PhD biochemist who spent his life trying to prove and show and demonstrate and document that a lot of mental illness, even the worst schizophrenia, has at its core a nutritional imbalance. And he treated it successfully for decades with nutrition. Price remarked on the same thing, that the, the, the traditional people seem to be absent of mental illness, schizophrenia, manic depression, bipolar, de the regular depressions. As soon as their descendants moved to the towns, they would start getting depression. All these issues, their children would be worse, their grandchildren even worse. So clearly the nutrition was extremely important to the health and well-being of the human species. And Price's book, which is extremely well documented, the print is small, 526 pages. Everyone should read that book. It'll change your idea of the basis of human disease, whether it's eye disease or cancer. Should have changed the course of medicine, did not, passed unheeded. In my many years of practice, in my years in uh, academic research when I first started, I never met anybody in the academic world who knew who Price was, let alone have read his book. In the alternative world, people often know who he is. Not many have read his book. Some people have actually read it. Everybody should read it. It's a, you can get it on Amazon. It's available from the Price Pottinger Foundation. 
Price made extraordinary observations. It's not some fantasy, again, Rousseauian, primitive, noble savage. These are this is scientific documentation that he proved beyond, a beyond any kind of doubt at all. Now, Price was basically an epidemiologist. He was studying the incidence of disease in various cultures, the effect of diet on the incidence of disease. But he wasn't a physiologist or a biochemist. And these diets are very different. He realized these diets are very different. You go from the Eskimo diet to the diet in the high end. These are completely different diets, different macro micro, uh, micronutrients, you know, the proteins, fats, carbs, vitamins, minerals, trace elements, different levels of the different vitamins. I mean, all very nutritious diets, but very different in the effect physiologically on the body, on the, in the effect biochemically on the body. But Price never had the time inclination or the, you know, the capability to study how these diets affected di humans differently in terms of their fundamental physiology and biochemistry, and why different people could adjust and thrive on completely different diets. That leads us to the next chapter, where I'm going to talk a bit about Francis Pottinger. Francis Pottinger grew up in Southern California. He's the scion of a very eminent medical family. They're fourth generation Pottingers practicing medicine today. They had a sanitarium out in Southern California, was, and this is like 1910, 1920, where they treated tuberculosis, which at that time was kind of an endemic disease. Pottinger is one of the great neurophysiologists of the 20th century. Beginning of the 20th century, there was an explosion of interest, an explosion of information in the nervous system in general, specifically in the autonomic nervous system. And Pottinger was one of the world's experts in the first half of the 20th century, the autonomic nervous system. Now I'm going to review a little physiology from first year. You guys have all heard of this before, and you'll remember it. And it may seem a little esoteric, but I promise you it will explain exactly how, how 70, 80 years later, 100 years later, we're successfully treating advanced cancer. The autonomic nervous system is that nervous system, as you know, that controls all physiological processes that don't require conscious input, respiration, cardiovascular function, digestion, uh, endocrine function, immune function. You know, I don't have to think about breathing, hopefully. You know, it's going to happen automatically. I mean, I can input and, and control the rate of breathing, but I don't have to. It'll happen automatically. I don't have to think about my heart beating. It happens automatically. I don't have to stand here, whoops, stand there saying, please beat, please beat, please beat. You know, it happens automatically. Yes, in terms of food, we make conscious decisions about what food we're going to eat, what our proclivities and dislikes are. But once it gets in the mouth and stomach, we don't have to think about the release of amylase in the mouth, the release of hydrochloric acid, pepsin in the stomach, the release of the pancreatic digestive juices, the proteolytic protein digesting, amylases that break down complex carbohydrates, lipases that break down triglycerides, the release of bile and bicarbonate from the liver. Remember, the liver has two main functions. It's a detoxification organ. That's where environmental chemicals and drugs and synthetic chemicals are processed and neutralized, prepared for excretion. It's also a digestive organ. produces bile necessary for the absorption of fats. Um, we don't have to think about peristalsis. It happens automatically. We don't have to think about endocrine function, fortunately. I don't have to think about my thyroid or my adrenals releasing hormones. It happens automatically according to the needs in any particular moment. We don't have to think about immune function. Hopefully, when a bacteria, virus, or fungus attacks us, our immune system without conscious input does what it needs to do. Now, the word autonomic was actually coined by Langley at the University of Cambridge 100 years ago. It was a play on the words automatic. These are processes that don't require conscious input that happen automatically. Now, as you'll recall, and as you guys know, because you study neurophysiology, the, the autonomic nervous system, we're going to review this briefly, consists of two branches, sympathetic, parasympathetic. And they have their own unique anatomy, physiology, biochemistry, and their own effects on all the tissues, organs, and glands. Now, the autonomic nervous system, if you simplify it, basically innervates two kinds of cells, secretory and smooth muscle. You know, smooth muscle is the cells that line all our organs, like the, the lower part, the upper part of esophagus, striated muscle, lower part, smooth muscle, stomach, small and large intestine, all lined with smooth muscle. That's how peristalsis occurs. The linings of ducts, like in the pancreatic ducts, lined with smooth muscle, and that's how the pancreas pumps out the enzymes into the duodenum. The liver's ducts are lined with smooth muscle. That's, it, that's how secretory glands, that's how tubular organs, like the intestinal tube, function through smooth muscle. Secretory cells produce and secrete the various hormones, enzymes, like pepsin and hydrochloric acid in the stomach, the pancreatic enzymes, insulin and the beta cells of the pancreas, bile from the uh, liver, uh, the mucus that lines the intestinal tract, thyroid, adrenal hormones. They're produced by secretory cells, and autonomic, the autonomic nervous system innervates all these secretory and, and smooth muscle cells. You know, I always say in, in medical school, they try and take simple things and make them complex, and take complex things and try and make them incomprehensible when they should be taking the incomprehensible and making it simple. But they don't do that. The autonomic nervous system basically innervates two kinds of cells. How simple can you be? Smooth muscle and secretory cells. Now, the sympathetic and parasympathetic work together in every minute of our lives to try and adjust our physiology and biochemistry to maintain a homeostatic equilibrium. 
And they tend to work in opposition, as you'll recall. And they have their own, again, you need anatomy, physiology, biochemistry. We'll briefly look at the sympathetic system just to review this. The centers of the sympathetic nervous system begin in the posterior hypothalamus. Hypothalamus, you know, the pituitary stalk comes off the hypothalamus, kind of in the back of the nose. Hypo means under the thalamus. Posterior hypothalamus has the original centers for the sympathetic system, which through interneurons go down into the brainstem, brainstem medulla pons midbrain, where you have nuclei, the nuclear tractus talus solitarius, nucleus ambiguous. From there, the sympathetic neurons go down the lateral sides of the spinal cord. They're all, they're all symmetric. And they exit between the first thoracic vertebral body and the third lumbar vertebrae, and then go to all the secretory cells in the body, the secretory and smooth muscle cells. Now, when the sympathetic system fires, it has very exact, precise effects on all the target tissues. For example, in the eyes, as you guys know, in the sympathetic fires, you get pu pu pupillary dilatation, which increases the input of eye, actually increases distant vision. In terms of respiration, it increases, enhances the efficiency of respiratory exchange, the release of carbon dioxide, the absorption of oxygen. When the sympathetic system fires, the bronchi relax, the alveoli become more efficient in respiratory exchange, increases the efficiency of respiration, increases the efficiency of heart function, increases heart rate, the strength of cardiac contractility, cardiac output, and has very specific effects on the peripheral vasculature. In the skin, as you recall, it causes vasoconstriction, and it shuts down the entire blood input into the gut. You know, the gut is a reservoir of blood, a lot of arterioles and arteries and venules and veins that, that go into and lead out of the gut. Well, in the sympathetic system, far as all the arteries and arterioles that feed into the gut from the mouth to the anus shut down, which may not seem like a smart thing to do. There's a reason. The blood supply to the muscles, on the other hand, opens up, and the blood supply to the brain opens up. So it basically shunts blood from the skin and the gut to the muscles and to the brain. We'll see why that's a good thing in a minute. When the sympathetic system fires, not only does it shut down blood supply into the gut, but it basically shuts down all digestive function, the release of amylase from the mouth, pepsin, hydrochloric acid from the stomach, the various pancreatic juices, both the endocrine and exocrine excretion from the pancreas. You know, the pancreas has the exocrine component, which produces the digestive enzymes, the proteolytic, amylytic, lipolytic, but also the hormones, like glucagon and insulin. Shuts that down when it fires. Shuts down liver function both the detoxification aspects of liver function as well as the digestive bile salt producing aspects of liver function. Shuts it down, shuts down peristalsis. Peristalsis, when the sympathetic system fires, just turns off. On the, in the endocrine system, however, the completely different effect, it stimulates endocrine function, the release of thyroid hormone from the thyroid, adrenal hormones from the adrenal. Now, thyroid hormone is catabolic. It causes the breakdown of stored proteins, fats, and carbohydrates and converts them into usable energy. The adrenal hormones do the same. They're catabolic. There are over 100 different adrenal hormones I've read. But basically, they, they break down stored protein, fats, and carbohydrates, convert them into usable energy. Also, the adrenal hormones cause a retention of salt, retention of water, and raise blood pressure. When the sympathetic system fires, it basically shuts down immune function, which again may not seem like a smart thing to do, but there's a reason. As you recall from first year physiology and biochemistry, this and, and, uh, neuroanatomy, the sympathetic system is the classic stress nervous system, and it's perfectly designed to help us deal with stress. In a time of stress, whether it's major or minor, you know, stress can be psychological, physiology, it can, physiological, it can be spiritual, it can be major and minor. During the day, we're always in a state of stress, whether we're caught at a stoplight, whether we're caught in traffic, whether a kid doesn't come home from school on time, whether we have to do a presentation, deal with a difficult employee, difficult relative. All those things are stressful, whether it's psychological or physical, extreme physical stress, having to run away from an earthquake or a house that's burning or from a car crash. That's an extreme example where the sympathetic system turns on. And it's perfectly designed to help us deal with stress. And it has an innate capacity to turn on slightly or enormously, depending on the nature of the stress. For example, you have to run away from a car. You don't care if you're digesting your food from the last meal. You want blood going into the brain so you can think fast. Brain weighs two and a half pounds, uses 25% of all the body's energy. It is extremely metabolically active. In a time of stress, you have to make decisions very quickly. You don't care if you're digesting last night's pizza. You want the blood going to your brain, carrying with it oxygen and nutrients. So the gut shuts down, blood goes to the brain, also to the muscles. When the sympathetic system fires, blood goes to the muscles. So in a time of stress, you have physiological strength. We all read about stories where some kid was caught under a car and someone lifts up the car and, of course, could never do that again. And it's not mysticism. In a, in a state of extreme sympathetic firing, there's so much blood and oxygen going to the muscles, our strength improves like an incredible hulk enormously. So the sympathetic nervous system is expressly and beautifully designed to help us deal with stress. 
the, being alive during the day is stressful from the time we get up to the time we go to bed. The sympathetic system tends to be alive, tends to be active during the day to help us deal with stress, whether it's minor or major, making a presentation, dealing with traffic again. It's always on converting protein to fat, breaking down tissues to provide energy for the brain, for the muscles. Parasympathetic system has its own unique anatomy, physiology, biochemistry, and its own unique effect on the different tissues and organs. You know, in the eyes, it causes vasoconstriction, reduces eye, eye input of light. In the respiratory system, it causes bronchoconstriction and reduces the efficiency of exchange for oxygen and carbon dioxide. We'll say, well, that doesn't make a lot of sense that you want that to happen, but there's a reason why that's a good thing. So it reduces the efficiency of respiratory exchange. It slows heart rate, slows the strength of cardiac contractility, reduces cardiac output, causes vasodilation in the skin and in the gut. Blood flows into the gut. Blood flows into the skin. You get all this blood pooling in the gut, it lowers blood pressure. So when the parasympathetic system fires, the blood pressure tends to go down. When the parasympathetic system fires, all aspects of digestion are turned on. The release of amylase in the mouth, the release of pepsin hydrochloric acid in the stomach, the release of all the various pancreatic digestive juices, insulin from the beta cells of the pancreas, bile from and bicarbonate from the liver, the, digest, the, the detoxification aspects of liver physiology are enhanced enormously. Peristalsis increased. The breakdown, absorption, utilization, assimilation of nutrients increases exponentially when the parasympathetic system fires. When the parasympathetic system fires, however, endocrine function tends to be suppressed, both thyroid and adrenal function. When thyroid and adrenal function are suppressed, instead of breaking down stored proteins, fats, and carbs, we tend to store them. So parasympathetic system enhances the efficiency of digestion, enhances the absorption of nutrients, and then it stores them, and basically allows for the repair, rebuilding, and restoration of tissues. When the parasympathetic system fires, it stimulates immune function, particularly the immune function against bacteria and certain cancers. Now these are all, you know, things that we all learn in physiology. When Pottinger was delineating this in a wonderful book he wrote called Symptoms of Visceral Disease, first edition, 1919, it went through six editions, last, there it is, last edition was 1944. It was a brilliant book, 426 pages of dense neuroanatomy, which I happen to like, but it's not easy reading. And in this book, through his six editions, he really delineated the anatomy, physiology, and biochemistry of the sympathetic and parasympathetic system and how they work. But he was not just an esoteric ivory tower scientist. He was the scion of a great medical family had several sons that were doctors. They ran a very successful, very good clinic. And he saw thousands of patients as a clinician. Of course, he was interested scientifically in the autonomic nervous system, so he was very keen, very astute about that. And he noticed in his practice, and this I promise will come to how we treat patients, you know, 70, 80 years later, that certain people in his practice seemed to have an overly developed, overly efficient, efficient sympathetic nervous system and correspondingly a weak parasympathetic system. Now in the hypothalamus, there are interneurons between the anterior and posterior hypothalamus. The anatomy of the parasympathetic begins in the anterior hypothalamus, goes down through four of the cranial nerves, you know, the 12 cranial nerves, the enter, the, exit the skull, the ocular motor, glossopharyngeal, facial, and vagus all have parasympathetic output. And the vagus nerve goes through the chest, feeds the lungs and the heart, through the diaphragm, the upper digestive system, including the liver and the pancreas, the colon. And then there are other neurons that go down the spinal cord and exit the sacral plexus and feed the lower part of the digestive system, the, the bladder, the gonads, and the vessels in the, in the, in the legs. It has its own particular anatomy. And in the hypothalamus, the Parasympathetic neurons begin in the anterior hypothalamus, the interneurons that go between the anterior and posterior hypothalamus, and they're mutually inhibitory. So when the anterior hypothalamus fires, it suppresses the posterior sympathetic hypothalamus. When the sympathetic posterior hypothalamus fires, it inhibits the anterior. So they're mutually inhibitory. And what Pottinger realized, certain people in his practice had a very strong sympathetic system and a weak parasympathetic system, and correspondingly and logically all the tissues, organs, glands, in these people, and he thought it was genetically determined from birth, in these people all the tissues, organs, glands normally stimulated by their overly strong sympathetic system tend to be very highly developed and efficient respiration, cardiovascular function, endocrine function. And all the tissues, organs, and glands normally stimulated by their weak parasympathetic, including all of the digestion from mouth to anus, including liver and pancreas function, tended to be very inefficient and ineffectual. Now these people had a very distinct psychology, physiology, biochemistry, and health profile. He studied them. He studied thousands of what he called these sympathetic dominants with a strong sympathetic system. Again, this wasn't environmental. He believed this was genetically determined. 
They had a very unique psychology, which was the result of their strong sympathetic system. You know, their stress system was turned on 24 hours a day. The first thing is they didn't sleep well. We, we always know people who sleep four or five hours a day, never sleep restfully, and yet run corporations and work 14-hour days. That's because their stress nervous system is turned on, sometimes less, sometimes more, but 24 hours a day, and parasympathetic system very weak. Because of this uh, overload of norepinephrine and adrenaline, the main neuro, uh, sympathetic neurotransmitters, they tend to be very prone to aggression. They, t they tend to make good leaders, military leaders, trial lawyers, they're the sympathetic dominance. Who else would do that? Um, they tend to be very intellectual. They always blood go into their brain, so they make good mathematicians, good business people. They can think uh, intellectually. Not necessarily very creative, but they tend to be very smart. They spend their whole life with blood and oxygen going to their nutrients. Um, they tend, to have very, they tend to have very strong respiratory function, very efficient respiratory exchange, so they make good long distance runners. These are the people that like to jog, like Dean Ornish, who's a classic sympathetic dominant. They like to jog. They, first of all, jogging burns off the extra norepinephrine and epinephrine, which is kind of irritating the body. They always feel agitated, kind of irritable. Um, they like to jog also. They have good respiratory exchange, so they can jog 26 miles and not think about it. They have good cardiovascular function, strong cardiac output. Blood tends to shunt from the skin to the gut to the muscles in the brain. So again, they're very smart and they have very well-developed muscles. So they make good athletes like quarterbacks where they have to do intricate thinking and intricate uh, muscle, react muscle reactions. They tend to have terrible digestion from the mouth to the anus, including pancreas and liver function. Peristalsis is very weak. Food tends to sit like a rock in their gut. These are people who think hell is Thanksgiving or Christmas dinner where they have to eat a lot of food. They can't digest it. Their pancreatic up output, both exocrine and endocrine, the pancreatic enzymes, insulin, glucagon, very weak. Weak production of the liver uh, products like bile and bicarbonate, weak de detoxification aspects of the liver. Peristalsis, when the sympathetic system is strong, tends to shut down. L food literally sits like a rock in their gut. These are people that want a piece of fruit or a salad for lunch and feel fine for the next 10 hours. They tend to have very strong endocrine function, strong thyroid function, adrenal function. When the thyroid and adrenal is strong, blood pressure tends to go up. You've got more blood going to the brain. These people are thinking all the time, three in the morning, they wake up and they're thinking, thinking, thinking about the next day's work, whatever it may be. They have all this blood going to their brain constantly. Thyroid and adrenal tends to increase the blood pressure. Thyroid and adrenals cause the breakdown of protein, fat, and carbs. So they have a lot of extra energy. They tend to be very lean because they're in a catabolic state, catabolic. They're breaking down their sto tissue stores. They tend to have weak immune function, particularly they're prone to bacterial infections. And they, 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 tend to, you know, they tend to have certain health problems. If they get too sick, like if a sympathetic dominant is under constant stress, they can end up hypomanic, where they don't sleep for days and want to run the world and start acting bizarrely. Their respiratory function will always be okay. They can end up with catastrophic heart attacks. If the heart is beating so hard, they can end up with ventricular fibrillation and sudden death. They end up with all kinds of digestive problems. Now, because of the sympathetic uh, obstruction of insulin synthesis and production, they tend to have high blood sugars because of insulin, uh, in, in, a lack of insulin, not the insulin resistance. We have too high blood insulin. They tend to have low insulin levels, high blood sugar because of that. Um, food tends to sit in their gut. They can get irritation from that, so they can end up with stomach ulcers. The lining of their gut tends to be weak. They tend to irritable bowel with constipation as a cause. They're prone to constipation. Prone to hyperthyroidism, hyperadrenalins like Cushing's disease, where they're constantly breaking down their tissues, and prone to bacterial infections. Now, Pottinger also recognized that certain people had an in inherently genetically determined strong parasympathetic system and a correspondingly weak sympathetic system. And all these people, the tissues, organs, glands, normally stimulated by their strong parasympathetic, tend to be very highly developed and efficient, particularly all of digestion. And all the tissues, organs, glands, normally stimulated by their genetically determined weak sympathetic system, tended to be very weak and inefficient. And all the tissues, organs, glands, normally stimulated by their weak sympathetic system, including respiration, cardiovascular function, endocrine function, tend to be very weak and inefficient. And these people had their own unique psychology, physiology, biochemistry, and health profile. In fact, Cotton just said they're almost like a different species from the sympathetic dominance. They don't tend to be aggressive. Their sympathetic system is weak. They don't have a lot of adrenaline. They don't have a lot of norepinephrine. The quickest way to make a laboratory animal angry is to inject adrenaline to them. It's the defensive hormone. I remember, I remember once watching a Ge National Geographic special, I talk about this in my lectures, where there's a little warthog holding, on the Serengeti plane holding off a pride of about eight or nine lions. And you can see this little warthog, I mean, it's like the size of a golden retriever. He was just moving so fast. His sympathetic system was turned on 100%. And these lions were kind of slow, and they were a little nervous by him. I mean, I'm sure he ended up as sausage for the lions. 
but you could see his sympathetic system was turned on. Well, parasympathetics have a weak sympathetic system. They're, they're not aggressive. They're, their defense mechanisms aren't weak. They, they tend to be people, people. They don't, they don't like conflict. They don't like to deal with that kind of thing. They like to avoid conflict. They don't do well in school. Sympathetic dominants love regimentation, like to be up at 7.30 going to school. They like school. They like achievement. They like being good for the teacher. Parasympathetics don't care too much about that, but they can be extremely creative. You know, if you study the life histories of creative people, like Ernest Hemingway never even went to college. He ends up winning the Nobel Prize in Literature. Pa Pablo Picasso was a terrible student in art school, never finished. One of the most prominent, certainly one of the richest artists who ever lived. Thomas Edison was a scientific creative person. He was good at night, didn't, wasn't good in the morning like a sympathetic dominant, never finished high school. But he was extraordinarily creative. You know, people are now attacking his character. Well, OK, fine. But he was extremely creative. Parasympathetics don't do well in the morning. They tend to do well in the night. Sympathetics do well in the morning, do terribly at night. They want to be in bed by 8 or 9. Parasympathetics start waking up about 1 or 2 in the afternoon, do great, their best work in the evening, so the world is not really set up for them. But if they can find their niche, they can be very creative. They don't have good respiratory function. When the parasympathetic system is strong, you get bronchoconstriction, reduced efficiency of respiratory exchange in the al alveoli. They don't exchange carbon dioxide and oxygen very efficiently. They will never make good long distance runners, nor should they try to be. They can make good linemen. They're not quick like a quarterback, but you know, they can be strong in a different way. They tend to have weak heart function, slow pulse, slow cardiac, weak cardiac contractility. Cardiac output tends to be low. Blood tends to pool in the gut and the skin. They tend toward low blood pressure. If they stand up too fast, they get weak. You know, the brain sits at the top of the head. Weighs two and a half pounds, uses 25% of all the body's energy, but you have to work against gravity to get blood up there. Blood pressure is low, as happens when the parasympathetic system is strong and firing. Blood pressure tends to be low. They have to get up slowly or they can get dizzy, faint, and foggy headed. They tend to have very efficient digestion. They could eat this table and that screen without even thinking about it. Their idea of heaven is Thanksgiving and Christmas dinner. They have very strong peristalsis, strong release of all the various digestive enzymes and, and nutrients. And, various products like bile salt from the liver, pepsin, hydrochloric acid in the stomach, all the various pancreatic digestive enzymes, insulin. They tend toward low blood sugar because of the overproduction of insulin. This can lead to insulin resistance over time, although if they eat too many carbohydrates, they end up with high blood sugar. They, but they have very efficient digestion. They have weak endocrine function, weak thyroid, weak adrenal function. They tend to store protein, fats, and carbs. Now, they're in a kind of a paradoxical, difficult situation. They have very efficient digestion, so they break down food very efficiently. Their absorption, utilization, assimilation, each are very effective. And because the thyroid and adrenals are weak, they tend to store it all. Well, that's a good thing because it allows the body to repair and rebuild. Bad thing is because their digestion is so efficient and their hormone function is diminished, and thyroid and adrenal particularly, they're tending to store everything they eat. They tend to have strong uh, immune function. They are prone to certain illnesses. Now, a parasympathetic, if they get too parasympathetic dominant, can end up with extreme cataclys cataclysmic depression. The hypersomnic cataclysmic depression, where people are sleeping 14 hours a day and crying and life isn't worth living, suicidal. Parasympathetic can end up in that very se severe depression. That'll happen often, for example, if a parasympathetic uh, patient loses their job. They have nothing to do. Sympathetic system is already weak. It turns off. They end up in a cataclysmic suicidal depression. They tend to get respiratory function because respiratory efficiency is very weak. So you get bronchoconstriction. They're prone to asthma. Um, when you bronchoconstriction, and now interestingly enough, when the parasympathetic system fires, it, those mucosa cells that line the alveoli produce a lot of mucus but it doesn't tend to move, it tends to sit there, so it serves as a culture medium for particularly viruses and fungi. So they're prone to, uh, they can get flus, upper respiratory infections, pneumonia, tend to have weak heart function, they're prone to a heart failure if the parasympathetic system gets too strong. Um, they're prone to low blood pressure, which can be a problem. You know, again, the brain sits at the top of the head, we walk around standing, Parasympathetic is too parasympathetic dominant. You're not going to have blood to the brain with it, oxygen, nutrients. The brain is very metabolically active, as I said. They can f feel depressed, fatigued, spacey. Very often, extreme parasympathetic dominant, when they come into my office, it's, it's like they're looking through life through a fishbowl. Nothing's clear. They're foggy headed, spacey, et cetera. They tend to have efficient digestion if they end up too parasympathetic dominant, which can happen again if they lose their job and have nothing to do for six months. They can end up with diarrhea. They can end up with hypoglycemia and eventually because of the overproduction of insulin, insulin resistance. They can have an irritable bowel with diarrhea as the main component. Sympathetic dominance can have an irritable bowel because the food sits there, irritates the gut, and they end up with constipation. Parasympathetic can end up with hypothyroidism, hypoadrenalism, Cushing's, um, Addison's disease. And they tend to get uh, viral infections. Now, 
When the sympathetic system is strong, calcium tends to go in the cell membrane. Cell membranes get very tight, so viruses can't enter. Bacteria can reproduce in the bloodstream. Viruses have to get inside the cell to reproduce. Sympathetic dominants have very strong cell membranes. Viruses can't penetrate. When the parasympathetic system fires, calcium leaves the cell membranes. The cell membranes get very leaky. That makes them prone to two things. First, viral infections, because the virus is very easily enter the cells. Secondly, they're prone to allergies. Sympathetic dominants have strong membranes. Allergens can't enter the cells that mediate allergic reactions, basal cells, mast cells, neutrophils, and lymphocytes. And the mediators of inflammation, like histamine, bradykine, and serotonin, leukotrienes, cytokines, can't leave the cell. So we all know people that smoke cigarettes, eat junk food, walk in back of a bus in New York City, they'll get allergic reactions. That's because their membranes are so tight. They can lead to other problems. Parasympathetic dominants with leaky cell membranes, prone to viruses, prone to allergies, and they're prone to certain cancers. They tend to get leukemia, lymphoma, multiple myeloma, sarcomas, which are connective tissue cancers related embryologically to immune cancer. They get the immune cancers. Sympathetic dominants get the typical solid epithelial uh, cancers, tumors of the breast, lung, stomach, colon, pancreas, liver, uterus, ovary. Um, never the twain shall meet. So they, the sympathetics and parasympathetics have unique psychology, physiology, biochemistry, and even health profile. Now the health profile. Now there's a third group that Pottinger recognized, and these are the balanced metabolic types, as he called them. And in these people, both branches of the autonomic nervous, nervous system, sympathetic and parasympathetic, tend to be equally developed, equally efficient, and all the various physiological groups, the physiological systems, respiration, cardiovascular, digestion, endocrine, immune function, tend to be equally as efficient. And they tend to psychologically, physiologically, biochemistry, tended to be midway between the sympathetic and parasympathetic. They weren't as aggressive as the sympathetics, but more aggressive, ambition, motivated than the parasympathetic. Not as creative as a para, better in school than a para, not as good in school as a sympathetic. They have good resp respiratory function. They can run, but they're not going to be as good a runner as a jogger, as a sympathetic dominant, but certainly better than a parasympathetic dominant. They have good, you know, average heart function. You know, under stress, it can increase its efficiency. When they're relaxed, it can decrease its efficiency. Their digestion is somewhere between. It's not as efficient as a parasympathetic dominance digestion, but better than a sympathetic food will pass through. Normally, they produce what we would call normal amounts of digestive enzymes, insulin, glucagon, liver function is normally good. Peristalsis is pretty good, pretty efficient. They can break down utilized nutrients fairly efficiently. Good endocrine function, not as strong as a sympathetic, stronger than a parasympathetic. Good immune function. Now, a balanced person, Fortunately and unfortunately, can be prone to problems of either side. For example, a balanced person going about their life is exposed to stress at work or is terrible family stress. Their sympathetic system is strong enough it will turn on, if this is old Pottinger delineated this, and they can end up not sleeping, become irritable, and they want to go around kicking dogs and small children, and their spouses don't recognize them. Their respiration will be efficient. Their pulse will go up, uh, heart rate will go up, uh, blood pressure will go up, blood will tend to shunt from their skin and their gut. They'll tend to be a little paler under stress. More blood is going to the brain, so they're thinking all the time. Three in the morning, they suddenly start waking up. Digestion gets worse. Suddenly, they balance people normally can eat just about any kind of food when they're under stress. They suddenly find digestion is less efficient. They can't break down as food as efficiently. Food doesn't feel as well as their gut. They tend to get constipated. Their thyroid and adrenal turns on, so under stress, they tend to lose weight, and they'll be prone to bacterial infections, but not viral. Now, if a ba balanced person goes on vacation, they tend to be very conscientious. So they'll bring six books with them, playing and all the things they're going to do. They go on vacation. Sympathetic system turns off, as it does when we don't have activity to confront it. Parasympathetic will turn on. And they get a little spacey, a little foggy headed. The blood pressure tends to go down. They can't get as much blood to the brain. They start sleeping more because the parasympathetic system is turned on. Um, they don't read any of the books, and they tend a little depressed. They often go on vacation and get a little depressed, and they, all these things they want to do, they never get done. They go on vacation, they come back and have a flu or upper respiratory infection because the parasympathetic turned on. A balanced person's parasympathetic system can turn on enough to cause them trouble if it's turned on too much. Digestion will be efficient, endocrine function will slow, so they go on vacation, they're more parasympathetic system, dominant, so they're breaking down food efficiently, the thyroid and adrenals turn on, they're storing food, and they gain 10 pounds in two weeks. They're prone to viral infections. They're going to come back up a respiratory viral infection. Then they go back to work. Sympathetic turns on. Everything normalizes out. Um, the respiratory infections stop. The, uh, what, they don't, they're not breaking down food as efficiently. Thyroid and adrenals turn on. They start losing weight, and everything's back to normal. They don't tend to get cancer, but if they're under stress for a long time, they can get a sympathetic dominant cancer. The solid epithelial tumors, tumors, lung, breast, stomach, colon, pancreas, liver, uterus. If they go on vacation or lose their job for six months and the parasympathetic turns on, they're prone to leukemia, lymphoma, myeloma, sarcoma. So they can go either way. All these are extraordinary observations. Sounds like a lot of esoteric uh, neurophysiology. 
But what Pottinger was doing over a 40-year period was creating a model of human disease that was predictable, verifiable, and could predict what kind of disease a person would have and what you needed to do to get them. Padre got to the point that he began to believe that most human disease, minor and major, from allergies to cancer, was the result of autonomic imbalance. And in terms of balanced people with a balanced system, both systems tend to be inefficient. And he said the key to getting people well, whether it was a minor problem like toenail fungus or brain cancer, was to get the autonomic system back into balance because then all the physiological systems, respiration, cardiovascular, digestive, endocrine, immune functions, would work better. And all these symptoms work in harmony together in homeostatic equilibrium. The body works better. Whatever the disease is, allergies, brain cancer, fungus, go away. Simplistic, but a very, very fundamental, extraordinary model of human disease that any practitioner, whatever your background, can utilize in the day-to-day -day practice. Now, he, Prottinger got interested because he had this model where he saw in his practice certain people had a sympathetic system that was too strong, other people had a parasympathetic system that was too strong, other people were balanced, and in, both case, in these cases, both branches could be weak. And he began, to, he began to suspect the solution to many, if not most, human disease, psychological, physiology, biochemical, whatever kind of disease it was, was to get the autonomic system to be back in balance or to work more efficiently. And he experimented with drugs, but he also began to experiment with nutrients, which is going to lead us to what we do today. And he began to suspect that during the 1920s and 30s, there was an explosion of research information on vitamins and minerals, trace elements. Casimir Funk had coined the word vitamin around 1900. During the 1910 period, 1920, when Pottinger was really active, there was an extraordinary amount of discovery and information and excitement about nutrients. Suddenly, diseases like pellagra could be reversed. Pellagra was a major killer. I think 10,000 Americans were dying a year from pellagra. It was just a beef, not vi niacin vitamin deficiency. Scurvy, Albert St. Georgie won the Nobel Prize in 1937 for elucidating the, st the structure of vitamin C. And scurvy could be re reduced, could be eliminated with vitamin C. So there was a lot of extraordinary information about conventional researchers in terms of these new vitamins and how minerals worked and how proteins, fats, and carbs work. And Padra kind of latched on to that. And he began to suspect that every nutrient, whether it was a vitamin, mineral, trace element, amino acid, fatty acid, sugar, had an effect on the autonomic nervous system. Whatever else it might do in energy mechanics, DNA replication, whatever else it might do, and there are entire textbooks written about single nutrients. I have a book on niacin that thick and magnesium involved in 300 different enzyme processes. Well, whatever these vitamins and minerals, trace elements might, might do in terms of energy production, DNA replication, et cetera, each and every one of them had an effect on autonomic nervous system. And Pottinger was the first person to say 80 years ago that the autonomic effect of nutrients and diet is their most important effect and determines how you can treat people effectively in your office, simply, predictably, and with great precision. Now, he generalized. But in terms of his research, he, a lot of times geniuses kind of spec, you know, they, they laser-like focus. He really studied three nutrients in detail, calcium, magnesium, potassium. He was the first person to point out that calcium stimulates the sympathetic nervous system. That has been confirmed today. He was the first to point out that magnesium blocks the sympathetic system. In emergency rooms today around the world, when a person comes in with a grand mal seizure, which is the ultimate expression of sympathetic hyperactivity, they inject intravenous magnesium, which shuts down the sympathetic system. Potassium, Pottinger reported in 1936, correctly, potassium stimulates the parasympathetic system. So Pottinger had volunteers in his clinic, and he would give a sympathetic dominant with their approval large doses of calcium, and he could really see their sympathetic system turn on in terms of their psychology, physiology, biochemistry, and health. They would become more manic, they wouldn't sleep as well. Uh, their respiration would be fine, heart rate would go up, cardiac contractility would increase, they would get paler, blood would shut down the gut even more, um, digestion would become even worse, food, you know, they wouldn't, they'd move their bowels once every week, um, adrenal and thyroid function would increase, they would start losing weight, they would become more manic, blood pressure would go up, they're breaking down proteins, fats, of course they would stop the experiment. On the other hand, if you put them on magnesium and potassium in high doses, like 1,000 milligrams of magnesium, 300 milligrams of potassium, in terms of calcium, he'd go up to two grams a day and cause all hell with these sympathetic dominance. But if you put them on magnesium and potassium, he would shut down their overly strong sympathetic system and build up their weak parasympathetic system, and everything would work better. Psychologically, they would be less aggressive, less irritable, less, less anxious, they would sleep better, respiration would be fine. Pulse would slow down, blood pressure would slow down, less prone to irregular heart rhythms. Digestion, the efficiency of digestion would improve. They could start breaking down food more efficiently. Thyroid function would slow down. They would be less prone to hyperthyroidism. Adrenal function would slow down. They wouldn't be constantly breaking down proteins fast. They could store it so they could repair and rebuild tissues at night. 
So they could, he, knew, he learned, uh, you know, that just with these three nutrients, he could cause enormous changes in physiology and biochemistry. Now, if he took a parasympathetic dominant with a strong parasympathetic system and a weak sympathetic system, and he gave him large doses of magnesium and potassium, it would be a disaster. They'd end up cataclysmically depressed. In fact, they'd have to stop the experiment. Respiration efficiency would worsen. They would start getting upper respiratory infections, flus, even pneumonia. Heart rate would slow, cardiac contractility would slow, cardiac output would lessen, less blood going to the brain. They would get spacey, foggy-headed, looking through life like through a fishbowl. Uh, the blood pressure would go down. Digestion would increase in efficiency to the point where they would, get, they, would, they would get diarrhea. Now, magnesium is known as cathartic. Yeah, it has an osmotic effect, but also it stimulates the parasympathetic system, which increases peristalsis. In a parasympathetic dominant, if you give them magnesium, peristalsis is increased to such a point, they end up with diarrhea. Thyroid would shut down, adrenals would shut down, the press, low blood pressure, they'd be storing protein, fats, carbs, not breaking them down to use for energy. If he put a parasympathetic dominant on calcium and stimulated their weak sympathetic system, he would bring the out of balance autonomic system into better balance. Mood would improve, they had have more energy, stamina, endurance, motivation would be better. They would be less prone to for respiratory infections, respiratory efficiency would improve, heart rate, cardiac contractility would improve, blood pressure would improve, more blood go into the brain more blood go into the brain so they could think better, more to the muscles, so their muscles would be more efficient. Um, digestion would still be efficient. He'd turn on the adrenals, turn on the um, thyroid. They would start breaking down protein, fats, and carbs so they could use them for energy. Their immune system would be okay. So he found that when he gave them just a simple magnesium, potassium, two, sup two supplements, he could bring an out-of-balance system into balance, and everything psychologically, physiologically, biochemically would work better. Now, with balanced people, if you gave them too much calcium, they'd end up too much sympathetic, dominant, irritable, not sleeping, heart rate too fast, irregular heart rhythm, poor digestion, hyperthyroid, hyperadrenal. If you gave them magnesium, potassium, they could end up depressed, uh, end up with respiratory infections, decreased cardiac output, not enough blood going to the brain. Digestion would improve. They could end up with diarrhea. It produced a lot of insulin. They could end up with blo low blood sugar. Thyroid function, adrenal function would lessen. They would have trouble breaking down proteins, fats, and carbs for energy, would tend to store everything and gain weight. If he gave uh, balanced people calcium, magnesium, potassium, and then what we read about, the two to one calcium, magnesium ratio, some potassium and moderate doses, they would function efficiently. Both branches of the autonomic system would improve in their efficiency. Psychologically, physiologically, biochemically, they would work well. All the physiological systems, respiration, cardiovascular, digestion, endocrine, immune, would work efficiently. So with these three nutrients, Pottinger could create predictable effects on autonomic function, predictable effects psychologically, physiologically, biochemically, even in terms of the health profile, what diseases, minor or major, they would get. Put this all in his book. And it was like a lot of great things like Weston Price ignored. But here we're getting into the, the foundation of why different people do well with different supplements and why autonomic imbalance may be at the root of all human disease. And autonomic imbalance might explain why certain people need different, certain diets and certain supplements. While Pottinger was working toward the end of his life, there was another, another scientist in our history, Ernst Gellhorn, brilliant guy, died in 1973. And he was a very academic uh, MD, PhD, PhD in neurophysiology, University of Minnesota, full professor. Over 400 papers, eight textbooks on the autonomic nervous system. Absolutely brilliant man. He had a whole laboratory. In his day, he was very well respected. After his death, it's like he's unknown. A few years ago, I called the University of Minnesota and asked, you know, do, you, do you have any information on your eminent professor, Ernst Gellhorn, who was one of the world's masters in autonomic physiology? They didn't even know who he was. They went to their files and they found something. Oh, yeah, he was an honor of a professor emeritus. For some reason, like Pottinger, his work, or Price, never worked, his work, however vigorously, academically astute it was, never took hold. And he spent decades at the University of Minnesota, both in his clinic and his laboratory, studying autonomic effects. And he, like Pottinger, this is two scientists working in completely different areas and different parts of the world, different universities. Pottinger worked at the University of Southern California, coming up to the exact same conclusion after decades of work. And Gellhorn absolutely believed that certain people have an inherently genetically determined strong sympathetic system and a weak parasympathetic system. And in those people, all the tissues, organs, and glands normally stimulated by their strong sympathetic system. Um, respiratory function, cardiovascular, endocrine function tend to be highly developed, highly efficient. And all those tissues, organs, and glands normally stimulated by their weak parasympathetic system, including the, digi the entire digestive system with liver and pancreatic function, tend to be weak, weak and inefficient. Other people had a strong parasympathetic system, all the tissues, organs, glands, stimulated by the strong power of the entire digestive system, highly efficient, all those stimulated by their weak sympathetic system, respiration, cardiovascular, endocrine, weak and, and inefficient. And other people had a balanced 
autonomic system. And Gellhorn spent 30, 40 years of his life studying the effects of drugs on bringing an out of balance autonomic system into balance, and also nutrients. And at the end of his career, he began to realize that nutrients, which are designed specifically to influence metabolic profile, where drugs are actually synthetic products that are meant to manipulate uh, various biochemical processes. Nutrients are the natural product that do that. And he began to realize, conventional orthodox neurophysiologist that he was at the University of Minnesota, that we should be looking into nutrients and diet to, manip to manipulate the autonomic nervous system in sympathetic dominance and parasympathetic dominance to bring an out of balance autonomic system into balance and with balanced people to build up both sides. And should you do that, most disease, psychological, physiolog physiological, biochemical, malignant, would resolve. This is an academic, esteemed academic physician. Nobody at the University of Minnesota even remembers who he was, despite the fact he was an honored full professor. It's unbelievable to me how some of the great geniuses in medicine tend to be lost to history. It would take the next person in our discussion, William Donald Kelly, to bring Price, Pottinger, Gellhorn together in this extraordinarily complex system of diet and supplements specifically aimed at manipulating an out-of-balance autonomic nervous system, or in terms of the balanced metabolism, a weak autonomic system, back into balance. And to bring the autonomic system into, to, up to a high level of efficiency, where both branches work together, and correspondingly, the various physiological systems, respiration, cardiovascular, digestive, endocrine, you will follow, and their efficiency and their homeostatic equilibrium will improve, and whatever diseases will tend to vanish away. Sounds simplistic. Let's see how he came to that. Kelly grew up in Kansas in a dirt poor farm during the Depression. His mother had a lot of ambition. There were three Kelly boys. They were going to go to college. His older brother was a very famous dental surgeon, took care of all the royal families in the Middle East. His younger brother was an expert in, in English literature, still alive, and one of the world's experts on Robert ba uh, Browning, the poet. Kelly was a, a medical corpsman during World War II, after, got interested in medicine as a result, afterwards went to Baylor, did his major in biochemistry and was very mechanical, so he decided to go to dental school, went to Baylor Dental School, graduated in 1954, and afterwards did postgraduate training in orthodontics at Washington University, University of Alabama, and opened up, he liked Texas, he'd gone to school there, though he grew up originally in Kansas, opened up a, an office in Grapevine, Texas, which in those days was a sleepy suburb of Dallas and Fort Worth, and he was a very, very successful orthodontist. He developed a way of straightening teeth that doesn't involve braces, which other orthodontists weren't too happy about, it was the temp temporal mandibular equilibration um, appliance. It was an appliance that you put underneath the tongue, it pushes the lower teeth, and Kelly realized there were reflexes that would go up to the upper teeth without even touching the upper teeth. They would start straightening, the skull bones would move. You know, anatomy in medical school, they teach you the skull bones don't move, they're like cement. Well, actually, they do move, and they actually have a pulse, and cranial osteopaths can actually feel the pulse of the skull bones, and Kelly was aware of that. He helped develop cranial osteopathy. With the simple maneuver, he could straighten the teeth. So all the Texas trillionaires would send their kids to Kelly for their, his, their teeth to be straightened, and people from the Southwest, all of the country would come to him for that. And he might have continued on his career as a very successful multi-trillionaire orthodontist, active in, the, active in the community. He was on the church board, the school board, uh, uh, taught Bible study at the local church, except he got real sick. He was like 35 years old, early 1960, I mean really sick. He was a tough guy, a classic sympathetic dominant, so he just ignored symptoms. He ends up in the emergency room, and all the doctors were friends. They were at the country club with him, at the same church with him, and the school board with him. And they, you know, this is 1962, around the, before CAT scans. But they had x-rays, and they had tests they could do, and they realized he had tumors in his lung, whoops, tumors in his hip. He always walked with a limp because he had a big tumor in his right hip. Tumor in his pancreas, and they realized he had pancreatic cancer. Now, he was so weak, and this is a credit to his toughness, that he didn't go to the doctor sooner. He kept working. He was so weak, they didn't even want to risk surgery. In those days, they didn't have CAT scan guided needle biopsies. In 1962, they'd have to open up, and they said, it isn't worth it. You have stage four pancreatic cancer. How long do I have? About eight weeks. Well, that was a problem for Kelly. He had four young kids, all of them adopted, as he said, and he realized if he died, they might end up back in the orphanage. So he said, I can't die. Now, he knew about Price's work, and he was interested in nutrition as a result of his dental work. You know, dentists know far more nutrition than physicians generally. And he realized, well, there was no chemo. This is the 1960s, about six chemo drugs now. Well, there are about 160 now. Most of them don't work very well anyway. But there was nothing they could do. No one was going to treat him. It was inoperable. It was stage four and as long as hip. It was even metastasized into his heart, which is rare for pancreatic cancer. And he had a regular heart rhythm his entire life because of the tumor that invaded and damaged his heart. 
And he realized the only thing he could manipulate was diet. And this is the difference between geniuses and the rest of us. Many of us would have just given up, watched TV, and died. He said, no way. So he would start experimenting with foods. And this is, you know, you study geniuses, you realize they just work so differently. Why he thought about doing this? I never would have thought of it. He would take one food at a time and see the effect on his tumor. Now, he was lucky in a very unlucky way. His liver was so full of cancer, he had tumors popping out of his abdomen. So he could actually tell the effect of a food because he said if he ate a food that had a negative effect, within half an hour, an hour, that tumor would start growing. He could feel it like gurgling. And he noticed immediately certain foods, red meat, poultry, fish, made that tumor grow. Other foods, all fruits, particularly raw. Now, if they were cooked, they had a negative effect. If they were raw, they had a positive effect. These are things he just discovered serendipitously. He had never heard of Dr. Howell, whom I mentioned earlier. The raw foods movement didn't exist then. These were things he was just figuring out serendipitously, trying to keep himself alive. So raw foods were great. Vegetables, all vegetables, from asparagus to zucchini, were helpful. Most of them were better if they were raw. I mean, certain things like artichoke, of course, you have to cook. He noticed he did really well with leafy greens. He didn't know why. He just, when he, he just instinctively, he was a man of great instincts. Smart people often are. He just felt leafy greens helped him. And he noticed of the fruits, citrus seemed to be the most valuable. He started eating lots of leafy greens and citrus. He noticed juices helped, carrot juice. This is the 1960s before juicing was a big deal. People juiced, the champion juicer was available. He bought, bought himself a juicer and started making, he found carrot juice was the best. He would have four glasses of carrot juice a day. That seemed to slow the tumor growth. Celery juice, for some reason, seemed to help. He noticed he did, with, did well with eggs and yogurt, but no other animal products. So it was largely about 80% raw foods, lots of fruits, vegetables, nuts, seeds, whole grains. Everything was organic. 1960s, hard to get organic, but it really made a difference. He found if he ate the regular supermarket food with the pesticides, the tumor would seem to grow. And again, he had no prejudice. He was just trying to save his life. So he started getting sources of the cleanest food he could get. It was a plant-based diet with an egg or two a day. Um, Yogurt, eight ounces, he freshly made, he made his own yogurt, he actually bought his own goats, and he was in suburban, you know, professional area. He had these goats, and goats are not quiet animals, those of you who know goats will attest. And of course, the local town board wasn't too happy with him, but they all knew him, so they let him keep his goats. So he had raw yogurt, no fish, poultry, red meat, lots of fruits, lots of citrus, lots of vegetables, as much as he could get, the six glasses of juice a day. He found almonds seemed to help, he didn't know why. He was having 10 raw almonds for breakfast, 10 raw almonds for lunch. Um, so basically, it was a plant-based vegetarian diet, and a miracle happened. Eight weeks passed, ten weeks passed, he didn't die. He wasn't better. He still felt like garbage, you know, stage four pancreatic cancer, a very symptom-inducing type of syndrome. But he wasn't dead. And then he gets the serendipitous idea again. You know, I knew him so well. And he said, well, I just thought about it one day. I said, yeah, but Dr. Keller, other people wouldn't think about doing this. He decided to start testing individual nutrients. And he would do it on an empty stomach. And he would go through the list. And he started with beta-carotene, which seemed to help. Yet he took vitamin A, which is the nutrient that's convert, beta carotene is converted into vitamin A in the liver. Vitamin A is preformed vitamin A. He would take that and the tumor seemed to get bigger. So he took beta carotene. He found certain B vitamins, thiamine, riboflavin, niacin, pyridoxin, folic acid, seemed to slow tumor growth. Other B vitamins, B12, choline and nostal, paramino benzoic acid, um, pantothenic acid, seemed to make the tumor grow. So he left those out. He did really well with large doses of C. I mean, large doses, this is 1962 before Linus Pauling. He found six to eight grams a day, just serendipitously through his own observations and experimentation, determined that was the best dose. Did well with D. I mean, it wasn't on huge doses by today's standard, but one to 2,000 units a day. Did real well with D, but did terribly with E. Didn't know why. He just felt the tumor grew when he took E on an empty stomach and observed it. He did terribly with calcium, remember Pottinger? Terribly with calcium, did extremely well with magnesium and potassium. And when I met him years later, he said, you know, of all the minerals, magnesium and potassium seemed to have a very sal salutary effect on his tumors. He just felt better. He did great with the trace minerals, magnesium and, uh, magnesium and chromium, but terribly with zinc and selenium. He experimented with the fatty acids. He found he did well with the plant-based omega-3 essential fatty acid, alpha-linolenic acid, which is in flaxseed and chia seals. But he did terribly with the preformed uh, omega-3 fatty acids from fish oil. Everyone's being told to take fish oil. Well, Kelly tried those. They were available 40 or 50 years ago. He did terribly with the cosapentanoic acid, the cosahexanoic acid, which are the omega-3 fatty acids from animal products. But he did great with alpha-linolenic acid. So we worked out this supplement program. He didn't know why. He didn't know Harry, how this worked. He didn't know what the biochemistry was. He just knew from observation he did well with these supplements. And his disease stabilized, and months passed. Three to four months, five months, wasn't dead. He was even going back to work. His mother came down from Kansas to help him run his office. His wife was taking care of the four kids. And he was able to see patients. He would see a patient, then rest for a while. Pancreatic cancer is very debilitating, as you know. See a patient, go rest for half an hour. 
just to keep the income going and keep his office going. He wasn't dead, he wasn't better, he could still feel the tumors, but they weren't exploding, and he hadn't died. But then he had a problem, serendipity, as he said, God governed his life. Of course, pancreatic cancer begins in the pancreas. That's the, one of the main digestive organs. That's where the insulin and all the pancreatic enzymes are produced necessary to break down proteins, fats, carbs. He tended to have high blood sugar because the beta cells were destroyed largely by this huge tumor sitting in his pancreas. And he wasn't producing a lot of pancreatic enzymes. One of the first signs of pancreatic cancer, often ignored by conventional medical doctors, is patients report vague digestive problems. Reflux, gas, food just sits, bloating and digestion. They just don't feel well, they burp, they bloat, they pass gas rectally. Well, Kelly had a lot of that. And of course, he was eating a lot of raw food, which tends to be gas promoting. So the, the, the indigestion was becoming so serious, he went to his local pharmacist, whom he knew, who was on the church board in the country, in the country club and on the school board. He said, oh, that's easy, his name was, they call him Don. That's easy, Don, you need to take some pancreatic enzymes. In those days, Viocase made by uh, Biobin, which was a subsidiary of A.H. Robbins, big pharmaceutical company, made the the most predominant form of both over-the-counter and prescription pancreatic enzymes called Viocase. And Kelly was a man of excess, so his, his friend said, you should buy some of this. So Kelly bought it by the case and started taking them. And he took them, you know, he was advised to take them with meals. Makes sense, you try to help your digestion. You take three, five, six, ten with each meal. Then, here's where serendipity and genius comes in. He gets this brilliant idea that he's going to start taking them away from meals. Why? He, he could never tell me why, so it was instinct. Starts taking them away from meals, like five or six doses a day, eight, ten at a time. And he noticed, extraordinary observer, that's how you can tell a scientist, extraordinary observer, that he would take a dose of pancreatic enzymes away from him, not when he took them with meals, only away from meals. And within half an hour, he could feel something going on, like he said, the way it felt as if the tumor was being digested, to put it in simplistic terms. And he would, he, he, he would take another dose, he would divide them through the day, five or six doses, another ten, and he said 20 minutes later, you could feel them absolutely digesting away the, the, these tumors. He could, they began to feel softer, cyst-like. One of the nice things that happens when your therapy's working is a solid tumor becomes cyst-like. It becomes like fluid. It breaks down. It, it becomes like a cyst. And that began to happen. So he went to his pharmacist and said, is there any evidence that pancreatic enzymes have an anti-cancer? In fact, the pharmacy said, literally broke out laughing. He said, ah, there's no, of course not. It's not even absorbed. They're pancreatic enzymes. Enzymes are proteins. They're digested in the gut. They're not even absorbed. He went to his doctor friends that had made the diagnosis, who were astonished he was still alive, by the way. They said, no, 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 Don. There's no way pancreatic enzymes can be absorbed. And there's absolutely no way, no way they can have an anti-cancer effect. He says, you guys are wrong. He said, these are having some effect on my pancreas. He said, you, just, you guys told me I'd be dead in eight weeks. And it's six, seven months now. And I ain't dead yet. So like he always did in such circumstances, when popular teaching went against what he observed, he went to the library. And the University of Texas in Dallas had then and has today, it's a preeminent medical school, they have a great medical library, did then. He starts going through the books on the library, and he comes across this book, Enzyme Treatment of Cancer, 1911, John Beer, SCD, professor, University of Edinburgh, Enzyme Treatment of Cancer, pulls it off, 280 pages. Starts reading it, page after page after page, this extraordinary documentation that pancreatic enzymes have an anti-cancer effect. Laboratory studies, animal, trial, animal trials, case reports from, a, you know, in that time, it was 60 years earlier. Dumbfounded, never heard. The book had been on the library for you know, 40 years, had never been taken out since it was bought in, you know, 19, it was published in 1911. And it's, it's interesting that, again, serendipity, they had a copy. I've searched the world through, you know, with the internet, you can search everything through book dealers, libraries. There are about 18 copies of that. It never was reprinted. 18 copies of that book in existence. I was able to get an original copy, which we have reprinted now, Enzyme Treatment of Cancer, as a facsimile of the original with an introduction by me page after page, and Kelly became a master of, of, of John Beard. John Beard, the next person in our history lesson. Born in 1856 in Manchester, did his undergraduate work at the University of London in zoology, and like a lot of bright Englishmen in those days, when you're studying science, you go abroad. So he went to the University of Würzburg, the University of Freiburg, got his SCD, which is a PhD in zoology and embryology in, 19, in 1884, a long time ago. I, have a, I got a copy of his Theses from a secondhand book distributor in London, extraordinarily what these book dealers in London have. It's that thick, and it's on the development of a sense organ of a parasitic worm that lives off another worm. He was basically an embryologist interested in the development of sense organs of invertebrates, which is about as esoteric ivory tower science as you could ever find. And how he got to that to figure out cancer is interesting. So I once lectured for three hours just on John Beard. 
After, his, after he finished his PhD work, he got a job at the University of Edinburgh teaching zoology and embryology. A lot of his embryological findings from that period, 1890, 1900, are still quoted in the literature today, and he was nominated for the Nobel Prize in 1906 because of his embryology research, but his cancer work was so controversial, he lost. So it's, it's an interesting story. He was very well known as a zoologist, and his colleagues told him he should never have gotten involved with this cancer stuff. Of course, he was determined to do that. How did he get involved with cancer? Well, again, as I'm saying with Kelly and people like Pottinger, genius follows its own direction. It doesn't work by A, B, C, D. It goes from A to Z and back to K. And it just follows its own route. And Beard was interested in the development of the nervous system in invertebrates. And then he got really wild and started to, st started to study the development of the nervous system in vertebrates. And then he got even wilder and just started to, dis to study the development of the nervous system in mammals. And that led him to the placenta, because at that point, let's say 1890s, there hadn't been a lot of work on the placenta. You all know what the placenta was. You know, we mammals have a problem. Reptiles, birds, amphibians, snakes, the mother lays the egg, fish in the water, reptiles, et cetera, on the land, amphibians in the water. And the egg grows outside the mother's body, hatches, and it's fully functional, or it better be, it's going to die. We mammals have a different problem. The, the embryo develops in uterus, in the mother's uterus, and it gets the oxygen and nutrients from the mother's blood supply and gets rid of its metabolic waste into the blood supply of the mother. And that creates an, two immediate problems. In us mammals, the embryo has to very quickly correct, connect to the uterus, otherwise it's going to pop out and die. And secondly, very quickly, the embryo has to make a connection to the blood supply of the mother, otherwise it's going to die. A human embryo cannot grow beyond a cubic centimeter without connecting to the blood supply of the mother, otherwise it's going to die. And Beard became the first scientist actually to, to stepwise determine the various processes that occur after fertilization. Fertilization, to remind you of your anatomy, occurs in the fallopian tubes. About, in the humans, about three days later, the fallopian tubes lead to the uterus. The uterus is shaped like an inverted pear. It's a central canal, the uterine canal. And like all canals in the body, it's lined by an epithelium. Remember from histology, epithelial tissues are just lining tissues. I use, when I speak to lay audience, I use, always use the analogy of like a picket fence embedded into cement where the pickets are the cells and the cement is the basement membrane, which is very tough on a molecular level. It consists of proteins like fibronectin, labanin, collagen, very tough barrier. It protects the underlying tissues from invasion from microorganisms or from toxic chemicals. All the, all the cavities in the body are lined with this epithelium. It's a tough thing to break through on a molecular biochemical level, and yet that the embryo has to figure out how to, how, to way, how to do that, a way to do that. Now, after fertilization, there's an asymmetric division. It goes from one cell to two cells to three cells to four cells. By the time it reaches the end of the fallopian tubes, where you have the, this cavern of the uterine canal facing it, it's about 100 cells, and they're all about equally undifferentiated, very amoeboid-like. There's been no differentiation left. And then there's a remarkable transformation, just as the, the embryo at that point called the blastocyst reaches the end of the fallopian tubes. A single layer of cell forms around the embryo, or the, what's going to be the embryo, called the inner cell masses, the inner mass of cells, and a single layer of cells called the trophoblast, from Greek to nurture. That's going to become the placenta. The placenta is the tissue, of course, as you know, that connects the embryo. First, it anchors it to the uterus, which is critical so it doesn't fall out, and it also forms the blood supply connection between the embryo and the mother's uterine arteries and veins. So the blastocyst reaches the fallopian tubes, a single layer of cells, trophoblast form, the embryo makes the dive into the uterine canal, and it has to connect very quickly. If it doesn't connect in the upper third of the uterine lining, it's going to die. And breaking through that uterine lining that quickly, and that's a tough lining to break through on a molecular level, very tough, but it does it most of the time very efficiently. If it doesn't, we get, you know, dead fetus, dead, failed pregnancy. And it does it very quickly. And Beard realized this was an extraordinary uh, phenomena where this trophoblast breaks through the epithelial line, it breaks through the basement membrane, breaks into the underlying stroma, migrates through it, and very quickly creates a blood supply that connects to the blood supply of the mother. And he, using the tools from 100 years ago, which is remarkable, they didn't have electron microscopes or a lot of these elaborate staining techniques, he realized that it's a two-part system when the blood supplies connect. Blood vessels, both arterioles and venules, grow out from the trophoblast and the embryo, but also there seemed to be some signal whereas the mother's arteries and venules start reaching toward the embryo and then they connect and they mish. And if that happens, then the embryo can live. Now Beard spent years studying the trophoblast. Again, a lot of his uh, observation in that period is still quoted in the literature today, though he gets no credit at all for his cancer theory. 
And he realized that trophoblasts are very complex, and he didn't realize the molecular biology of how the trophoblasts and the enzymes that are used to break through the epithelial line, a very complicated molecular biology which is being delineated today, you know, 100 years later. But he, he realized that there are five basic components to the trophoblast that distinguish it. First, under the microscope, it's prim primitive and undifferentiated. All of you have studied histology. Differentiation is simply the morphological characteristics of a cell that distinguish it. Every first-year medical optometry chiropractic student knows how to distinguish a nerve cell with the cell body and the dendrites and the axon from a muscle cell with the myosin and actin filaments that look like it's contractile to an absorptive cell like the cells that line the colon with the brush border so it increases the surface um, area so it can absorb nutrients very efficiently to the secretory cells of the pancreas, the cells that produce the enzymes of those big vacuoles sitting in the cytoplasm. They always use the pancreatic assigner cells as a secretory cell example. You know, they're all very distinctive. The way they look under the microscope reflects their function, and this is the quality of differentiation. We have over 200 cell types in our body. Each one has its own particular morphological structure, its own differentiation. Trophoblastic cells have no such differentiation. They're very primitive, amorphous, like amoebas. They proliferate without restraint. They have an exponential proliferative rate. They're invasive. We have over 200 cell types. There is only one normal cell type that can invade through epithelial linings and that's the trophoblast. Other cells and tissues seem simple. They cannot invade through an epithelial lining. It's a barrier they can't breach. Trophoblast can. It's unique among normal tissues in its ability to do that. Once it gets into the underlying uterine stroma, it very quickly migrates, invading all the way through, producing. Um, Beer didn't know about enzymes at that point and how the trophoblast does that. We now know it uses matrix metalloproteinases, a type of proteinase that breaks through the collagen, the fibrin, the, lam the laminin, fibronectin that create this base membrane. And very quickly, they didn't use the word angiogenesis 100 years ago. That's a modern term. That's just the process of creating new vessels. But they knew what it was, and Beard knew what it was, and he very quickly that the embryo was and the trophoblasts were producing vessels and the mother's blood vessels somehow through some signaling were reaching out to the embryo and it worked fine and the embryo made it, was, could survive. So five characteristics of trophoblast, primitive, undifferentiated, proliferates without restraint, invasive, migratory, and angiogenic, although Beard didn't use the word angiogenic. Five simple characteristics. Here's how geniuses differ for the rest of us. Most geniuses are interested in a lot of things. They may spend their life studying one narrow area initially, but it always leads them to other things, like Blake the poet, the English poet said, from a, a grain of sand you can see the universe. Linus Pauling started with the most, whom I knew well, one of the reasons I went to medical school, which I'll talk about later, started out with esoteric energetics in physical chemistry, physical organic chemistry. He wrote a classic textbook, if you're interested in that kind of stuff, that was used for generations. He won two, but then he got interested in protein metabolism from his work on physical chemistry. He figured out the defect in um, uh, uh, sickle cell anemia, which was not his interest at all initially, and then got involved with DNA and how with the structure. And it was actually Pauling who said that DNA was a helix structure. Watson and Crick didn't figure that out. It was Linus Pauling. Pauling made the mistake thinking it was a triple helix, three molecules of the bases wrapped around each other. It turned out it was a double helix. Watson and Crick basically, let's say, borrowed Pauling's idea of the helix, but realized, based on X-ray crystallography, that it was a double helix. Won the Nobel Prize was in 1963 or four for DNA. Pauling should have run it, but he was busy and didn't realize it was a double helix. Very interested in a lot of different things. Beard was the same way, you know, 80 years, ago, 80 years before Pauling. He was interested in cancer. Now, why an SCD in embryology at the University of Edinburgh, interested in the development of sense organs of a parasitic worm that lived off another worm, got interested in cancer to this day? I can't find it. I understand there's some diaries of his in a, in a vault at the University of Edinburgh. Someday, if I have the time, effort, energy, I'll go over there and try and track it down. He kept apparently meticulous diaries. Some of them I've seen, and he kept every day of what he was doing scientifically. But he was very interested in cancer. We think of 100 years ago as a primitive time in science. Wrong. You know, Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center was formed in 1884. By 1900, brilliant, phys brilliant pathologists like Virchow in, in uh, Germany and in the U.S. And, and England had delineated 100 different types of cancer. They knew what it was. They knew how to identify it under the microscope. They knew what it looked like. They knew how it behaved. There were cancer hospitals in existence. There was a big effort in cancer research around the, just the time Beard was active at the University of Edinburgh. University of Edinburgh had its own great medical center, and they had a big cancer research um, area as well. Charles Darwin, interestingly enough, basically flunked out of the University of Edinburgh Medical School, which is not generally uh, promoted in his biography. But it was a great learning center. They had a great medical school. So people knew about cancer, and Beard was fascinated with cancer. Now today, there are textbooks 200 pages, 2,000 pages thick, small print. I have one textbook that's that big, very small print, 2,500 pages 
on cancer, cancer molecular biology, the physiology, biochemistry of cancer. But Beard realized 100 years ago that cancer, however complex it may be today from a molecular biology standpoint, is really quite simple. Five basic characteristics. Under the microscope, one of the distinguishing characteristics of cancer, as you all know from pathology, it's very primitive and undifferentiated. We have 200 cell types. They're very distinctive. Cancer becomes less distinctive. As cancer develops, it loses a lot of the mor morphologic specificity, becomes primitive and undifferentiated, like amoeba. A very aggressive cancer of the brain really resembles a cancer of the muscles, a sarcoma really resembles a colon cancer, really resembles uh, an assign or pancreatic cancer to the point if they're very aggressive, they lose all morphological distinguishing characteristics. You can't tell one part from the other. So it's primitive undifferentiated. Proliferates without restraint. Everybody knows one of the characteristics of cancer. It doesn't behave nicely. Normal tissues will replicate only as needed to replace those lost through normal turnover, like in the intestinal tract, cells that are lost to disease, uh, injury, or cell, normal cell death, apoptosis. And they'll replace the cells as needed, like the lining of the intestinal tract sloughs off every five days. That's a major uh, job to have to replenish that, but it does it, and normally does as needed, and only as needed, and that's fine. But cancer isn't so well behaved. Of course, it proliferates without restraint. It doesn't behave. It keeps growing, growing, growing until the host dies or until it's cured, su treated successfully. Cancer is invasive. The trophoblast is the only invasive normal tissue. Cancer is the other invasive tissue. It very efficiently breaks through boundaries. It breaks through epithelial linings, basement membranes, through the stroma. Interestingly enough, modern molecular biologists know that cancer uses exactly the same matrix metalloproteinases, protein digesting enzymes, as does the trophoblast, particularly matrix metalloproteinase 2 and 9, exactly used by trophoblast to break through epithelial linings, exactly used by cancer. So it's invasive. It migrates to the underlying tissue very effectively. And of course, if cancer is nothing else, it's angiogenic. While a human embryo cannot grow beyond a cubic centimeter until it connects to the blood supply of the mother, cancer cannot grow beyond exactly the same, a cubic centimeter, unless it connects to the blood supply of the host, which provides oxygen and nutrients and a source to get rid of the metabolic waste from the rapidly growing tumor. So cancer, poorly differentiated under the microscope, proliferates without restraint. It's invasive, migratory, angiogenic. Beard had said earlier, Trophoblast, primitive and undifferentiated, proliferates without restraint, initially invasive migratory angiogenic, angiogenic. Beard was the first scientist in history to point out very astutely that in its behavior, in its morphology, appearance, and behavior, cancer resembles exactly the early trophoblast, exactly. Poorly differentiated, proliferates without restraint, invasive migratory angiogenic. Lest that seem like an esoteric phenomena or observation, molecular biologists today, particularly Murray and Leslie at the University of North Carolina, Ferretti in Europe, have decided, without knowing anything about Beard, that the trophoblast is the ideal model to study tumor behavior, that in its appearance and behavior in its early incarnation, the trophoblast behaves and looks like just like a tumor, and on a molecular level in terms of transcription factors, matrix metalloproteinases, et cetera, DNA replication, uses exactly the same enzymes and molecules as does Trophoblast uses the same molecules as does the cancer. Cancer uses the same molecules as does the trophoblast. Beard was the first in history, now confirmed by modern molecular biologists, that the trophoblast is the ideal model to study cancer biology. But he went a step further here. Again, genius differs from the rest of us. He did something I never would have thought about doing. He said, yeah, the trophoblast is a good model for cancer biology. It creates a good analogy. It's a good allegory for cancer. But above and beyond that, Cancer is trophoblastic in its origins. Simple sentence. What did he mean by that? Well, in Beard's day and today, they taught that cancer generally develops from the normal, mature, healthy, differentiated tissues in some organ like the intestine or the liver or the pancreas or the breast. They're doing the job, happily going along life, and something terrible happens genetically, metabolically, in terms of the basic genome, and suddenly the cancer cell turns into something ugly and horrible. It loses its differentiation. It starts replicating without restraint. It suddenly develops this new characteristic of invasiveness. It migrates unlike normal tissues. It's angiogenic above and beyond what any normal tissue does. And it's because the mature differentiated cells have gone cockeyed and end up going backwards and becoming this monster-like tissue that can kill. Beard said that's a lot of hokey. He said a mature differentiated tissue can no more become a primitive undifferentiated cell then an adult can become a baby again. He said it's impossible. It's like going backward in time. In fact, he uses that analogy in his, in his book. He said that's not where cancer comes from. He pointed out, and this is all correct, and it's amazing, again, using the tools from 110 and 100 years ago, he figured all this out, that during embryo, embryological development in the mammal, 
As the trophoblast first forms, a lot of the trophoblast will eventually form the placenta, which is the connection to the uterus and the connection to the mother, mother's blood supply. Wonderful, that's what they're supposed to do. But a lot of them don't end up there. A lot of them start migrating through the developing embryo, and they end up in every tissue, organ, and gland where they form nests of the primitive undifferentiated tissues, where they sit in all of us, every single one of us, six or billion and seven billion people on Earth, whatever it is. In every one of us, in every tissue, organ, and gland, there are these nests of these primitive undifferentiated trophoblasts that kind of took a wayward path in embryological development. It happens in everybody. In every species that he studied, in every mammalian species, this happened. He didn't know what, why, or how, but he said they're there. Whether healthy or unhealthy, there they are, these nests of primitive undifferentiated cells. And he said through some stimulus, normally he said these cells will sit there quietly through the duration of our life and do nothing. They just sit there. He didn't know why they were there. We will talk about that in a minute. But he said through some abnormal stimulus, inflammation, infection, he used the word inflammation. Well, 100 years later, inflammation is a major research subject in cancer. Cancer is thought now to be caused by unbridled, unregulated inflammation. These trophoblastic cells get stimulated to follow their normal biological natural history, which is to start replicating and to start invading and to start migrating and to start being angiogenic, just like a cancer. He said cancer does not develop from mature differentiated tissues, but develops from these primitive undifferentiated cells that lose their normal regulatory control, start forming trophoblastic placenta-like tissues in the wrong place at the wrong time, which is what we call cancer. Extraordinary observation. His colleagues thought he was crazy. They didn't know what he was talking about. That's one of the reasons it didn't win the Nobel Prize in 1906. Now, lest that seem like esoteria, uh, what Beard was describing in his way were trophoblasts were stem cells. McCullough and Till, 1960s, get credit for discovering stem cells. They didn't know anything about Beard. What are stem cells? Primitive, undifferentiated cells that sit in every tissue and organ and gland in our body, and they serve an absolutely critical life-sustaining function. Their job is to create a reserve of cells to replace those that are lost through normal turnover, like the intestinal tract that sloughs off every five days, that are lost through injury, disease, or normal cell death. Stem cells exist from the brain to the toenails, and their job is to serve as the essential replacement. Without stem cells, we would die, because it turns out that the normal differentiated cells can't really replicate and can't replace cells that are lost, which is what we were taught, totally incorrect, all, this, all these the new cells that are needed, like along the intestinal line or wherever, come from stem cells, even the brain. We were taught, in, in when I was taking neuroscience, that brain cells can't replace once they're injured. We know that's not true. There are stem cells in the brain that can replace neurons that are lost through injury, disease, death, stroke, whatever. They can regenerate, and they're absolutely critical. Now, if these stem cells don't perform their normal life-sustaining function, but start going off in aberrant pathways, they can form cancer. In the 19, about 1994, Dr. Dick at the University of Toronto, first scientist since Beard, although he didn't know anything about Beard, said cancer does not develop from mature differentiated tissues, but develop from stem cells that lose their normal regulatory their restraint. These are undifferentiated, poorly differentiated cells with enormous replicative potential that can replace entire linings of intestinal tract in five days. They lose their normal restraint. They, ha they develop, and they, they have, they're totally potential. They can do just about anything. They can invade, they can migrate, and they can be angiogenic. Stem cells can do anything. They're trying to replace entire organs with stem cells. They can do just about anything, including a form of cancer. Dr. Wick at the University of Michigan is the proponent, the, pre the predominant proponent, emphasizing and insisting through a careful, meticulous documentation that cancer does not develop from mature differentiated tells cells, as I was taught in uh, medical school you know, 30 years ago, but develops from stem cells that go berserk. And increasingly, researchers at the highest level of the molecular biology establishment are beginning to believe cancer develops from stem cells. This is what Beard discovered 100 years ago. Now, it's interesting. Modern contemporary molecular biologists who study such things don't really know where stem cells come from. It's a great mystery. Beard solved that 100 years ago. He said they developed from the trophoblast during embryonic development with these primitive undifferentiated cells. Some of them end up at the placenta where they should develop, but a lot of them end up in the tissues or the glands, forming these nests of cells, which we call stem cells. He didn't realize they had an essential life-sustaining function, that is to replace cells, tissues, loss of normal turnover, disease, death, and injury. But he saw them, identified them, and knew they were there, and knew, knew they could cause trouble, as Dr. Dick at Toronto and Dr. Wick at Michigan, brilliant men, are now saying. So Beard was, Beard's problem was he was 80 years ahead of his time. When you're 80, you know, if you're 10 or 20 years ahead of your time, you can be recognized in your lifetime. He was too far ahead of his time. No one knew what he was talking about with these wayward trophoblasts. But Beard, again, being a genius, took another step. He knew there was a major difference between the trophoblast and cancer. Even if trophoblast was the source of cancer, even if cancer developed from the trophoblast, there was one major distinction that occurred most of the time. 
in most of us, and the reason we're alive, at some point in embryonic development, the trophoblast changes from this poorly differentiated, proliferating, invading, migrating angiogenic tissue into the mature placenta. And Beard was the first person to point out that transformation, which is quite remarkable, begins around day 56 after conception. And he was absolutely correct how he figured that out 100 years ago. I don't know, but he did, and it's correct. And then very quickly, over a period of several weeks, the mature placenta form. Now, the mature placenta is like any other organ. It has a number of different cell types, all of them very differentiated, very distinctive under the microscope. It's no longer amorphous like the early trophoblast. It stops proliferating. The mature placenta is about 8 to 10 centimeters in diameter. It's like a pie. It's circular. It's about 2 inches thick. It has septa, like the slices of a pie. I think like slices of a pie. And these septa are narrow cell walls. On one side of the septa percolates the mother's blood. On the other side per percolates the embryo's blood. And that's where you get the exchange of oxygen and carbon dioxide. And the, and the release of nutrients into the, mother, the release of waste into the mother's blood supply. And it's not invading, and it ceases re uh, replication, and it's no longer angiogenic. It's a mature, well-behaved, quiet little organ. And Beard said this is remarkable because, indeed, if the trophoblast is a good allegory and allergy for cancer, and if cancer is actually trophoblast in its origins, if I could figure out what causes this remarkable transformation from the early invasive cancer-like trophoblast to the mature placenta, I would have the answer to cancer. Simple question. It took Beard about two years to do what would have taken me about 10,000 years and about 1,000 research assistants to figure out. He realized, and again, working with the tools from 1900, 1898, that the very day the trophoblast changed its character and underwent this remarkable transformation from the early cancer-like tissue into the mature placenta was the very day the human embryo began secreting pancreatic enzymes. Pancreatic enzymes first identified 1858 by Courvoisier, the French researcher. Named, trypsin was named by Kuhn, 1876. By 1900, the three main classes of pancreatic enzymes had been developed, the pro, de, des, described. The protein-digesting proteolytic enzymes, the triglyceride-digesting lipases, the sugar-digesting amylases. They'd been described. They knew they were digestive enzymes. They, they knew a lot of this biochemistry and physiology 100 years ago. And that was thought to be their function. Beard said, yeah, they have that function, but based on my embryological studies, they also appear to be the main controlling element of placenta development. And since the cancer is not only like trophoblast as an analogy, but actually is trophoblast in its origins, pancreatic enzymes, since they control pro pro trophoblastic development, must be our main defense against cancer. First paper presenting the trophoblastic origins of cancer and the use of pancreatic enzymes against them, 1902 in Lancet, created an uproar because he was already well known in the scientific community. The press covered it because he was a well-known scientist. Beard, being a meticulous investigator, then went to laboratory studies. 100 years ago was not a primitive time in medicine. They actually had animal models. They had the Jensen mouse model, which was like a sarcoma. And Beard did a very simple study. He took six animals that had the sarcoma, didn't treat them. They were the control. They died very quickly. Two animals injected pancreatic enzymes. This, uh, at that time, they thought they had to be injected. And the tumors went away, and the animals lived a normal life. As a result of those animal studies, a number of physicians in the U.S. and abroad became interested in Beard's work and began using pancreatic enzymes under his direction to treat their cancer patients. 1900, 1905, they didn't have a lot of treatment. The first case I've ever found in the literature, and I have dozens of papers from the conventional medical literature, a guy by the name of Clarence Rice, who had an office in New York City, and he had a patient with a fungating laryngeal cancer, under Beard's direction, injected the enzyme. In those days, I thought they had to be injected. The tumor sloughed off and the patient lived. Between 1905 and about 1911, dozens of reports in the conventional medical literature detailing cases of advanced metastatic colon, rectal, prostate, pancreatic, breast cancer that got well with the enzymes published in the literature. Yet Beard's book, although it created an initial stir, when he died in 1924, he died in obscurity. And what happened? Madame Curie happened. Madame Curie, well-loved first great media science star, had won two Nobel Prizes. Nobel Prize began being offered around 1899. By 1905, 1906, she'd already run two, won two. She had an interesting story, dirt poor immigrant from Poland, the first PhD student in theoretical physics at the woman student in phys theoretical physics at the University of Paris, married to a very brilliant physicist. Um, they worked together in radiation. X-rays had been discovered in 1895. By 1900, they were already being used therapeutically. It was remarkable. You could look into the human body, something that had never been un done before, thought possible. By the early uh, 20th century, they were starting to use them therapeutically, and they thought it was remarkable that tumors would regress. They made a, several leaps of faith that were unfortunate. Madame Curie announced to the world around, just as Beard was announcing his results with animal and human studies, that radiation was a simple, easy, non-toxic cure for all cancer. 
She was wrong on all counts, two Nobel Prizes, two Nobel, two Nobel Prizes notwithstanding. She herself would die of aplastic anemia brought on by the Cavalier exposure to radiation. Entire generation of researchers died because they thought radiation was non-toxic. Of course, it was terribly toxic. Most cancers didn't respond even when they did. It usually came back more aggressive, and often radiation would kill the patient. It wasn't the simple answer. By the time scientists realized that, Beard was dead and buried. His work lost, almost lost to obscurity. It would be periodically rediscovered in the 1920s and 30s. There was a physician out in St. Louis, Dr. Morris, who rediscovered Beard's work and began to use pancreatic enzymes injectable in patients with cancer and got good results and presented his work at the St. Louis Medical Society. It was 1934 and was attacked viciously for promoting quackery, even though he had good documentation. In the 1950s and 60s, Dr. Frank Shively, a general surgeon in Dayton, Ohio, rediscovered Beard's work, serendipity again, and got a local drug company to make injectable enzymes and treated 192 patients with advanced cancer with 12 remarkable regressions in long-term survival. 1966, the FDA issued an edict outlawing the use of injectable pancreatic enzymes, claiming that pancreatic enzymes and digestive enzymes, there's absolutely no rationale to use them injectably, and they're no longer, longer were available. Shively, who mistakenly thought, if you don't have injectable enzymes, you can't treat cancer, closed his, his cancer practice, went back to general surgery. Meanwhile, Kelly's reading all this stuff, and his cancers are getting better. First with oral enzymes, Beer thought they had to be injectable. It turns out they are absorbed, even though trypsin is about 255 amino acids, very complicated the tertiary and quaternary structure is absorbed through active and passive transport. Well, Kelly didn't know any of that. He just knew that he took these enzymes and his tumor was breaking down. And that was the next element to his program, the diet, the supplements, the pancreatic enzyme. He was taking large doses. And he thought he had the answer. Those tumors were aggressing. He thought he'd finally discovered something. And reading Beard's book is like this brilliant guy. I mean, just at this time Kelly was doing this, stem cells were starting to make their way into the literature, both in the lay and the scientific press. Kelly starts, starts taking these enzymes. And for a couple months, he's doing great, and the tumors are aggressing. Then he starts getting sick. Flu-like symptoms. Initially, they're mild, tired, fatigued, lethargic, fevers, chills. He starts getting nausea, and something terrible happens. He starts throwing up. Every time he took a dose of pancreas, he'd throw it up. He was a tough guy. He said, these things are keeping me alive and keeping my four kids out of the orphanage. He'd take another dose, throw it up. It started to scare him. He said, either the therapy's not working, or I've gotten sensitive to the enzymes, or I'm allergic to them. He was really scared. He decided to take a few days off from the supplements, just stop them, and he felt better, almost miraculously. Went back on them, tolerated them for a few days, and started getting sick, flu-like, fevers, chills, sweats then nausea, and then vomiting. He said, this is not good. If I can't take these enzymes, I'm going to die. But he, this is, again, where smart people differ from the rest of us. Geniuses differ from the rest of us. We're all smart, but these guys are geniuses. Kelly figured out, working totally outside the academic community, no position. He was a, dent, a private dentist, an orthodontist in Grapevine, Texas, no academic affiliation. He figured out this wasn't a bad thing. He said what he was reacting to was the dead tumor waste. That, you know, cancers are very abnormal. Cancer cells produce all kinds of molecules, he supposed, that are foreign and toxic to normal healthy tissue. And those enzymes, it's not because they're not working, it's because they're working too efficiently. They're breaking that cancer down so fast. I'm floating away in tumor waste, and that's what's making my sick, me sick. He realized that dead tumor waste would have to be processed through the liver and the kidney, and he figured he was probably overloading the kidney and the liver. What he was identifying is what oncologists today call tumor lysis syndrome, Chemotherapy does not work for most cancer. Of 100 different types of cancer, there might be half a dozen where chemo really works. Things, and they're not that common cancers, like Hodgkin's disease, testicular, with Lance Armstrong had, um, certain lymphomas, certain leukemias. And oncologists know if you give too much chemo, and in those chemosensitive cancers, like Hodgkin's or testicular, you break it down too fast, the patient can die because you overload the liver and the kidney, just as Kelly said 40 years ago, and you, you just die from kidney uh, renal hepatic failure a paterina failure. And they have all kinds of drugs like allopurinol that they use and they reduce the dose of chemo. Kelly realized that that's what he was witnessing. He didn't, the, the word tumor lysis genome had not yet been coined, but that's what Kelly was describing and observing and feeling and suffering through. So he would cycle on and off the pills. He realized he did best if he would take all the supplements and enzymes for 15 days and stop them for five and continue the diet. And take them for 15 days and stop them for five. That, tends to, that tended to reduce the rate at which the tumors were breaking down. He was getting sick not because the enzymes weren't working, but because they were working too darn well. The tumors were breaking down too fast, overloading his liver and kidney, making him sick. But then he went to the library. 
He was looking for techniques that might help the liver and the kidney work more efficiently. And of course, he discovered the infamous coffee enemas. No, nothing would cause Kelly more derision and more criticism from the academic medical world, and the same is true of us today, than his use and our use of coffee enemas and other things we call detoxification routines. Oddly, ironically, and paradoxically, Kelly discovered coffee enemas from the conventional medical literature. They were in the Merck Manual right up until about 1977. The Merck Manual is a yearly compendium of conventional medical therapeutics put out by Merck, Sharp, and Dome. Nursing techs had coffee enemas right up until the 1960s. He collected dozens of studies from the medical literature in the 1920s, 30s, 40s, 50s, where the doctors weren't so fancy and so owned by the pharmaceutical industry, where they were using things like enemas to help their patients. He found a study, which I have, 1932, New England Journal of Medicine, the preeminent medical journal in the world, a group at Harvard Medical School before they got too fancy, were treating patients in a psychiatric ward with enemas and colonics, and they were getting better off medication going home, bipolar, schizophrenic, and they hypothesized that a lot of mental illness might be toxins coming out of the intestine through abnormal flora, whatever. 1941, study out of Uruguay. Just because it's from Uruguay doesn't mean it's not valid. A group of doctors in what we would call today an intensive care unit treated septic shock. Today, septic shock kills 50% you know, of people exposed to it. You know, septic shock results when there's a lipopolysaccharide lipo lipo coat from certain grand negative bacteria that poison the kidney and the liver. In those days, it was 95% fatal. Well, in this, in the equivalent of an intensive care unit circa 1941, these Uruguayan doctors had read the literature and learned about coffee enemas from the Merck manual, tried them on their patients, about 90% cure rate, and they hypothesized the livers were working better in the patient, the patient got better. So there was a whole history in the conventional medical world which the critics never bothered to read, which Kelly read and which I read, using enemas and other detoxification routines that involve colon cleansing with great effect. Well, Kelly, got an enema bag from his pharmacist, made up some coffee, started doing enemas, and he felt better day one, and he was able to tolerate the pills better, didn't get as sick. The flu-like symptoms resolved within days as he got toward day 15 of a cycle of supplements. The flu-like symptoms were minimal. Um, and he added, uh, we eventually add other procedures, like a liver flush, which we do with our patients, juice fast, colon cleanses, all these different procedures. So it was a, basically a tripartite therapy, this diet, this raw foods, plant-based diet, Lots of supplements that he found helped him and the pancreatic enzymes and the detoxification routines like the coffee enemas. And eventually, he got well. Well, it was quite a, created quite a stir in his local community because he was well known. He was in the church board, the school board, at the country club. All the doctors knew him. The doctors that said he'd be dead in eight weeks were astonished. This is 1963, 1964. There were only about half a dozen chemo drugs that didn't really work well. Now there are like three million chemo drugs. They still don't work very well. Well, they started sending all their patients to him very quietly. He was a dentist, not a medical doctor, powerful medical doctors. They're supposed to treat cancer, not the dentist, orthodontist, who has no academic affiliation. They quietly started sending their patients. And he would put them on the same diet that got him well, the raw foods diet with lots of fruit and citrus and leafy greens, the same supplements that got him well, beta carotene, thiamine, riboflavin, et cetera, avoiding the supplements that got him worse, like B12, cholinonostal, PABA put them on large dose of enzymes and detoxification, detoxification routines. And a lot of them got well. He noted that the patients with the typical solid tumors, tumors of the breast, lung, stomach, pancreas, colon, liver, uterus, ovary, prostate, tended to get better. People with immune cancers, leukemia, lymphoma, myeloma, sarcomas, which are embryologically related to immune cancer, didn't do as well. He didn't know why, but he kept trying. In 1969, he wrote a 32-page book called One Answer to Cancer, and the weight, and that's when he went public, which was a big mistake in some respects, that brought the weight of the government regulatory agencies against him. In the 1960s, if you mentioned cancer and nutrition in the same sentence, it was tantamount to a felony. Kelly, when I was doing my investigation of his work, said that at one time, 14 government agencies were investigating him from the local state attorney to the US, US federal attorneys, and he was right, I actually looked into it. Now, he managed to survive because he had a lot of very powerful politicians as patients. Whenever he would get in trouble with some regulatory agency, one of these people, like a former U.S. Attorney General he cured, would call the local sheriff and say, get your butt, get Kelly out of jail, leave him alone. So eventually he was left alone, and he would just have people sign a form that he was doing nutrition, not cancer, even though everyone was going there to be treated for cancer. And he had success, and he might have had continued using the same diet supplement protocol, except serendipity were to play a, play a role. We left off where Dr. Kelly had developed this one program, this plant-based vegetarian diet with the supplements and the enzymes that had helped him 
and the coffee enemas and other detox routines that help the liver and the kidney work more efficiently. And he was going through life getting some people well, not 100%, but he got enough people well that he was happy. And then serendipity again would show its head. Around 1970, a young woman came into his practice. She was about age, age 24 years old. And by then, he was already treating th uh, patients with diseases other than cancer, people for whom no one else could help with things like what we would call today chronic fatigue, chronic infections like mononucleosis, multiple sclerosis, those kind of things. And this woman came in with a history of severe allergies. I mean, really severe allergies to the point she was down to eating eight foods. She was so allergic to iodine, she couldn't walk within 10 miles of the, office, uh, the ocean. The iodine in the air would cause an anaphylactic reaction. She carried around an EpiPen because she would repeatedly have anaphylactic reactions. She'd been to dozens of conventional allergists and physicians, clinics like the Mayo Clinic, dozens of alternative doctors, none of whom had been able to help her. She had moved in with her mother, had to give up school, had to give up job, couldn't really function. The allergies were that serious. She had fatigue, depression, malaise, couldn't think clearly, foggy-headed, um, spaciness. And in desperation came to Kelly. And as he did in those days, he put her on the same diet that had helped him, the plant-based raw foods vegetarian diet with four glasses of carrot juice, two glasses of celery, the almonds, 10 almonds twice a day, even though she wasn't a cancer patient. The supplements that had helped him get better, the beta carotene, thiamine, riboflavin, niacin, et cetera, the vitamin C, vitamin D, uh, magnesium, potassium, manganese, chromium, the alpha-linolenic acid, the omega-3 essential fatty acid from plant sources. He didn't put her on a lot of enzymes because she wasn't a cancer patient. He did put her on the enemas and other procedures. All his patients would go on those. Initially, she did better. The number of foods she could eat increased enormously. Her mood improved. Her um, outlook improved. The depression lessened. Her energy, stamina, endurance, concentration all better. She was able to get outside the house. She was less allergenic to the environment. That lasted about three or four months. It was kind of like a honeymoon. And then she began to deteriorate, and very quickly. Allergies came back with a vengeance. She was house-ridden again, couldn't go out because environmental chemicals would provoke serious reactions. The number of food she could tolerate reduced dramatically. She started having problems with asthma, uh, chronic respiratory infections, depression, fatigue, spaciness. Um, Digestion, she would have diarrhea. She would have chronic low blood sugar, low thyroid function. She was on thyroid, but she wasn't doing any better. She was on thyroid replacement. Adrenals were weak. And Kelly kept changing the, the plant-based diet. He would add more fruit to see if that helped. She got worse. Add less fruit, more vegetables, she got worse. More raw food, she got worse. More cooked food, she got worse. He tried every permutation, a combination of that raw foods, plant-based diet that he could. And she was getting worse and worse. And it actually ended semi-comatose. Now, I got to know her quite well, and she was really almost incoherent, and Kelly was afraid that she might actually die, and then here he was, you know, this nutritional dentist, someone dies on his, on his watch, not a good thing to happen. And Kelly, smart man that he was, thought and thought and thought, and thought the only thing he hadn't done is, well, he'd done every variation of the vegetarian, plant-based, raw foods diet he knew of. The only thing he hadn't done is put her on red meat, which to him was anathema, because he thought all humans, the way Pritikin and Ornish believe later, should be on a plant-based, vegetarian diet. He said, you know, I've done all that, and she's getting worse and worse and worse. Very cautiously, he calls up the patient's mother, she was a little mother, and says, start feeding her, you know, best quality red meat you can get, grass-fed, in those days you could get grass-fed, um, raw, blend her eyes up, and let's see what happens. And the mother was horrified because they went to Dr. Kelly because he was the famous nutritional doctor, put everyone on a raw foods, plant-based diet, the meat is the enemy of mankind, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And she resisted, and the patient resisted. He said, look, this is the only thing we haven't done, you're getting worse and worse and worse. He told the mother she's getting worse and worse and worse. You gotta put her on red meat. They finally did reluctantly, and within an hours she was sitting up smiling, feeling better, depression less, and mental status improved. They literally, and the, and the daughter told me within an hour she was feeling better. And she stayed on red meat two or three times a day and started to improve. Energy, stamina, endurance, concentration better, allergies better. All those things started to improve. Kelly didn't know why. All he knew is that what he had done first didn't work. What he was doing now worked. Then he started to try other foods. He found out she did terribly with the very foods that had helped him the most, leafy greens and citrus fruit. Made her worse, allergies worse, depression worse, uh, concentration worse. So he left those out, found out she did best with root vegetables, beets, carrots, potatoes, sweet potatoes, turnips, yams, rutabagas, cruciferous vegetables, broccoli, Brussels sprouts, cabbage, cauliflower, not kale, which is also cruciferous, just the more solid, not the leafy green cruciferous vegetables. She did well with squash, squash did well with beans, generally did terribly with fruit, did terribly especially with citrus fruit, fruit, terribly with leafy greens, did okay with beans, nuts, and seeds. So he designed this diet that was actually kind of the mirror image of the diet he'd been on. 
The very foods that had helped him made her worse. The foods that made him sick made her better. Red meat, poultry, put her on fatty fish. She was eating red meat twice a day. Fatty fish, not lean fish, fatty fish, salmon, bluefish, mackerel. Fatty birds like duck, goose, the fat of the chicken. She did great with that. And any genius that he was began to experiment with supplements with her approval. I mean, she was willing to do this because her life was at stake. And to his astonishment, he, he found that she did well with all the vitamins, minerals, and trace elements that made him and his cancer worse. She did terribly with beta carotene, but thrived on vitamin A. She did terribly with thiamine, riboflavin, niacin, paradoxin, folic acid. Did great with B12, choline, inositol, PABA, pantothenic acid. Didn't do well with C, didn't do well with D, but did great with E, which had made Kelly's tumors worse. Did terribly with magnesium and potassium that Kelly saw as lifesavers, but thrived on huge doses of calcium, two and a half grams a day, helped her allergies, stamina, endurance. All those things improved on calcium. Couldn't tolerate virtually any magnesium or potassium. Forget about the two to one calcium-magnesium ratio. Didn't apply to her at all. She was taking about 20 times as much calcium as magnesium. Did poorly with manganese and chromium, which had helped Kelly, but did well with zinc and selenium, which had made him worse. Didn't do well with alpha linolenic acid, the omega-3 essential fat from plant sources, but did great with the cosapentaenoic acid, the cosahexanoic acid from animal sources like fatty fish and grass-fed beef. So he, dis he designed a supplement program for her that was exactly the mirror image of the opposite of the supplement program he'd been on. And he didn't know why, he just noticed that she did better with it. He didn't question it and she thrived and thrived to this day. She's now, um, she would marry, actually would become Kelly's third wife years later. Now they're divorced, Kelly was tough to live with. She now is remarried, living happily out on the West Coast, still eats red meat twice a day and still follows the same basic supplements Kelly had designed some 40 years ago, 40 plus years ago. She did the coffee enemas, wasn't on enzymes. So he suddenly had two completely different diet and supplement programs. And when a patient wouldn't respond to the vegetarian diet, he would put them on the animal diet with the supplements that went along with that. And he found that he was doing better with the leukemias, lymphomas, patients with myeloma and sarcomas, which hadn't responded to the plant-based diet. So he had these two basic programs, the success rate improved. He found a lot of chronic fatigue and allergy patients did well with the meat and the associated supplements. Then about a year after she was doing better, another patient came to him with an interesting story. He was a very smart guy. He had to drop out of a PhD program in the sciences because his health was so poor. And he had a combination of symptoms that had completely perplexed dozens of conventional and alternative doctors. He'd been everywhere, from Seattle to the Mayo Clinic to New York City. Dozens of conventional doctors, dozens of alternative doctors, psychic healings, healers, kinesiologists, chiropractors, naturopaths, alternative and medical doctors. No one had been able to help him. No one could make sense out of his symptoms. He would go through periods where he would be very manic and would achieve a lot and be very smart and he would really be thriving, and he'd want to jog, his, his, you know, like his respiratory function would improve. His digestion, however, would shut down, he'd develop constipation, and he would start losing weight as if he were hyperthyroid, hyperadrenal. In fact, he was diagnosed at several times as being hyperthyroid. After a few months of that syndrome, he would suddenly crash and end up very depressed, needing 12 to 14 hours of sleep a day. His respiration would crash. He would develop chronic respiratory diseases, you know, asthma. His asthma would flare up. He'd develop upper respiratory infections, pneumonia. Blood pressure would lessen. He'd get not enough blood going to his brain. He's spacey, cloudy-headed, looking through life like a fishbowl. He'd develop diarrhea. He'd be producing too much insulin, so he'd have chronic hypoglycemia, none of energy for the brain, his thyroid would shut down, his adrenals would shut down, he would go from hyperthyroid to hypothyroid and then bounce back and forth. Came to Kelly, and Kelly first, at that point, was still, he would first try the plant-based vegetarian diet with the supplements that went along with it. And initially he did better, but then he ended up terribly depressed with respiratory problems, he ended up with diarrhea, chronic hypoglycemia from the overproduction of insulin, low thyroid, low adrenal, started to gain weight. And Kelly tried him on the meat diet, with the, woman, the same diet as the woman who was eating red meat two or three times a day, and he improved immediately. Energy, stamina, endurance were better, uh, respiratory situation better, um, diarrhea resolved, the hypoglycemic symptoms were less, thyroid more active, adrenal more active, but then he flipped over and became manic, couldn't sleep, became very irritable, days would pass and literally couldn't sleep, as he would later tell me, I got to know him quite well. His heart rate would go up, blood pressure would go up, he'd have a regular heart rhythm, digestion would shut down, he'd gone from hypoglycemia to hyperglycemia, his blood sugar was going up because he wasn't producing enough insulin. He developed symptoms of hyperthyroidism again, hyperadrenalism, started breaking down protein, fats, carbs, started losing weight very quickly. 
And Kelly thought about this. He said, well, the plant-based diet that helped me didn't, work, didn't really work long-term with him. It helped for a while. The meat diet, which helped this woman patient with the allergies, worked for a while. He said, I'm going to try, you know, and this is exactly the way it happened historically, a balanced diet. So we put, him, put this patient on a variety of foods, fruits, vegetables, nuts, seeds, and grains, some fish, poultry, red meat, maybe two to four times a week, not twice a day like the meat-eating woman patient. And then he tried to put this patient on a, on a variety of the vitamins and minerals, both the ones that had helped him and the ones that had helped the woman, but at moderate doses. Uh, beta carotene and vitamin A at moderate doses, thiamine, riboflavin, niacin, pyridoxin, folic acid, PABA, choline, and inositol, B12, pantothenic acid, C, D, E, calcium, magnesium, uh, potassium, manganese, chromium, zinc, selenium, ALA, EPA, DHA, both the plant-based omega-3 essential fatty acids, eicosapentaenoic acid, eicosahexaenoic acid from animal sources, but at all at moderate doses. And over a period of six months, he improved enormously, and these, these symptoms that would bounce back and forth that made no sense to anybody resolved. As Kelly thought about it, these were, these were situations that had developed in his clinic, and he had made observations that different, different people did well with different diets, and different people did well with entirely different supplements. And he had three basic programs now, the plant-based vegetarian, the meat-eating, kind of like an Atkins diet, and this balanced, what we call today Mediterranean. And it was as if these people were completely different patients, different people, even though they were all human beings, as if they were different species. For example, the patient that did well with the plant foods, they tended not to need a lot of sleep, they had a very aggressive, ambitious, very smart, good respiration, good heart function, terrible digestion, they liked you know, a salad or a piece of fruit for lunch, strong thyroid, adrenal function, tended to be very lean. They tended to have certain, certain problems develop, particularly the solid tumors, tumors of the breast, lung, stomach, pancreas, colon, liver, uterus, ovary, prostate. They didn't tend to get leukemia, lymphoma, myeloma, sarcomas. The meat-eating patients tended to be calmer, not as aggressive, not as good at school, more creative, needed more sleep, tended to be prone to depression, tended to have poor respiration, tended to be prone to asthma, uh, upper respiratory infections, even pneumonia. Uh, low cardiac output, they tended to low blood pressure, not enough blood going to the brain. The brain sits at the top of the head. The body has to work against gravity to get blood up there. People can get chronic fatigue with low blood pressure. Good digestion, but they would be almost too much efficient digestion. They produce a lot of insulin, which would tend to push the blood sugar down, not enough blood sugar for the brain. They'd get spacey, cloudy head, looking through life like through a fishbowl. Low thyroid, low adrenal function. They had a completely different psychology, physiology, biochemistry, and health profile. And the balanced people seemed to be able to go either way like this. PhD graduate student who eventually was able to go back and finish his PhD and lead a very productive academic career. He's now retired, which he owed to Kelly because he had to drop out of school because his health was so poor. And this, the balanced guy, the PhD dropout student who later finished his PhD under Kelly's care, would bounce back and forth from like the plant-based psychology, physiology to the animal products, psychology, physiology, biochemistry. And Kelly didn't know what the physiology and biochemistry was, but clearly these were Although they were all human, they were like completely different species with a different psychology, physiology, biochemistry, and responded completely differently to different foods and vitamins, minerals, and trace elements. And he didn't understand the biochemistry of physiology. Whenever he had a question, though, he went to the library, pulls out Pottinger's book, Symptoms of Visceral Disease, last edition, 1944. There was an old, dusty copy, University of Texas, Southwestern Medical School in Dallas. Hadn't been taken out in, in well, at that point, I guess it was 30 years takes it out, starts reading, and here's all this elaborate physiology and neurophysiology and biochemistry about the autonomic nervous system. Now, some people have a strong sympathetic system and a weak parasympathetic system, and all the tissues, organs, glands are normally stimulated by the strong sympathetic, tend to be very highly developed, and those stimulated by the weak parasympathetic, weak and, un and undeveloped, their parasympathetic dominance, et cetera, and the balanced people in between. And Kelly said, this is exactly what I've seen in the last years in my practice. And he just observed this. He was an extraordinary observer. I mean, to observe these subtleties, differences in psychology, physiology, biochemistry, health, pro health profile, really quite remarkable. And he began to realize that what he had discerned in his practice, that he had dis discovered serendipitously on his own, although he didn't know this is what he was seeing, but there were certain people, as Pottinger said, and as Gellhorn said, and after Pottinger, he started reading Gellhorn, he learned about Gellhorn, that there were people with a genetically determined strong sympathetic system, weak parasympathetic, other people with a strong parasympathetic, weak sympathetic, and people with balance, and they had different psychology, physiology, biochemistry, and health profile. And as he began to look at the diets and the supplement protocols he designed for these patients, he began to realize that every, every nutrient, whether a macro or micronutrient, whether it be protein, fat, carbohydrate, vitamin, mineral, trace element, fatty acid, 
had a specific and profound effect on autonomic physiology, with, which was an extraordinary observation. I mean, the foundation of that had been laid, laid by Pottinger and by Gilhorn. But Kelly was to bring the idea of nutritional biochemistry in terms specifically of its effect on autonomic physiology to another dimension beyond Pottinger and beyond Gellhorn. And he was correct in assuming that every nutrient, whether macro or micronutrient, whatever else it may do, and again, entire textbooks are written about single nutrients. I have a book on that thick on vitamin C and the biochemistry, physiology, all of that's been outlined. And indeed, a lot of these nutrients have dozens of physiological effects and are involved with dozens of physiological processes. But Kelly believed, as did Gellhorn, as did Pottinger before him, that whatever else a vitamin, mineral, trace element, protein, fat, carb may do on the body in terms of energy production, DNA metabolism, glutathione production, they also have a profound effect on autonomic function, and it may be their effect on autonomic physiology, which is their most important. And he started looking at the different diets. If you look at a plant-based diet, several points that are very important. Orthodox conventional nutritionists know that a plant-based diet tends to have an alkalinizing effect on the body. This isn't just something in the alternative world. It's been proven. A plant-based diet has lots of magnesium and potassium. When you look at a leafy green, you're looking at magnesium. Magnesium is the center molecule of chlorophyll, and it's magnesium that gives chlorophyll its green color. Magnesium blocks the sympathetic system. Fruits and vegetables are loaded with potassium. A banana has 300 milligrams. Orange has 300 milligrams of potassium. Potassium stimulates the parasympathetic system. In an alkaline environment, the sympathetic system turns on and the parasympathetic turns, the sympathetic system turns off and the parasympathetic system turns on. So whatever else we think a plant-based diet may do, what it does most profoundly and fundamentally, it suppresses sympathetic activity and stimulates parasympathetic activity. For a sympathetic dominant with an overly strong sympathetic system, weak parasympathetic system, it brings the two branches into balance. And that's why these patients did, these particular patients did well on that diet. It was st uh, stimulating their weak parasympathetic system and toning down their overly strong sympathetic system. The vitamins, minerals, and trace elements that the pla these patients did best with, the patients that did well with the plant-based diet, beta-carotene, thiamine, riboflavin, niacin, pyridoxin, folic acid, C, D, magnesium, potassium, manganese, chromium, ALA from plant-based sources, the essential omega-3 fatty acids, whatever else they may do in the body, all individually, and this is in the orthodox conventional neurophysiological research, tend to suppress the strong sympathetic system, build up the parasympathetic system. And what he was doing, what he had discovered serendipitously in his small practice in Grapevine, Texas, just through trial and error, he was suppressing these sympathetic dominance, overly strong sympathetic system, building up the weak parasympathetic, both branches work fine, and all the physiological functions, respiration, cardiovascular, of vascular digestion, endocrine immune, worked better efficiently, and whatever disease or problem they had, psychological, physiological, malignant, tend to improve. If you look at a meat diet, meat diet's been kind of attacked for the last 40 years, although that's starting to change. Time Magazine had a cover story about three months ago about everything we thought about fat is wrong, good, that's a step in the right direction. If you look at a meat diet, first, meat diet has lots of sulfates and phosphates. Physiologists know in the body sulfates and phosphates are converted to free acid. In an acid environment, the sympathetic system turns on. Red meat is loaded with phenylalanine and tyrosine, amino acids that are precursors to norepinephrine and epinephrine, the sympathetic neurotransmitters. Red meat is loaded with aspartic and glutamic acid. Orthodox conventional neurophysiologists call aspartic acid and glutamic acid, these amino acids, excitatory neurotransmitters. What does that mean? It means they turn on the sympathetic nervous system. Red meat is loaded with saturated fat. Whatever you may think about saturated fat, good, bad, or indifferent, it's been proven in conventional physiology that saturated fat stimulates the sympathetic nervous system. So what does a red meat diet do? Well, it turns on the sympathetic system, and through mutual inhibition in the hypothalamus, remember from two hours ago, it tends to shut off the strong parasympathetic system. For a parasympathetic dominant with an out-of-balance autonomic system, with a too strong parasympathetic and a too weak sympathetic system, red meat will turn on the weak sympathetic system, tone down the strong parasympathetic, bring the autonomic branches into balance, and patients feel better psychologically, physiologically, biochemically, they do better, and their health profile improves, whether it's leukemia, lymphoma, myeloma, sarcoma, or allergies. The vitamins and minerals and trace elements that that woman had done well with, vitamin A, B12, choline and nostal, PABA, pantothenic acid, E, uh, calcium, uh, zinc, selenium, and DHA and EPA, the essential omega-3 fatty acid from animal sources, whatever else they may do in the body in terms of lowering cholesterol, in terms of nerve function, they stimulate the sympathetic nervous system, suppress the parasympathetic system. So serendipitously, in his clinic, through observation, just trial and error through his brilliant ability to observe as a clinician, 
He was taking these parasympathetic dominants with the out of balance autonomic nervous systems, building up their weak sympathetic system, toning down their strong parasympathetic just with diet and supplements, bringing an out of balance autonomic system into balance, and they function better. With the PhD dropout student, he was giving a variety of foods, both sympathetic stimulants and parasympathetic stimulants, both alkalinizing and acid forming foods, all the vitamins and minerals and trace elements, but in moderate doses only, not the high doses as with the extremes. And what he realized he was doing is building up both branches of the autonomic nervous system. This kid was a balanced metabolizer with a balanced autonomic system where both branches had crashed. And he was bouncing back and forth between sympathetic dominant and parasympathetic dominant, and no one knew what to do with him because no one had read Pottinger or Gellhorn, and no one was as good an observer as Kelly. On a balanced diet with a balanced collection of all the vitamins, minerals, and trace elements, he did really well and finished his PhD because Kelly built up both branches of the autonomic nervous system. What Kelly confirmed in his small office in Dallas, unassociated with any academic center, was that diet, vitamins, minerals, trace elements, whatever else we may think they do in terms of cholesterol, et cetera, have profound effects on autonomic function. The autonomic nervous system controls everything in our body. When that's out of balance, you're going to be sick. When it's in balance, no matter what your problem, whether it's psychological, physiological, biochemical, malignant, you're going to do better. And that was the essence of his, of his whole therapy. Now, as Kelly was familiar with Price. Price was a dentist. Kelly was a dentist. And he had learned about Price before he himself had gotten sick. As he thought about Price, going back two and a half hours now, Price observed that different groups of people, traditional peeps of, peeps of, groups of people, adjusted to, adapted to, and thrived on a completely different set of diets, from largely plant-based to almost completely animal-based. And as he began to study Price, he began to realize how you could integrate Gellhorn and Pottinger and his concepts of autonomic physiology into understanding nutritional anthropology. If you look at the Arctic Circle, let's think about the Arctic Circle. Well, one of the characteristics of the environment is very cold. What does cold do? As every physiologist knows, cold stimulates the sympathetic nervous system. When you shiver, that's sympathetic. When you're cold, the sympathetic system turns on. What it does, it shuts blood supply to the skin so you don't lose heat. When the sympathetic fires, it turns on the thyroid and the adrenals, which are thermogenic. They're, they're catabolic. They break down protein, fats, and carbohydrates to produce energy. Energy is heat. So as soon as you go into a cold climate and shiver, your sympathetic system is turning on. If you're a parasympathetic dominant, that's perfect, because if you have a strong parasympathetic genetically determined and a weak sympathetic system in a cold environment, your sympathetic system will turn on. The cold will push that through mutual inhibition in the hypothalamus, the parasympathetic will tone down, and you'll have a perfectly balanced autonomic system in the Arctic or you know, the Antarctic. The Eskimos didn't really think it was cold. They felt great up there. They felt great because the cold brought them into autonomic balance. Look at the diet that's in that environment. All that's up there, as I said two and a half hours ago, is fatty animal protein, you know, fatty fish, seals, walruses, fatty caribou, all of it kind of red meat as a sympathetic stimulating, you know, sympathetic stimulating with these spartic glutamic acid, with the, uh, you know, the excitatory neurotransmitters, with phenylalanine and tyrosine, with the sulfates and phosphates and saturated fat. All these nutrients, which are predominant in a red meat diet, stimulate the sympathetic system and tone down the parasympathetic. So someone or a group with an inherently strong parasympathetic, weak sympathetic system in the Arctic, in that cold environment, with nothing to eat but fatty red meat, is in the exact perfect place because it will stimulate the weak sympathetic system, tone down the purple, there's overly strong parasympathetic. The environment and the food together will bring their autonomic system into balance and they'll function perfectly well. You bring a sympathetic dominant up into the, up into the Arctic, and these are some of those Arctic explorers that died. They're not going to thrive there because the cold and the food that's available will so stimulate their sympathetic system, they're going to end up with cardiovascular collapse. They can't tolerate that. They're hyperthyroid to the point their heart will explode, and that's exactly what was happening to sympathetic dominant research. Now, Stephenson, who thrived on the red meat diet when he lived with the Eskimos, was a classic parasympathetic dominant, both by personality and orientation and physiology. And he thrived up there. He loved it. In fact, when he came back to New York as a kind of celebrity with these best-selling books about his life among the Eskimos, he kind of missed the Arctic because he felt better in the cold. He didn't like the summer in New York. He felt better in the cold because it would stimulate his weak sympathetic, tone down a strong parasympathetic, could be in perfect autonomic balance and thrive. And he loved red meat and lived on red meat the rest of his life until he died. I don't remember when, but he died at quite an old age. You look at the equatorial areas, and you see seas of green, Congo, Amazon green. What is green? Green is magnesium. Green plants are green because the magnesium is a center molecule chlorophyll. So you're looking immediately as kind of an alkalinizing environment, as kind of a parasympathetic stimulating environment. A sympathetic dominant in that environment will thrive. What's in the tropics? Fruits, plant foods. 
you know, some of the uh, Congo natives and over a thousand plant foods, very alkalinizing, that tend to stimulate the parasympathetic system. In that environment, a sympathetic dominant will thrive, Kelly thought. Someone with a strong sympathetic system and a weak parasympathetic in an equatorial area with lots of fruits and plant foods, alkalinizing foods that stimulate this weak parasympathetic and tone down the strong sympathetic system end up in balance. You bring a parasympathetic to the equatorial areas and it'll turn on the parasympathetic so bad they'll end up with pneumonia and die or end up with leukemia and lymphoma because the heat and the food that's available is not suited for their autonomic balance. It'll stimulate their overly strong system. You look at the Mediterranean areas, go back to Dr. Reven with the Mediterranean diet, fruits, vegetables, nuts, seeds, grains, fish, poultry, red meat, all the different nutrients at moderate amounts. Kelly's moderate PhD dropout student who later finished his PhD. You go to the Mediterranean climate, well, there are four seasons, you know, four seasons, summer, fall, of course, winter, spring. And in each season, there are different foods available. Now, a balanced metabolizer with a balanced autonomic system thrives in a balanced climate. During summer, what, ha what happens? The parasympathetic system turns on. When the parasympathetic turns on, we tend to sweat a lot, and blood goes to the skin, so you can lose heat, and of course, perspiration is a way of losing heat. And when the parasympathetic fires, it turns off the thyroid and turns off the adrenals, so you're less thermogenic. So during summer, a balanced person will turn more parasympathetic, which will be perfectly fine, they'll be able to lose heat. Winter comes and their sympathetic system will turn on because they can go either way, and they'll do better with, you know, they'll do better with red meat, and they'll, they'll keep the sympathetic strong, which will be thermogenic, so they'll feel warmer in fall and spring, they'll tend to eat a kind of a balanced diet. So a balanced metabolizer with an equally developed autonomic system with the branches, the sympathetic and parasympathetic, are equally efficient, equally developed, thrives in a moderate climate with a variety of foods that both stimulate both branches and suppress both branches equally, a variety of nutrients, fish, poultry, some red meat, fruits, vegetables, nuts, seeds, and grains. Winter comes along, they eat more red meat. Summer comes along, they eat more fruits and vegetables. They get more parasympathetic, so they can lose heat. Winter comes, they eat more red meat, so they produce more heat. So Kelly really worked out the anthropological basis of what Price had seen and the physiology and the biochemistry in great, great elegant fashion, pointed out the reason why different human groups could adjust thrive on different diets and completely different ecological niches and completely different climates had to do with their innate genetic inheritance of the autonomic nervous system. A sympathetic dominant would never have survived in the Arctic. A parasympathetic dominant would not have survived for long in the equatorial areas. So everyone was suited for their particular ecological niche, and all hell breaks loose when you move out of your niche and change your diet. And Kelly said, you know, the reason people get sick really isn't that complicated when you think about Pottinger and Gellhorn and Price. There are really only two reasons why people get sick. I mean, it's kind of simplistic, but this is basically what I thought. First, people can follow the right diet for their type, but eat nutritionally depleted foods. You know, a vegetarian can follow a vegetarian diet, but drink Coca-Cola and corn chips. I, many years ago, I had dinner with a, with, a fr with a man who became a friend who worked for an insurance company, was interested in alternative medicine, who was a, a vegetarian for spiritual reasons. And I had dinner with him, and he had corn chips, soy ice cream, and a Coca-Cola, which technically is a vegetarian meal. And that's the way he had. Unfortunately, tragically, he would die at age 44 because he was so nutritionally depleted. A diet like that, although it's right, he was a sympathetic dominant by my estimation, was a plant-based diet, but it was, it was nutritionally depleted. A parasympathetic can eat meat, but it will be, instead of grass-fed, it'll be feedlot raised bread, you know, a bologna with additives and preservatives. You know, cattle are supposed to eat grass. They're not designed to eat grains. When they eat grains, their nutritional content changes in a negative way and they develop E. coli and all these negative bacterial infections that cause such problems. So you can follow a, bit, you can follow a meat diet, but it's completely unsuitable. It's not nutritionally replete, it's nutritionally depleted. Now, in terms of cancer, Kelly had noted, and Pottinger had made these um, dispersions of that the sympathetic dominants tend to get the solid tumors, tumors of the breast, lung, stomach, pancreas, colon, liver, uterus, ovary, prostate, parasympathetics get immune cancer. And Kelly worked out why that would be. A sympathetic dominant with a strong sympathetic nervous system who would go on, for example, a red meat diet, which is totally inappropriate, would end up too sympathetic dominant. And what happens? Well, when the sympathetic system fires, it shuts down the detoxification processes in the liver and shuts down the pancreas. We live in a polluted environment. There are 79,000 chemicals, synthetic chemicals being released in the environment, most of which have not been tested for safety, safety or carcinogenicity. And most of these chemicals, the liver's job is to neutralize exogenously, chemical, exogenously ingested chemicals, chemicals that come in the air, the water, the food. All these foreign chemicals are neutralized in the liver. When the sympathetic system fires, the liver shuts down both its digestive and detoxification processes. So we float around in the sea of toxicity. These free radicals and other toxins can stimulate these uh, trophoblast slash stem cells 
into abnormal growth, you get cancer. And when the sympathetic system fires, not only does it shut down the liver, but it shuts down the pancreas. Pancreatic exocrine enzyme production is reduced, so our main prevention against cancer, which are the enzymes, not the immune system, is reduced. And these people are prone to the solid tumors. They don't tend to get leukemia, lymphoma, myeloma, and sarcoma. Those are diseases of an overactive immune function. In the alternative world, the general consensus is to treat cancer, you've got to stimulate the immune system. Leukemia, where the white count can be 300,000. Myeloma, where the plasma cells are out of control. Um, lymphoma, where the white cells are out of control, lymphocytes are out of control. These are situations where the immune system is hyperreactive, hyperactive, overstimulated. What you need to do is calm it down. Now, a, a parasympathetic dominant who goes on a plant-based diet, which is totally unsuited. Parasympathetics tend to respect authority. So Ornish comes out with this book, William, it should be on a plant-based diet. Even though they feel terrible on it, they force themselves to eat it. My office is filled with parasympathetic dominants who, through good intentions, follow the expertise of academic authorities and went on a plant-based diet, which is all the rage for the last 30 years, and then ended up with leukemia, lymphoma, myeloma, and didn't know why and felt terrible because they ate eating organic vegetarian foods for 30 years, 20 years, and ended up sick. Well, it was the wrong diet for them. It pushes them too alkaline. Now, when the parasympathetic system gets too strong, the parasympathetic system stimulates immune function. And even though they have a strong pancreas, eventually, if they stay on a plant-based diet too long, they'll still so overstimulate their, uh, their immune system, they end up with leukemia, lymphoma, myeloma, or sarcomas, which are embryologically related to the immune cancers. And the way you treat a parasympathetic dominance, you give them enzymes, but the main thing is to shut down the parasympathetic system, so you shut down the overly strong immune system. I've seen white counts drop a couple hundred thousand points when you tone down the parasympathetic system, turn on the sympathetic with red meat and the supplements that the red meat eaters do well with. So Kelly very simply figured out generally why people tend to get sick. They eat nutritionally depleted foods or they eat the wrong food for their type um, and end up in deep catastrophic troubles. Very, very sophisticated, but that does it work. Well, it's all great theory I've been talking about for two and a half hours. I had the opportunity to meet Dr. Kelly in July 1981, over 33 years ago, at the end of my second year of medical school. Some of you have heard this story before. I had been a journalist before going to medical school. It's kind of ironic, I ended up in medical research. I went to Brown University, which had no required courses, which is the reason I went. I designed my own writing major. Never had to take a horrible science course, the greatest thing on earth. And after college, my first job was at Time Inc., where my wife is now an executive, ironically enough. And I, I had very good teachers at Time Inc., and they were kind of nurturing my career. And my first cover story at New York Magazine, actually, when I was 24 years old. And then one of my editors challenged me and said, why don't you do some writing about medicine? And I said, well, that's about the dullest thing you ever want to do. I want to do wars, revolutions, political upheavals. I want to write books. I want to travel the world. What does young writers want to do? They said, no, look into it. We want an investigative reporter. You're trained to do it. Look into cancer research, for example. Well, I said, finally, grudgingly, I said, yes. Got to meet people like Linus Pauling and Nobel laureates, and to my absolute astonishment, because I was so biased against science and so geared toward literature and all that stuff, that these people at the high levels of science were really very creative. I mean, they're very brilliant, creative. Linus Pauling was extraordinarily brilliant. He won two Nobel Prizes. And as a journalist, you have access to people like that. It was great fun. And it was Linus Pauling that actually challenged me to go to medical school. I'm a crazy nut. What is he talking about? But I listened to him. Eventually, I gave up my career, book contract, all those things, to go back and do my pre-med work, which I had to start from ground zero at Columbia, living at home with my parents in Queens. Did well. Fortunately, got accepted wherever I wanted. And I was deciding where to go to medical school. I was interested in nutrition. I'd gotten this interest from Linus Pauling. He was already talking about vitamin C. That's why I'd interviewed him. And I knew Robert Good, who was president of Sloan Kettering. Sloan Kettering is one of Cornell Medical School's teaching, teaching hospitals in New York. The main campus of Cornell is in Ithaca, but the medical school is in Manhattan. And Sloan Kettering is one of their teaching hospitals. And Robert Good had been on the cover of Time in 1972, so I knew who he was. Uh, and he was very interested. He was an MD, PhD. He wasn't an oncologist. He was actually an immunologist, figured out what the thymus did and the appendix did. And he was very interested in nutrition. And I said, that's the guy I want to work with. So I went to Cornell, second year of medical school. He kind of adopted me into his group. And it looked like my career was set. I'd spend the rest of my life in basic science at, at Sloan Kettering. And the second year of medical school, one of my journalism friends, some of you have heard this story, calls me up and says, I'm thinking of doing a book about this eccentric guy, William Kelly. Now, this is 1981, summer of 81. Kelly had just come off this fiasco with Steve McQueen, which has never been told correctly, the actor who had died of cancer. And, the story is 30 seconds. You know, he had been misdiagnosed by his fancy doctors in Los Angeles. And then he was diagnosed as mesothelioma, which is, you know, disease of the plural space. He had raced motorcycles, and motorcycles in those days, the pipes were coated with asbestos as an insulation, and this mesothelioma is linked to asbestos exposure. They missed the diagnosis for a year. When it was diagnosed, 
it was metastatic, which is incurable. It was incurable then, incurable 33 years later. They gave him immunotherapy, never been shown to help with mesothelium. We gave, it, and we gave him radiation, never been shown to help. By the time he consulted with Kelly, he was dying. The only mistake Kelly made, he should never have treated him. He was too sick and he was kind of reckless. Continued to smoke and drink and eat ice cream. He still lasted a year doing half of Kelly's program, but then died, and Kelly gets blamed like he took a gun and shot McQueen. But no one in the conventional world had helped him. In fact, they'd misdiagnosed him. And Kelly was very depressed, was traveling around the country trying to avoid the media, ended up in New York. And my friend, who had several best-selling books, wanted to do a book on Kelly because he was right in the middle of the media explosion at that time. And she calls me up and said, but I can't make any sense out of him. He's talking about autonomic nervous system, John Beard, I don't know who this is. And I don't know whether he's crazy, brilliant, crazy and brilliant, just brilliant, crazy. I don't know what it is. Could you meet with him? You have two years of medical school. You were an investigative journalist. I said, no, not interested. Three times she called. Fourth time I said, yes. So I meet Kelly in this chiropractor's office in Queens, the oddest thing. And she set up a lunch for me. And I meet Kelly expecting to see some kind of boastful, blistering, resentful, angry guy. It's the exact opposite. He's this humble guy that very soft-spoken. And it was all a big guy, like six foot two, six foot three. All I could do to get him to talk, and he starts talking, and all this stuff comes out, and I knew enough physiology and biochemistry. This elaborate model of autonomic physiology using diet. And I could tell whatever, however right it was, whatever success rate was or wasn't, this was a very smart guy. And that afternoon, I went to see Robert Goode, who was president of Sloan Kettering at that time, and he thought this would make a good student project to start going through Kelly's records, even if Kelly turned out to be a charlatan. I'd learned a lot from a, a project that I developed myself. The next day, I was on a plane down to Texas and started going through Kelly's records. And immediately, even though I only had two years of medical school under my belt, I could see that he was taking advanced cancer and turning it around. I spent three weeks down there, copied some of his records. He let me speak to patients, and they were very happy to tell their stories. These were people with metastatic colon, metastatic pancreatic, acute leukemias who had done well five and 10 years later, metastatic breast cancer. Bundle up these records, go back to Dr. Good. What started as a simple student project after we reviewed those records together became a full-fledged project, which I finished when I did my immunology fellowship under Dr. Good. By then, he was pushed out of Sloan, finished actually here in Florida, up in Tampa at Old Children's Hospital, where he set up a bone marrow transplant unit. And I followed him there and finished my, uh, my Kelly study and also learned how to do bone marrow transplants, which is about as conventional as you can do. Put all of this information together in a monograph, about 500 pages, I discussed the theory of Kelly, the autonomic manipulation using diet and supplements, the controversies about his work, and 50 case reports of 20, representing 26 different types of cancer appropriately diagnosed in major medical centers like Mayo Clinic, Sloan Kettering, who clearly had a poor prognosis or terminal prognosis and had done well under Kelly's care. And I'm going to present a couple cases from that book. Um, so we're going to start getting into cases now, which always makes my wife happy. She likes the cases. First case, which is in the book, a um, woman with uterine cancer, 1969, she develops uterine bleeding. They biopsy it, it's adenocarcinoma. The tumor is so big then that they felt they couldn't do a hysterectomy, although it didn't seem to have spread. So they decided to do radiation to shrink it, which they do, five weeks of external beam radiation. Shrinks down, then she goes for hysterectomy, they take it out, and they think she's cured. Wonderful. No adjuvant therapy recommended. She's cured. Does well until about 1974 develops fatigue, malaise, depression, odd symptoms, anxiety, which she'd never had before, goes to a primary care physician repeatedly who thinks she just needs a tranquilizer, she's anxious because she had cancer. Finally, 1975, her health's deteriorating, she's losing weight, no one's listening to her. Orthodox conventional medical doctors often don't listen. She ends up with a tumor the size of a grapefruit, literally in her pelvis, came up very quickly, goes to her surgeon who had operated her the first time and said, we got a problem here, you're about to have an obstruction. He does an x-ray, before surgery, she got multiple tumors in lungs, endometrial cancer, notoriously metastasized to the lungs. He said, you got stage four, incurable then, incurable today. He said, we got to take that tumor out of the pelvis because you're going to end up with an obstruction. It won't cure you, but it will help you feel better. Goes to surgery, takes out that tumor, and it's a metastatic, poorly differentiated adenocarcinoma consistent with a uterine primary. Closes her up, sends her to an oncologist. In those days and today, they will use synthetic progesterone to treat endometrial cancer when it's metastatic. It's not curative, but it helps them feel better and they might live a couple, literally a couple months longer. Goes on the synthetic progesterone, after five weeks, she can't tolerate it. Now, she was living in Seattle at the time, and Kelly had moved from Dallas to Seattle between 1975 and 1981, where he bought an organic farm in the Methow Valley, which is in the foothills of the High Cascades. He had a 160-acre farm, and then he would see patients in the town. And they'd have to go through the high Cascade Mountain Valleys from Seattle to get to see him. 
She goes out there, puts her on the program, and she does well. The first thing happens, she, she, she doesn't die. She starts feeling better, energy, stamina, all those things improve. Doesn't go back to her primary care physician until 1984, nine years later. She had a long history of an irregular heart rhythm, atrial fibrillation. It was kind of flaring up. Kelly said, go see your primary care physician, have an EKG. She goes to him. Now, he hasn't seen her for nine years. He thinks she's dead. I actually have his note here, a copy of his note from dated November 16th, 1984, 30 years ago. This is what he wrote. I always like a doctor that puts down what he's feeling. I almost dropped dead when she told me she wanted a chest X-ray, a common odd thing to put in a medical record. Chest film, except for the rather large heart, which shows no sign of deep decompensation. Chest film was normal. Specifically, I did not see any evidence of metastatic disease on either film, which is quite remarkable in view of the fact that nine years ago she had metastatic disease in both abdomen and lungs. She lived until 2009, when at age 95, from old age, she quietly died in her sleep. We kept in touch over the years. She lasted 34 years after the diagnosis of stage four recurrent endometrial cancer, 40 years from her original diagnosis. To put her in perspective, I obsessively read the medical literature, as my wife will tell you. I know of no patient in the history of medicine who survived 34 years with stage four recurrent endometrial cancer, biopsy proven. Wonderful patient, lasted 95 years old. Second patient out of the Kelly book. Lovely lady, she's become a really good friend. She and her husband, typical American success story. They ran a gas station in Appleton, Wisconsin. She's actually given me permission to use her name, though I won't use her name, first name Arlene. They ran a gas station, bought a store associated with the gas station, was so successful a big train would later buy them out for a huge amount of money. She, she and her husband turned it into success, working seven days a week, you know, 14 hours a day. Summer of 1982 develops reflux, indigestion, gas, bloating, indigestion. This is before they routinely did CAT scans. Her doctors say, you got gallbladder disease. You need to have your gallbladder out. It's routine. It's no big deal. Take her to surgery, open her up. She got a tumor in her pancreas, tumor in her liver. They biopsy the liver lesion. It's an adenocarcinoma consistent with pancreatic primary. They close her up, don't even touch the gallbladder. She meets with an oncologist who said, you have stage four pancreatic adenocarcinoma, the most aggressive cancer there is. If you're lucky, you'll live a year. I can give you chemo. It'll ruin your quality of life. He suggests she goes to the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota, not too far away. She goes up there, meets with their pancreatic cancer specialist, who, one of the reasons I like the, the Mayo Clinic is they're completely honest. They're really very, very honest. And let's see, I have the note from that doctor visit here. Here we go. It, a lot of hospitals, even if a chemotherapy regimen has never been shown to have any effect, will still give it to the patient because the doctor, not so much just greed, although maybe that plays a part of it. They want to do something. You know, physician, you don't want to say, oh, I can't do anything. And the patient wants the physician to do something. Mayo Clinic's different. If something isn't going to help, if there's no evidence that it's going to help, they'll say you shouldn't do it. She meets with their pancreatic cancer specialist. And I have his note, the date of September 24th, 1982, 32 years ago. Thank you for referring Mrs. Arlene, blah, blah, et cetera. I had a long discussion with her regarding treatment of her cancer at the present time. I would favor simply observation since we know of no no treatment that will necessarily prolong her disease. The average survival then and the average survival now, 30 years later, for stage four pancreatic cancer is about three to six months. That decision saved her life. Had he said, let's do chemo, she would have agreed to it. But now that the Mayo Clinic, as well as the local oncologist, said nothing's going to help, she starts looking into alternatives, goes to the local health food store in Appleton, finds a copy, just serendipitously, of Kelly's 1982 book, One Answer to Cancer, uh, 1969 book, One Answer to Cancer, where he discusses his, veg that's before he knew about the different diets, his plant-based diet that helped him, calls Kelly. He said, look, I've trained a local chiropractor to do this. He can do it directly under me. He happened to live, this chiropractor lives in Appleton. So she sees him, and he did a good job under Kelly's direction, puts her on the program. I first interviewed her as part of my Kelly study in 1986, four years after she was diagnosed. So she was already a miracle. And she was feisty and had never gone back to her conventional doctor. So four years later, we had no idea what happened to the tumors in the liver or the pancreas. She remains a friend to this day. Five years ago, we had, we'd been phone friends, but I'd never met her. She actually referred people to her, to our office. Five years ago, she came to New York because she didn't have a doctor. I'd never been back to a conventional doctor. We met, I examined her, now I'm technically her doctor. She's alive and well 32 plus years after original diagnosis. To put her in perspective, I searched the literature routinely. I know of no patient in the history of medicine anywhere in any country diagnosed with stage four pancreatic cancer with a confirmed liver metastases, biopsy proven at a major institution who lived 32 years. So she, had she been a conventional doctor treated with chemo, of course, they would have held press conferences. Now, we finished our monograph in 1986 with cases like this, and I thought with 
Robert Good, the most published author in the history of medicine, 10 years president of Sloan County, will get this published. And this will really encourage a lot of innovative research into Kelly's work. Boy, was I naive. I spent two years trying to get the book published, in, whether in entirety as a monograph or case reports in the medical journals, and we couldn't succeed, even with Dr. Good's support. And there were two major responses from editors. First, editors from medical journals thought this had to be fake, that even though we had the medical records and they could talk to the patients, and a lot of them are still alive today, they didn't believe it. They had to they're just beyond their comprehension, beyond their ability to believe that a nutritional alternative therapy, which they thought was quackery and fraud, could possibly have this kind of effect with advanced cancer. The second response was from editors who were a little bit more reasonable and sensible and more intelligent, who said, this looks extraordinary, but it's so controversial. Should I publish the book? Or the journal editor said, if we publish case reports, the American Cancer Society, the National Institutes of Health, the National Cancer Institute, will attack me, my journal, and we're going to have a whole political battle because this is so controversial. After two years, we finally gave up trying to publish it. We finally published it in 2010. I completely rewrote it. There's a lengthy introduction to update it to 2000. By then, Kelly was already dead. Uh, updated it to 2010 and discussed the difficulties we had trying to get it published. So it is now available called One Man Alone, referring to Kelly. Now, unfortunately, in 1986, because we couldn't get this published, Kelly kind of went off the deep end. He thought his work would never be accepted. He started getting paranoid. He thought I was part of a CIA plot to steal his work, et cetera, all the crazy stuff. And it kind of disappeared, closed his office down. With our inability to get it published, my research colleague, Dr. Linda Isaacs, and I returned to New York. And I knew Dr. Good down in Florida. He was in semi-retirement. He wasn't going to be able to help me. He was no longer head of Sloan Kettering. So such a controversial type of treatment, we, we knew he wouldn't be of any use, and he agreed. So I came back to New York, opened up a practice. Kelly was out of practice with the sole intent of trying to salvage the treatment. And we did it you know, the same way he did, with the different diets, the different supplements, the enzymes, the uh, detoxification routines like the coffee enemas and the liver flushes, et cetera. And I opened my, up my practice in the fall of 1987. And I had some you know, good, good support at that point. Robert Good was a friend, and Robert, uh, I'm sorry, Robert Atkins was a good friend, the diet doctor, and he had a national radio show at the time, which was very well listened to, this was before the internet, and he knew about my Kelly study. I'd met him, interviewed him when I was a journalist, and we had maintained a friendship over the years. In fact, he offered me a job to run a cancer unit at his, at his diet clinic, but I, didn't, I wanted to be on my own. So he had me on his radio show. This is the fall of 1987. I'd been in practice a couple months. And a social worker from the American Cancer Society ha had a secret interest in alternative medicine. When you work for the American Cancer Society then and today, you cannot admit that you have an interest in alternative medicine. So she kind of secretly would listen to things like the Atkins radio show and heard an interview with me on the show. She had a patient she'd been following that she wanted to refer to me, interesting, very interesting woman, lived in the New York City area. 1985, she develops a tumor in her right breast that's very red and inflamed, and her primary care physician thinks it's mastitis, just infection. Puts her on antibiotics, doesn't improve, gets bigger. Sends her for a biopsy, they biopsy it, and it's inflammatory breast cancer. Inflammatory breast cancer is the single most aggressive form of breast cancer there is. The trouble is, by that point, the tumor is so big, no surgeon will operate on it. So they have a meeting with a radiation oncologist and a medical oncologist, and they decide what they need to do is shrink it with radiation. The surgeon agrees. So she gets five weeks of external beam radiation right to the breast. Take her to surgery, they do a mastectomy and axillary dissection. Well, even after radiation, it was eight centimeters, which for a breast cancer tumor is big. Anything above five centimeters are considered very poor prognosis. After radiation, it was eight centimeters. And 17 of 17 axillary lymph nodes were involved with cancer. That's a death sentence. Anytime you have more than nine lymph nodes involved, it's a death sentence, then and today. The oncologist meets with her and was very honest, said, I'm not going to cure you long term, but we have to put you on aggressive chemo just to keep you alive, or this is going to explode within months. So they put her on CMF, cytoxin methotrexate 5-FU, which in those days was standard of care triple agent chemotherapy for metastatic breast cancer, and it was developed by Dr. Bonadonna at the Milan Cancer Institute. Put her on that. She's on it for two years. They're going to keep her on it as long as she lives. Two years into it, August 1987, develops pain in her sternum, pain, whoops, sorry, pain in her ribs. They do an x-ray, got a tumor in her sternum, bone scan shows multiple lesions in her ribs. It's recurred on aggressive chemo, and her oncologist throws his hands in the air and says, you've got a few months to live. Well, her social worker had been following her because of all, you know, all the stress of her cancer. She was seeing a social worker associated with the American Cancer Society. So she goes for a meeting, and the social worker calls her into her office, shuts the door, and says, you can never say that I've said this to you. That's how the politics of cancer are. 
I can't, you know, you can't ever say that I said this to you. He said, you want to see this Gonzalez guy, just turn him on an interview. He's got some interesting theories and some case reports from Dr. Kelly. So the patient comes to see me, fall, late fall of 1987. You always, you, this is true no matter what field of healthcare profession you're in. You always learn from your patients. You gotta keep your eyes, your ears, your mind open to what the patients tell you. Patients tell you so much. Patients teach me all the time. And I hadn't been in practice that long, and you know, we're trying to salvage Kelly's work because he was disappearing and wasn't seeing patients anymore. And she walks into my office, and she's very calm. Stage four, inflammatory breast cancer, told us terminally, she was a very smart woman. And I said to her, I said, you know, you really, we're talking for a while, I do my intake history, which can take up to two hours with these complicated patients. Then the second visit, we go off over the program. I said, you're very calm. She says, look, I know you haven't been in practice that long, but I trust my social worker. She said the interview was impressive. I've read some things about you and you, some other interviews you've had I've heard about. And I know you'll do the best you can and I'll do the best I can and we'll see what happens. In a very honest way. Patients who walk into your office when they have anxiety and fear and you know, suspicious, and this is so good, why isn't it at Sloan Care? And that kind of stuff which you can't answer. We don't even want patients like that. We turn them down because they're not gonna do well. The trouble with anxiety fear is it turns on the sympathetic nervous system. You have a sympathetic dominant tumor. It's gonna be catastrophic. The, br the mind controls the brain, the brain controls the autonomic nervous system. If the mind is in a state of anxiety and fear, there's no mystery as to why that's gonna make treatment can of cancer difficult for a sympathetic dominant. Their mind can override my enzymes, my nutrients, my detoxification routines, and my diet. Their mind is stronger than my supplements. It'll, it'll be catastrophic. She was calm, so immediately she was, she was reassured that there was someone who might be able to help her, even though the oncologist said there was nothing can, that can be done. Goes on a program with great diligence. People that are calm, people that don't have doubts, fear, anxiety, tend to be compliant. Patients that operate a fear, anxiety, doubt, suspicion, never comply anyway, so it's not productive for them to be on the therapy. She complied religiously. And the first thing that happened, she didn't die. Second thing that happened, you know, I'm trained as an academic. I know CAT scans and bone scans give you a lot of radiation exposure, which isn't very good. But I'm still an academic, occasionally I like documentation as to how the patient's doing. She refused any scans when I suggested we get them done. Until 2001, 14 years after she started with me, she allowed me to do a bone scan. So I did a bone scan, all her tumors were gone. She's alive and well now. In December, it'll be 27 years with stage four inflammatory breast cancer, who patient who developed metastases into the bone while on triple agent aggressive standard of care chemotherapy. Um, I frankly been able to find a similar case like her in the medical literature. If anyone can, please let me know. We're always trying to learn. One of the things I learned about her is the importance of attitude. If the patient has a bad attitude, it's not that it's offensive to me, it's gonna be offensive to them, and it's gonna sabotage whatever someone's trying to do, particularly when you're dealing with something like cancer, where you're dealing with life and death. This is another patient, a wonderful patient. Um, she lives out in the West, very well-educated, very smart her husband, a very successful lawyer. 1986, she developed a breast, a breast lesion, the left breast. They biopsied it's ductal carcinoma in situ. There are all these kind of battles in the conventional oncology world about cancer and which cancers are poor prognosis and good prognosis. Ductal carcinoma in situ, some believe 95% of the time will never metastasize. Others believe it can be turned into a very aggressive type of cancer, needs to be tested, treated aggressively. The people who see it as an indolent cancer sometimes will say it doesn't even need to be treated. Her surgeon belonged to the group that thought any cancer needs to be taken out. He suggested mastectomy. She said, no way, you're gonna do a lumpectomy. It's, she did a lot of reading, realized even in 1986 that this wasn't that aggressive a cancer. He agrees to lumpectomy, takes it out. Margins are clear, no spread, does fine until 1989. Develops very quickly over a period of several weeks a tumor in the right breast, about three centimeters in the right armpit. Goes to her surgeon, they biopsy it. It's a completely different histology. It's poorly differentiated, infiltrating, adenocarcinoma. Now, ductal carcinoma in situ, you know, the ducts are the milk ducts, and in situ simply means it's only growing in the milk ducts and hasn't grown through the epithelial lining, going back to what I was talking about a couple hours ago. With infiltrating invasive uh, ductal carcinoma, it invades, it's already invading through the epithelial linings, and that's how you can distinguish a very aggressive from a non-aggressive cancer, whether it inv has invaded through the epithelial lining. Hers had, and it was huge, and it already had metastasized in the lymph nodes. So they decide to do a mastectomy. She says, no, I want you to do a lumpectomy, axillary dissection, convinces the surgeon to do that. He does that, and it's about three centimeters in the breast, about three centimeters in the armpit, poorly differentiated, infiltrating carcinoma. After surgery, now normally you do scans before surgery, after surgery, they do an ultrasound, 
that shows a density in the right lobe of the liver, liver consistent with metastatic disease. They biopsy the liver lesion, and indeed, it's metastatic breast cancer, stage four, incurable then. You read the textbooks today, 2014, stage four breast cancer, incurable today. They do a bone scan, which shows, quote, this is from the bone scan report, 1989, multiple focal areas of increased activity in the spine consistent with metastatic carcinoma. She meets with an oncologist who was very honest. Stage four breast cancer, we cannot cure you. She was young. She was in her mid-40s when this was all happening. He said, we'll put you on aggressive chemo. For metastatic disease like that, they use the regimen called CAF, cytopsin adriamycin, which is you know, really an aggressive chemo agent, 5-FU. They use the reserved adriamycin for the really aggressive cancers. She starts it, but she starts to deteriorate really quickly. Terrible pain in the back where she has the tumor. You know, the liver itself doesn't have pain nerves, but the capsule around the liver does. Her liver was expanding from the tumor, and it was exquisitely painful. She was on round-the-clock morphine, losing pounds. She never was overweight, but she was losing a lot of weight. Fatigue, malaise, very sick. After three courses of chemo, she feels so sick from the chemo. She said, the cancer may kill me, but chemo will definitely kill me sooner. So she stops chemo, goes out to Stanford with her biopsy reports and the scans and all that. They confirm stage four breast metastatic into the liver suggests she continue CAF, she says, no way. Now, this is 1990, I'd been in practice all of two and a half years, and she heard about me because we already had successful patients, and word of mouth, nothing succeeds like a successful patient. Word of mouth was already spreading around the U.S. that we would, you know, the patients were getting well under our care. She decides to come see us, quits chemo, doesn't do it anymore, comes to see us, and I'll never forget the first time I met I still remember it. She had the green pallor of a terminal cancer patient. She was very thin very weak. She was on round the rock morphine. She didn't have a cane, but she walked with a limp because the, the pain in her back was so severe. But she was extremely determined. Never underestimate the effect of determination in getting over a bad situation in medicine. She was determined to get well. In fact, I had mixed feelings as to whether we could really help her or not. She was religiously compliant. Six months later, she returned. She's gained about six pounds. She's about half as much morphine without going through withdrawal. She's smiling. I never saw a smile the first. We spent four or five hours with each new patient over two days. She's smiling. She was feeling better. The pain was less. I saw her in a year. We have patients all over the world, out-of-town patients. They have to come back initially every six months so we can monitor them. You see, you know, you learn a lot by seeing a patient. Not seeing a patient is, is, is no better for me than it would be for you. You can't diagnose someone's eyes by not seeing them. You tell a lot as a physician just by the way a patient looks and the way they walks and the way they smile or don't smile. A year, she's off morphine, never went through withdrawal. We find that with our patients with the detox procedures and nutrients, they'll often get off aggressive opiate pain medication without going through withdrawal. Her energy, stamina, concentration, all better. The green pallor is gone. She's feeling great. Wonderful. Thanks me. Gives me a hug when she leaves. She feels so good. Without telling me, she decides to stop the therapy. Disaster. We use the diabetes model. Diabetic, as I tell patients, can live to be 100 years old as long as they follow the diet and take insulin. I have patients who've been with me 27 years. They're in their 90s now as long as they follow the diet and take their enzymes. They stop the enzymes, stop the diet. Yes, it can come back just like a diabetic who has type 1 diabetes goes off insulin. They can be dead in a week. She goes off because she's feeling so good. My program, you know, it affects the quality of life. You know, they have to do all these things and take the pills and do the enemas. July 1991, I get an emergency phone call. Never, I remember it exactly, even though it's, you know, 23 years ago. My staff said, you better take this call. You know, we all knew what a you know, great patient she was. I take the call. She's in tears. She was calling from a hospital. She had grand mal seizure the night before. It said, I've been off your program, mea culpa. They did a CAT scan, two tumors in her brain consistent with metastatic disease. They want to do radiation immediately, tell her we can't cure you any more than they could a year and a half ago, but at least we'll reduce the chances of you having another seizure. She doesn't want to do radiation. She admits she had been off the program. I said, what do you want to do? That's the most important thing. It isn't what I want her to do. It's what she wants to do. She says, I want to go back on your program. Checks herself out against medical advice, starts the program. Does beautifully. About eight months later, um, let's see, where is that? What was that? April 1992, less than a year after the recurrence. She's feeling fine. No more seizures. They do a CAT scan of the head, and this is from the report, quote, there is no mass or mass effect. There's no evidence of metastatic disease, normal CAT scan of the head. The tumors were gone. And they did a CAT scan of the abdomen, which hadn't been done since she started with me. Wrote, normal CAT scan of the abdomen, she's fine. Well, 24 years later, she's alive and well. She's had ups and downs with her compliance. She still takes enzymes. I haven't seen her in a number of years, which I wish she should come back. But she's 24 years out with stage four metastatic breast cancer. 
that did not respond to chemo with biopsy-proven liver mets, bony metastases, as well, all of which resolved on the therapy, including when she went off the program, brain mets occurred when she went back on it. Went. So she, that, that kind of confirms how well the program works because when she went off it, it recurred. She, the patients can't go off it. Sorry, I wish they could, but that's the way it is. You go back to your previous life, you end up with your previous disease, which is not a nice thing. So 24 years on the therapy. Here's another wonderful patient, pancreatic cancer. This is actually a patient of my colleague, Sarah, great patient, lived out in the West. Actually, she, she said we could use her name. I don't use her name, though, anyway. Comes out from Denver. Of fall of 2000, you know, talking 14 years ago, she develops unexplained weight loss. She's not a big woman. She wasn't grossly overweight at all. She lost 20 pounds over about a three or four month period, and they don't really know what's going on, but she's starting to get tired, fatigue, malaise, no appetite. December 2000, they do a CAT scan that shows a 3.4 centimeter tumor in the head of the pancreas, but no evidence of metastatic spread. Now, the aggressive nature of pancreatic cancer when it's localized really it can be predicated on the size of the tumor. Anything above two centimeters, you assume as a surgeon that it's already spread, even though there was no evidence of metastatic disease. For some reason, there was a three-month delay before they did a biopsy. They do a CAT scan guide, a biopsy in February 2001. With pancreatic cancer, you can't wait three months and it proved to be a poorly differentiated adenocarcinoma, which is the most aggressive type of pancreatic cancer there is. She meets with a surgeon. He said, well, it's probably already spread, and there was a three-month delay with the biopsy and all that, but I can do a Whipple, Whipple named after George Whipple in the 30s, 40s, this extraordinary grotesque surgery where they take out part of the stomach, much of the pancreas, the gallbladder, uh, much of the small intestine, they connect the stomach to the small intestine, and it's kind of this kamikaze approach to cancer treatment with pancreatic cancer. And they do it because they don't really have any other thing. And with someone who may have localized disease, they think is the only way to cure it because chemo and radiation don't work. The trouble is that in the old days, 40 to 50% of people would die during the surgery. Now the mortality in the hands of an experienced clinician, about 10%. But it's still a very difficult procedure. No one is ever healthy after Whipple. And most of the time, 75% of the time, the patients who undergo Whipple have a recurrence and die anyway. So it's, there, aren't that, there aren't that many patients that are eligible for it because when pancreatic cancer is diagnosed, usually it's already spread 75% of the time. And the people that undergo the Whipple, only about 25% have any kind of long-term survival and the quality of life is terrible. They say, we'll give you chemo as well, you might live 18 months. She said, no way. Goes up to the Mayo Clinic, they confirm the diagnosis, review the slides, they say, we can do a Whipple and chemo just like the local guy in Denver. He said, no way. She'd heard about us, well, we're in practice 14 years now. She decides this is what she wants to do. I was really booked up at that time, so my colleagues saw her. And she came in, again, attitude is about 95% of the bottle, battle. Yeah, we, we think the esoteric neurophysiology of the autonomic nervous system is wonderful, and we think Beard's work with the pancreatic enzymes is brilliant and effective. But it's really the attitude of the patient. First, the bad attitude, they don't comply. Bad attitude turns on the sympathetic system with a sympathetic dominant tumor. That's going to override even my enzymes and even our manipulation or attempted ma manipulation of the autonomic nervous system. Absolutely believes in us, grateful for us, grateful if we make the program available, could care less about the critics, goes on the program, does well. A year later, repeat the scan, tumors are small. A year later, repeat the scans, tumors are small. Well, to sum up um, a long history, you know, it's gonna, this December, it'll be 14 years since her scan. She's alive and well, leading a normal life, watching her. her she now has great grandkids, in excellent health, involved with her church, her community. People that are involved in life always do better than people that sit home and are miserable. She's involved with her life, her church. She's teaching a nutrition course at her local church, which is great. She's gotten so interested in nutrition. She reads about it all the time. 14 years out, never had surgery, chemo, radiation, biopsy proven, poorly differentiated, worst histology there is for the worst cancer there is, confirmed at the Mayo Clinic, so we have major institutional confirmation of diagnosis. She didn't have the flu that we misdiagnosed. This was a confirmed cancer 14 years out. Another wonderful patient. You know, again, you always learn from your patient. The patient was young. Um, in his 40s, develops reflux, indigestion. They think he has a hiatal hernia. Now he's followed by a doctor that works at a Barnes Hospital, which is associated with Washington University, one of the great medical centers in the Midwest, one of the great medical schools. And they didn't do a scan. Again, you, you wonder why they didn't do that, at least an ultrasound. They say you've got a hiatal hernia. This is fall of uh, 2000, January 2001. They scheduled a surgery at Barnes Hospital open them up to the surgeon's absolute horror. This is from the surgical note. If he found, quote, multiple umbilicated white, firm, and gritty tumors in both the right and left lobes of the liver, apparently occupying 50% of the liver. 
Surgeon doesn't attempt to resect any of this. Biopsies of liver, it comes back positive for malignancy, favorite metastatic adenocarcinoma. After surgery, they do a CAT scan of the chest, abdomen, and pelvis. This shows a 6.5 by 3.7 mass in the tail of pancreas with, quote, diffuse hepatic metastases, and, quote, the radiologist summed up, quote, this likely represents primary metastatic pancreatic adenocarcinoma, end note. Meets with an, and, and quote, meets with an oncologist at Barnes Hospital, said, you have incurable disease. He had two young kids. He was a single father. He said, oh, man, I, I got to live at least a couple years. They say with aggressive chemo, you might live two years, maybe, if you're lucky, if you respond. About 30% of patients with pancreatic cancer of stage four will respond to chemo. It's not curative. It might prolong their life. Two years is a little bit overestimation. I think the oncologist was trying to cheer him up. He suggests two drugs, cisplatin and etoposide. He decides he's going to go to Sloan Kettering to get a second opinion, go to Mecca. Um, he meets with Eileen O'Reilly, who's their great pancreatic oncologist there. And by then, he's very sick. He's losing weight. He's on pain medication. He has nausea. This is from Dr. O'Reilly's note, Sloan Kettering. The patient has significant fatigue, takes naps usually by the end of the afternoon. He does notice recent onset back pain, pancreatic cancer, you often get back pain, which is alleviated with pain pills. He has significant nausea without vomiting, has occasional palpitations and eyes flushing, mildly decreased appetite, is approximately 10 pound weight loss. She suggests the same chemo regimen, so he decides he'll get it in St. Louis, goes on to chemo. He wasn't interested in alternatives at that point, he just wanted to stay alive. He thought he'd be dead in three months. Goes on chemo, and indeed he had initially a reduction in tumor. Chemotherapy will reduce pancreatic tumors in about 30% of the cases, but it is not curative. It always comes back more aggressively. This is after the second cycle of chemo, marked improvement of the numerous liver metastases, decreased size of the pancreatic tail mass. I mean, none of this went away, but it was smaller. But he was getting real sick on chemo, and by the third course of chemo, he stops it. After the third course, he was so sick. He figured he was going to die from the chemo, kind of what other patients have said. He stops it. The oncologist says, you know, this is a death sentence. He says, death sentence if I do the chemo, right? He says, well, yeah, you're right. But we might give you some life. He said, not this way, not the way it's going. Now, he'd heard about us, just again, word of mouth through, through serendipity, who read an article about us, decides to come see us. First met him in May 2001, um, 13 and a half years ago. And he was quite sick at that point. But again, his attitude was amazing. He was a guy who's in his 40s, a single father, two young girls. He didn't know what was going to happen to him if he died. You know, they could literally, like Kelly, end up in an orphanage. But he was quiet and calm. He had a calm about him. There was something, and again, it isn't ego that we're running a cult. It's just patients that come in with faith and belief always do better. Well, first, physiologically, it will immediately, when they have faith or they think there's some chance and they're hopeful, hope tends to shut down an overly strong sympathetic system. Faith tends to shut down an overly strong sympathetic system. It'll do that more strongly even than magnesium. So he comes in and he's quiet and calm and we go through the whole thing, spend the four or five hours. After four or five hours with the patient, you really get to know him does his program. 10 months later, we repeat the scan. And it shows, this is February 2002, 10 months after he'd been on the program. It still showed multiple tiny lesions in the liver, all less than three millimeters, smaller than they were, but there was no pancreatic lesion, no abdominal pelvic lesion. I mean, he's not cured. And we talked about it, and he said, well, you know, I seem to be doing better. Let's stay the course. And I said, fine. So October 2002, some 17 months after he began treatment, we repeat the CAT scan. It shows no pancreatic lesion. And this is right from the radiology report. Quote, multiple tiny lesions of the liver seen on the prior examination are not identified on today's study. 2003, 2004, he wanted to get scanned. Now we stopped doing it because, you know, a single CAT scan can give up to 1,000 chest X-rays worth of radiation. The cat is out of the hat. Uh, patients know this. The first studies go back to 1990, but the radiation oncologists, you know, and, and the radiologists kept it secret how much radiation are in a CAT scan. A PET scan can give you up to 1,400 chest X-rays worth of radiation. It's estimated 29,600 cases of cancer are being caused by CAT scans. A single CAT scan can increase the risk of cancer. They are not without a downside. And he was a very smart guy. He was a lawyer by training in real estate, and he didn't want any more scans. We haven't done it since, but the fact is he's now um, 13 and a half years with total regression of disease on a therapy, alive and well. His kids have graduated through college, which is really what he cared about. They're doing fine. He's doing fine. And actually, he's got a girlfriend and doing really well. This is a great patient. Again, you know, you always, I always, I presented him before at other conferences. You always learn so much from your patient. Mort was a very smart man. He had a master's in archaeology from the University of Paris, American-born, studied abroad. His wife had a PhD in English literature and was a college professor. Mort was an expert in 19th century French impressionistic art, very knowledgeable, 
uh, but actually was successful in business. He didn't, he didn't have an academic career, though he was trained as an academic. He went into business very successful, retired in Orlando, you know, up in, here in Florida. And he was very meticulous about keeping up with his doctors, a very conscientious man, very smart, very educated. Every year he'd go back to his primary care physician. He was really in good health. And they would do an X-ray and an EKG and the usual stuff. So August 1991, X-ray suddenly shows a six millimeter lesion in the right lung consistent with tumor. They do a CAT scan. And this is the CAT scan report, September 1991. There are about four lesions in the upper right lobe of the liver. An ultrasound examination is recommended for further evaluation. There's around enlargement of the right adrenal gland up to two centimeters. There's what appears to be diffuse enlargement of the left adrenal. Both these findings are suspicious for metastatic disease. Both adrenals involved. There's a mass in the cephalic portion of the head of the pancreas measuring 4.5 centimeters. They did a bone scan that day, which showed abnormal activity of the right hip and right shoulder, suggesting metastatic disease. This guy has terrible disease. It's from the pancreas into the liver, four tumors, into both adrenal, into the bone, into the lung. He meets with a surgeon. They, they, they want to get a piece of tissue just to see, well, maybe it's something else, or maybe it's sarcoid. You know, they, they think it's pancreatic cancer. They decide that the, the lung lesion is the easiest to get to, so he undergoes a partial thoracotomy. They take out the lung, and it's in infiltrating, infiltrative, moderately differentiated adenocarcinoma consistent with the pancreatic primary. Meets with an oncologist. The oncologist saved his life by telling him the truth. The oncologist said, chemo will not help you. You've got too much disease. This is a pancreatic stage four, terrible. The wife says, how long if he doesn't do chemo? He said, well, two, two plus or minus months, two months plus or minus. And they said, well, what about chemo? I said, no, it's not going to help you. It's going to ruin your quality of life. And I, he, the oncologist was so honest with this guy. He said, it's only going to ruin your life. Because of that, they decided they'd look into alternatives. Had he said, let's do chemo anyway, he would have done more would have done. I never would have met him. He would have died. Now, his wife was interested in alternatives and read an interview of me that was in some alternative journal that I don't even think exists anymore. And she liked the inter interview. And she was already interested in organics and put him on an organic diet, a plant-based diet. She'd read in the interview that pancreatic tumors or sympathetic dominant tumors need to be on plant foods, puts them on carrot juice. They come to see me fall of 1991. And like several of the other patients, the most remarkable thing, and I remember, you remember these first meetings with these extraordinary patients so well, and I spend a lot of time with them, so you get to know them. And I can remember him sitting at the desk, he was taking notes. It's like he was taking notes in school. He was calm. He was, you know, not crying. He wasn't hysterical. He would be given eight weeks to live. Now, he came up from Florida by himself. Your money was tight for them. So he came up by himself. And he was calm. And he was smiling. And we were chatting. And 20 minutes into this, I stopped the, the meeting. I said, you know, because I learned from patients, I said, you're extremely calm. He said, you're calmer than I am. And you have, you know, you know what you have. He's not an Austrian. He's a smart guy, you know, master's degree in archaeology. He said, look, he looked me right in the eye and said, I know you're just what this other patient had said several years earlier. You're going to do the best you can do. I'm going to do the best I can. And then he said the most important thing. He said, I'm going to live each day as if I'm going to live forever. And I'm going to continue to lead tours at the local art museum, which he did. And I'm going to continue to be involved with my church and my community and my family. Those are the patients that always do the best. And you're going to do the best you can do. And whatever happens will be the best that can happen. He goes on the program, does it meticulously. I see him every six months. When I see him six months later, he's calmer than he was the first time. He's still leading art tours, still involved with his church, doing Bible study, all those things. Um, Fifteen months into it, we repeat the scans, and all the tumors are the same. Now, the first miracle is he was alive. The tumors hadn't changed. We often find that. You know, patients think immediately the tumors have to go disappear, otherwise you're going to die. On our program with the enzymes, it's kind of like the placenta. It gradually changes from aggressive to non-aggressive to stable, and eventually usually goes away. Fifteen months into it, the tumors hadn't gone away. He still had four. In fact, there was evidence of maybe a fifth new tumor in the liver, the same exact size pancreatic tumor, the tumors in adrenals, two centimeters, bone lesions. We talk about it. He said, the first thing is, this is what he said to me. This is 1993. We're not going to do any more scans. And I said to him, why is that? He said, well, first of all, I do is create anxiety. And anxiety isn't going to cure me. Secondly, the CAT scan isn't going to cure me. All it did is cause anxiety. I'm not going to have, I don't want my quality of life ruined by scans. And so the third, he said, this is 1993. 15 years before the orthodox conventional medical world would acknowledge the dangers of CAT scan. He said, this give off too much radiation. I asked the radiologist. He admitted to me sheepishly that it could be up to 1,000 chest x-rays. How is that going to help me get better when I'm doing all this detox? I said, I agree. 1998 rolls around. Seven years later, I said, Mort, I'm trained as an academician. I understand about the dangers of CAT scans. Let me do a CAT scan, and then 10 years later, we'll do it again. He said, OK, to please you, we'll do the scan. Never do anything to please a doctor, but he agreed to do that. 
So this is the, I actually had the, the films from his 1992, 1993 scans in my office. So the radiologist who did the scans in 1998 didn't, but this is, he had the reports on the computer. Reading the report from 1993 study, it sounded like the patient obvious metastatic disease, the largest structure being a large porta, patus, and peripancreatic mass. No such masses are seen today. There's no adenopathy. The adrenals are prominent. They're two very small liver lesions that cannot be characterized. Now, when he had done the ultrasound, the liver lesions were like 3.2 centimeters. They were big tumors in his liver. So basically, just about everything had resolved. He lived until 2006, when at age 85, he should not have been driving at all, but he was driving at night. The car flipped over on the highway, ended up in rehab, died of the side effects of a car accident with no evidence of pancreatic cancer in his body. He lived 15 years had 15 good years, lived until age 86 with stage four pancreatic cancer with essentially total regression of disease on a program, never had surgery, chemo, radiation, did have a biopsy which confirmed the disease. So there's no doubt about what he had. Um, this is a wonderful patient. See, we're doing okay time-wise. Wonderful patient. A young woman when she was diagnosed with terrible cancer, whoops, age 32, I don't know why I keep doing that, 32 years old, she, when she was diagnosed in 2008, she had Burkitt's she had Burkitt's lymphoma. Burkitt's lymphoma is kind of an odd cancer. It's one of the few cancers that are definitively associated with an infectious organism. It's been linked to Epstein-Barr, which causes mononucleosis. In Africa, it's endemic, very common in Africa. In the US, it's not that common. I once spoke to the Sloan Kettering um, Burkitt's lymphoma expert. People came from all over the world to see her, and she only saw six cases a year. There aren't that many cases in the US, and she saw most of them. It's very rare in the US, though it's, again, been linked to Epstein Barr. So doctors, when it does occur, they're so uh, they're really surprised when they make that diagnosis. She grew up in California. Parents were very interested in alternative medicine. Age 10, she developed allergies. Brought her to conventional doctors, couldn't help her. Brought her to alternative doctors, they didn't help her too much. So they put her on an, uh, their own organic whole foods diet and supplements. She gets over allergies. Does well. Moves to Washington State when she's an adult. March 2008, she first develops sweats, chills, fevers. They come and go, she starts getting weight loss, goes to her doctor repeatedly, finally the summer of 2008, goes to her doctor and she suggests, maybe I have shingles. I said, possible, puts her on Valtrex, you know, an anti-herpes virus uh, medication, but only gets worse. And then August 2008, over a several week period, she develops a tumor coming out of her back that Epstein-Barr is, ex I mean, Epstein-Barr associated cancers like Burkitt's lymphoma are excruciatingly aggressive. Over about a two week, 10 day period, she develops a tumor half the size of a football sticking out of her back, is admitted to the local emergency room. They do a CAT scan which shows terrible disease. CAT scan of the chest shows a 7.1 by 10.8 by 10.1, turn this away, um, centimeter tumor compressing both the main pulmonary artery and the aorta as well as a mass adjacent to the spinal cord, 5.7 by 7.4 by 7.4 centimeters in diameter, invading the posterior chest wall thought to be the cause of her back pain. Biopsy of the bone marrow was negative, but they do a CAT scan guided fine needle aspiration of the anterior medial stein of mass, and that confirms Burkitt's lymphoma. Now they repeat the PET scan. This is about a week later, and the tumors have almost doubled in size. A PET CT reveals a 15 centimeter, it had just been 10 centimeters a week early, 15 centimeter anterior medial stein of mass, an 11 centimeter right paraspinal mass, a 2.5 by 3.6 left ovarian mass, and a 1.8 centimeter mass within the small bowel. Oncologist comes in, she's at a, a, a local, but a good Seattle local hospital, not one of the main academic centers. Very good oncologist said, you got a Burkitt's lymphoma. We got to start chemo today or you're going to be dead in 10 days. And she's 32 years old at the time. And he warns her that the only way we're going to give you long-term survival is get you in remission and do a bone marrow transplant. I was trained to do bone marrow transplants. The way, the, the purpose of a bone marrow transplant, my mentor Robert Good did the first bone marrow transplant in history when he was at the University of Minnesota before going to Sloan in 1969. Bone marrow transplant, the theory, which often doesn't work in practice, is you, it allows you to give such high doses of chemo that normally would destroy the bone marrow and the patient would die, with the point of you want to eliminate the cancer with really super high doses of chemo, and then you salvage the patient by transferring stem cells from a donor. And hopefully, you know, it takes over the bone marrow and then the patient survives. But it really doesn't work that well a lot of the time, although it works occasionally. He said that's the only way you're going to get long-term survival. And what he proposed, what's called a McGrath regimen for, for a Burkitt's lymphoma. It's an extremely aggressive protocol. It has two sequences of chemo that are giving alternating uh, sequences. The first, McGrath A, includes, just to give an idea of how aggressive, rituxan, cyclophosphamide, vincristine, doxorubicin, methotrexate, leucovorin rescue, and aracid. 
Then regimen B consists of bifosfamide. That was developed by Dr. Schaaf in Germany. It is such a toxic chemo regimen. He actually had to develop a salvage remedy for the ifosfamid known as Mesna Rescue because most people were dying from the chemo. Uh, etoposide aracy, and they're also going to give her um, aracy chemotherapy right into the spinal column because they assumed that she probably had uh, central nervous system involvement. She has no choice. Well, August 2008 starts chemo, goes on McGrath A, finishes that, goes on McGrath B. They do this in alternating sequences. Meanwhile, she meets while she's getting the chemo with Paul O'Donnell, who's the famed bone marrow transplant specialist at Fred Hutchinson Research Center in Seattle, part of University of Washington, where famous for doing bone marrow transplants, and he's one of their gurus out there. And he again confirmed that she had to go to remission, but told her to continue chemo under the oncologist locally whom, she knew, whom he knew. Now, PET scan November 2008, three months after chemo, shows complete or near complete metabolic response in the anterior metastinum, complete metabolic response in the lower chest lesion. It looks everything looks good. She's not in complete remission. However, the problem is quickly it regresses. Mid December, a month later, CAT scan shows the disease is progressing. Within the anterior medial sign of mass, there's a mass, I'm reading from the radiology report, 5.5 by 3.0 by 2 centimeters, 6 centimeters. The previously identified right paraspinal mass has decreased in size, but it's still active. She finishes her last chemotherapy, McGrath AMB, January 2009. They do a PET scan in January. It shows increased, act PET scans measure activity as well as size. You know, CAT scan measures size. PET scan, you give a radioactive glucose dye, many of you know this. And the idea is that that's selectively taken up by cancer cells because they're hypermetabolic, so they'll tend to sequester this radioactive glucose. And then you do a scan, and you'll see these hot spots that represent cancer. They do the PET scan. It shows anything. Uh, the PET scans are scored on a 0 to 20 scale of activity. Two or below is normal, 2.5, borderline. Anything above 2.5 or 3 is positive for cancer. Heterogeneous increased activity, SUV is the activity level, 4.5 associated with 2.8 by 5.1 anterior metastinum mass. There's increased activity with SUV of 3.6, right basal pleural modularity. Well, like that so often happens in oncology. She had initial response, and a month later, it's exploding. She meets with the oncologist at, in Paul O'Donnell's group who's going to do the bone marrow transplant. Says, You're not in remission. We could do a bone marrow transplant, but it won't work, and it might kill you. Um, I saw this happen when I was trained to do bone marrow transplants. 10 to, 20, 10 to up to 30% of patients undergoing bone marrow transplant die as a result of the therapy because you give such high doses of chemo and often radiation along with it, so toxic it kills people. And the oncologist, honest woman that she was, didn't want to subject this 32-year-old to all of that because the chances of it succeeding were remote, the chances of her dying were quite high. So this is from the oncologist's note. Therefore, our interpretation is that the patient's disease is progressing under a debulking chemotherapy she received during the last few months. The parents who were with her at that last meeting asked this honest oncologist, with no therapy, how long will she live? And they say about six months. And this was an expert in lymphomas and Burkitt's lymphoma at the University of Washington. They say, if we do chemo, the oncologist said she might live three months. So the oncologist was in no way, shape, or form pushing chemo. She heard about us again, as patients often do, through a patient of mine who was doing well that she knew in Seattle, decides to come, us, to come see us. I first met with her in February 2009, five and a half years ago. And I'll never forget, she came with her parents. She, a beautiful woman, tall, model shape, but she was emaciated. You could see how beautiful she was. She had no hair, so she had a scarf on. She was so weak, she, she couldn't sit up in the chair. Now, in my office, I have my desk then two chairs, and across the far wall is a, a, a couch. And she had to lie down on the couch, and her parents sat in the two chairs. And I did my history like this, and it was all she could do with the help of her parents to walk to one of the exam rooms when I had to do my exam. And she was really sick, but she had it. It's amazing. She's 32 years old, told she's going to die, given six months to live. Her whole life was before her, now taken away. And yet her attitude was unbelievable. And the parents made a difference. Gerson, who had his own alternative therapy, Carrie and I were talking about Gerson yesterday and even and today. Gerson treated people nutritionally, died in 1959. And in his book, he said something very interesting. He said he lost more patients to non-supportive family members than he did to cancer, which sounds like a bizarre thing. But he was a very experienced clinician. The corollary of that is I have seen more patients get well because they had supportive family members. Her parents didn't want to know, if this is so good, why is the American Cancer Society hate alternatives? If this is so good, why aren't you president of the world? All that kind of stuff. They just wanted to know what they had to do to help get their daughter better. 
And we spent four, about five hours together over two days and taught them how to do the program. Now, the previous patients were all sympathetic dominance on the plant-based diet. She's a lymphoma patient, parasympathetic dominance. So I put her on red meat once or twice a day, the supplements that I use for the parasympathetic dominance, the enzyme. Now, with parasympathetic dominant tumors, they already have a strong pancreas. You don't have to give large doses of enzymes, though I gave her a fair amount because her disease was so aggressive. What you have to do is turn off the parasympathetic, turn on the sympathetic with a red meat diet, large doses of calcium, no magnesium, potassium, zinc and selenium, the DHA, EPA, essential omega-3 fatty acids from animal-based sources. So we designed that program for her, and she did it, and did it meticulously. With her. She was too weak to do it herself, so her parents had to help her. Her parents had to help her do the enemas. You talk about devotion, dedication, and love. Six weeks later, her local oncologist, who agreed to follow her, he was very gracious, agreed to follow her, even though he, she was doing something alternative. There was a decrease in size of the anterior medial stein mass measures, 3.7 by 2, compared to 5.6 by 3 previously, so it was about half the size of tumors. After six weeks on my therapy, which is an unusually fast response with more with the pancreatic cancer, things stabilized the first 15 months. Her case, six weeks later, because we so effectively turned on a sympathetic system and she was so cooperative and compliant, things were better. Chest X-ray done in June 2009, if she'd been on the four, program four months, showed near total resolution of the mediastinal mass. PET scan during the second week of February 2010, after she completed a full year on the program, showed no evidence of metastatic or recurrent disease. She's basically well and has been well since. Now, oncologists had warned her, as they warn all patients getting this level of aggressive chemotherapy, that chemotherapy renders you sterile, whether you're a man or a woman. Well, on our program, that rule does not apply. Not only did she get over her cancer, but about three years ago, she gave birth to a beautiful, healthy daughter, perfect nine-month pregnancy, on good nutrition, Usually the normal symptoms you get during pregnancy, like the nausea and even the things like eclampsia with high blood pressure, fluid retention, don't happen. Beard actually wrote a, a, a section in his book in 1911 that pancreatic enzymes block eclampsia of pregnancy. We seem that to be the case, but in addition, we find with the nutritional program, rarely do women who get pregnant on the therapy have problems. She gave birth to a very healthy baby, never had problems. The kid is doing real well, eating organic food and carrot juice and all that, and she's now well, she started with February 2009, so uh, five and a half years, which given six weeks, six months to live, and she has her whole life ahead of her, a beautiful daughter, beautiful family. She's now living in California again, moved from Seattle, and had her whole life in front of her. Now I'm going to talk about a non-cancer patient. Yeah, we're talking about cancer. This is an interesting patient that will sum up everything I've been talking about, and you've been so patient, such a great audience, for the last three and a half hours. Um, we treat other things besides cancer. Usually problems for which conventional medical doctors and alternative doctors have not succeeded, and they come to see us. I was once referred to as a doctor of last resort, which is nothing I'm proud of. It'd be nicer to be known in another way, like the doctor of first resort, but we're not. So often people come to us after they've been through everything else. Now, this is my, a copy of my original note. This is before we used to get them beautifully typed up by a dictation service. June 22nd, 1994, 20 years ago, she was 43 years old at the time. She was a writer and was very successful, but was struggling because she was so sick. And it was also a professor of literature and writing at one of the Western universities. Despite the fact she'd been sick most of her adult life with a variety of problems, not cancer, she'd been able to see to some extent with her writing. It was very, very tough. And she came to us, came to me with some desperation. Now, I'm going to read the note, although on the screen it'll be kind of in a different order. This is the order in which she told me the problems. We go through a very elaborate, his, my history as I remember with her took about two and a half hours because it was so complicated and she had so many problems. The first thing she mentioned to me is that she had bleeder, bleeding uterine fibroids. This is an interesting story. This is a simple thing and you can see how, um, because I'm not talking to orthodox conventional medical doctors, you people won't be offended, how often conventional medical doctors miss things that are so obvious that you say, how could they possibly have done this? This was her first problem. In her mind, this was the biggest issue, bleeding uterine and fibroids. Since January 1990, she had increasing vaginal bleeding. Part of that time, she had a history of irregular 21-day cycles. In 1990, she had some bleeding, suffered three months of heavy daily bleeding, almost needed a transfusion. She consulted a series of gynecologists who diagnosed menopause. You blame everything on menopause. That's real smart. During 1990, 91, 92, and 93, the bleeding worsened. She would have periods of quiet, followed by several months of daily bleeding. She would become severely anemic. At one point, her hemoglobin reached 6.9. She refused the transfusion and treat. She got interested in nutrition because the doctors weren't doing anything for her. Put her on wheatgrass, which has chlorophyll, which is like hemoglobin, and raised her hemoglobin. 
She eventually consulted 10 gynecologists, none of whom were able to figure out the problem. Eventually, this is all true, I'm not making this up for this session. She consults with a physician assistant who on exam tells her she had uterine fibroids. I'm getting so excited, I'm blowing the microphone. She had uterine fibroids that were palpable. She, so the, the physician's assistant, not the 10 brilliant gynecologists, she walked into the office and they made the diagnosis that she had menopause and she was a crazy woman with menopause. And they didn't even examine her properly. Physician's assistant, non-MD, the first person to do a thorough exam. Three fibroids the size of racquetballs. And that's what was causing the bleeding. In addition, she had an ovarian cyst, 2.5 centimeters, a left cyst. Then her mother, interestingly enough, if they had done a complete history, the mother had the same situation, bleeding fibroids, almost needing a transfusion. Her mother died of breast cancer. That's going to tell us a lot, as I'll get to in a minute. So hemoglobin during that period had gone to 6.7. Um, so now the genius gynecologist, having missed the diagnosis, immediately rush her, want to rush her to a hysterectomy. But her hemoglobin, she'd managed to get up, not with their help, just nutritionally up to 11.5. She said, I'm not going to do a hysterectomy. Those organs belong there, refuses them. And she doesn't do it, never had to do it. Also, another thing is she, she mentions, as I'm doing the history, I said, you didn't want to do hysterectomy because you wanted to keep your, your uterus and ovaries. She says, yeah, and also there's another issue. I said, well, what's that? And you always learn from Beja. Oh, my terrible allergies. They're so bad. Allergies to chemicals, foods are so serious that I don't think I would survive the anesthesia and the medications they give around surgeons. Oh, tell me about your allergies, because she was coming for uterine breathing. We have people go through an application process in 20 years ago and today, and she had put as her big problem, she was coming to me for uterine fibroids, and the reason why she was coming to us for that is she thought we knew something about it. She had what's called environmental illness. Oh, that's a big thing in the alternative world. Many of you have probably heard about it. These are people who are basically poisoned by the environment. You know, 79,000 chemicals in the air, synthetics, hydrocarbons, pesticides, plastics, paint fumes, perfumes, synthetic copy, you know, synthetic inks and copiers. There are people who react to all of that, and life is a misery. They're basically sick from the environment, all kinds of allergic reactions, usually psychiatric things that we call psychiatric, fatigue, malaise, depression, decreased concentration, they can't think clearly, intrusive thoughts. And basically, the chemicals are short-circuiting their, their, uh, their, their neural tracts. So we're talking about her allergies. She said she had a really healthy childhood, and she said the allergies really began at age 15. She said she'd had some acne and itching skin, some chronic eczema. Parasympathetic dominants tend to have skin problems because the mediators of inflammation, based on massophils, lymphocytes, are leaky. So they tend to get skin problems. You can touch them and they can get hives. So she mentioned that in passing, that she had pruritus, and I'm thinking about what I'm going to do with her, chronic eczema. Chronic hives, parasympathetic dominants get chronic hives because they're, they're, the cells that mediate inflammation are so leaky, easy to give out the medi mediators of inflammation. At age 15, she kind of throws this out in passing, had a motor vehicle accident, and thereafter she developed severe chronic neck pain, severe shoulder pain. Over a period of years, gradually worsening muscle pain, migratory arthritis, arthralgias associated with chronic fatigue, malaise, depression. After the motor vehicle accident, she had chronic asthma. She said never had asthma until she had the motor vehicle accident. Sinusitis. She also developed, after the accident, age 15, chronic headaches. After the motor vehicle accident, she was in traction, had a neck brace, a spinal tap was done, and they botched it. It leaked for two weeks. After that time, she was so sensitive to chemicals that when she had her wisdom teeth out, she actually blacked out during the procedure. It must have scared the heck out of the dentist. In her late 20s, she, she realized that conventional doctors had no idea what was going on with her with these allergies. She was getting allergic to more and more foods and more and more chemicals to the point that she, every time she'd try and write, she'd be spacey, cloudy-headed, couldn't concentrate, memory was going. She put herself on kind of a plant-based, organic, whole foods diet. No sugar, white flour, white bread, thinking this was ideal for her. She also saw an acupuncturist to help with the myalgias and arthralgias, the arthritis and muscle pains. The nutritional changes helped somewhat, even though, as it'll turn out, this wasn't the right diet. as a plant-based diet, a sympathetic dominant. She's a parasympathetic dominant. She was on the plant-based diet. They helped somewhat. Just getting off white sugar and all the junk food and chemicals helped her. At age 33, however, the respiratory allergies and asthma worsened. She saw at that time a clinical ecologist in West Virginia. Clinical ecologists are sometimes conventional doctors, sometimes alternative doctors that specialize in patients that are made sick by the environment, by food and chemicals in the air. And it's gotten to be a very sophisticated kind of subspecialty of medicine. Theron Randolph in Zion, Illinois, was really the dean of the clinical ecology, he wrote a textbook called Clinical Ecology. And he had a unit in a hospital in Zion that is now the 
tra cancer treatment centers of America. You see their ads all day long on TV. In those days, it was a general hospital. And he had an entire floor. And he was the first clinical ecologist who would set up an environmental unit where it's all non-toxic and filtered air and filtered water. And patients would strip down and put on organic cotton gowns, gowns and they'd be fasted for a couple of weeks. And then he would test one food at a time and find out the reactions and chemicals. And they could be in those units for six weeks to two months, kind of isolating. So he, that's the clinical ecology. He trained some people. She saw one in West Virginia who got the idea to put her on an injectable vaccine for allergies. After one dose, she blacked out, which must have, she's scaring all these doctors every time they do something, something terrible happens. And thereafter, she reports that most foods and chemicals would produce blackouts. I mean, this is not a minor thing. And she's not a crazy woman. This is a very serious writer with a great reputation. Very severe, migraine headaches, hives, stuttering, weakness, blurred vision, couldn't concentrate. In 1983, she actually went to Theron Randolph. She, he was the dean of clinical ecology. She was told allergies are a problem. She went to the unit in Chicago. She told me, and I have it right here, he fasted her for six weeks. Well, I don't know how anyone could survive that, but basically he put her on a water fast and that would introduce maybe a food a day to see how she reacted. Put her on a diet. That didn't really lead to anything. Often the clinical ecologist would put people on a rotation diet, kind of defines what it is. The theory behind the clinical ecology in terms of food and rotation diets is the frequency of exposure produces allergies. So if you space the foods out, you become less allergenic. So they have four-day rotation diets, seven-day, 30-day rotations out for really allergic people. And what it is you can take for a four-day rotation diet, you can eat a, that food once every four days. And they give you these diets that are so elaborate. For example, Tuesday for dinner, you can have sea bass with pecans, and quinoa, and then Wednesday for lunch, you can have goat cheese and pine nuts, and then Friday for dinner, you can have spinach, and you have to keep rotating these foods, spinach and uh, a piece of you know, antelope, and it gets complicated because you're on a seven or eight day rotation diet. You can only eat that food every seven or eight days. You run out of foods, so they start eating wild animal meats, and there was a place in, in Illinois that would provide wild animal meats and esoteric fruits and vegetables you know, from Africa and these places because it was so difficult. That diet to me, and I say this as an alternative practitioner, is a catastrophe because first, it teaches the clinical ecologists, I respect them, I respect all doctors, you know, people criticize everybody and I don't want to be like that. But it teaches patients that the environment is the enemy and food is the enemy. We all know the environment stinks. Yeah, there are chemicals in the the food. I live in New York City, it's polluted. I follow my diet, I do fine there. Um, you know, yeah, of course I live by my rules and follow my diet. But when you teach people that the environment is the enemy and it's going to make them sick, and food is the enemy, it's going to make them sick, the mind accepts that. The mind controls the brain. The brain controls everything else, including the autonomic nervous system. And their mind is stronger than anything. If you teach the mind and program the mind Pavlovian that the food is the enemy and the environment is the enemy, the body will start responding accordingly. What happens on these rotations, I've seen, treated dozens of patients who've been through these clinical ecology programs, is they get worse and worse and worse. And you have to go from a four-day rotation diet to a seven-day rotation diet because they're so programmed that the food's going to make them sick. And the clinical ecologists, many of whom I know and I respect them, they're trying to do the best they know how to do, is they really emphasize how awful the food is and how awful the environment is, a thing that should be nurturing like food and things that should give us joy like the world we live in, even if it stinks and there are problems absolutely become perverted and that these are the, you have to live in almost isolation. A lot of these people who get involved with clinical ecology, the patients do end up living in isolation. They have the special houses built where they can't leave and I have patients come to me in gas masks and so terrified they can't fly because they'll get sick on the airplane. It creates a prison. Life becomes a prison. So she then didn't do well with Theron Randolph who was the dean of clinical ecology. Then she consults with a, a doctor in New York who's a friend of mine, Leo Galan in New York, who in those days was big on the macrobiotic diet. The macrobiotic diet is a plant-based diet with lots of cooked food, the opposite of raw food, lots of grains, nuts, seeds, beans, occasional animal protein, but very rare. It's basically a vegetarian diet. All the doctors she's seen have put her on some form of a vegetarian diet, except for Randolph. One of the problems with a rotation diet is there's no concept of the autonomic nervous system involved. One day you're eating foods that stimulate the parasympathetic system, next day you're eating foods that stimulate the sympathetic system, and the nervous system ends up forgetting the fact what it's doing to the mind about the enemy and food being the enemy, food and the environment being the enemy. It's bouncing the autonomic nervous system from meal to meal and from day to day. She consults with Dr. Glenn, very well trained, very good physician, put her on a macrobiotic. In those days, this is 1983 when she started with him, um, the, all the rage was candida was the cause of all e evil in the world. Put her on nystatin, nizoril, candida results. It's a fungus infection, as many of you know, yeast that often grows when you've been on antibiotics too much. Puts her on nizoril, nystatin. 
She improved, but then lost ground, started doing worse. Um, her allergies were better, worse, developed carpal and tarsal tunnel syndromes, which ultimately improved, which we switched to a raw foods plant-based diet. Her hormones began to worsen, severe PMS, depression, bloating, abdominal pain. She continued with Dr. Gallen for five years. 1988, she began homeopathy, which did nothing. Then she went to a famed uh, endocrinologist, Dr. Becker in San Francisco, to put her on Synthroid, which helped for all of four weeks, and she got terribly worse. When she came to see me, she wasn't feeling well. Tired, fatigued, depressed, basic, couldn't function, couldn't, memory was down, or oh, the bleeding, uterine bleeding, which actually was the, the most important pro problem when she first started giving me her history, but in retrospect was probably the least, and the e easiest to deal with, the least important product, uh, problem. She was still on a rotation diet, plant-based, rarely ate red meat, um, feels weak, fatigued, allergies were worsening. It goes on and on, burning, pruritus, skin problems, red streaks that would suddenly appear on her arm like something out of a horror movie. She just wasn't feeling well. Now here's her problem list, handwritten, 12 problems, and this is really understated. Uterine fibroids, one, uterine fibroids, ovarian cysts, severe environmental illness, universal reactor, that's the term in clinical ecology for someone who reacts to all foods and all environmental chemicals. Welcome to a horrible life. PMS, four PMS, five fibrocystic breast disease, six petite mild, seven Epstein-Barr cytomegalovirus, eight allergic migraines, nine, uh, nine hypothyroidism, 10 asthma allergic, 11 pneumonias, five times in the past 10 years, 11, 12, irritable bowel with diarrhea. Immediately, you folks have been listening to me for four hours, God bless. Immediately, well, first thing is she's a parasympathetic dominant. Who else is gonna get pneumonia five times in 10 years with someone with an overly strong parasympathetic? And immediately, in her history, and history tells you everything, she'd been on various vegetarian diets for about 15 years that had pushed her into parasympathetic hyperdrive. No wonder she was so spacey, foggy-headed. She had asthma. Asthma occurs when the parasympathetic system is too strong. She has irritable bowel with diarrhea. Diarrhea occurs when the parasympathetic is too strong. She has hypothyroidism. When the parasympathetic is strong, it shuts down the thyroid. She had allergic allergies. Allergies occur when the parasympathetic is too strong. Calcium leaches out of the cell membranes. The cells that mediate inflammation, basophils, mast cells, lymphocytes, neutrophils, um, have leaky membranes, the allergens easily penetrate, the mediators of inflammation, bradykinin, serotonin, histamine, leukotrienes, uh, cytokines, easily leak out. These are people that are so allergic, so alkaline, so parasympathetic, you touch them and they get a hive. Literally, they will drink water and say they get a reaction to it. It's just because they're too parasympathetic. So that's the first, she, she'd been on all the wrong diets from all these well-intentioned, expert, alternative, and conventional physicians. Every single one of them had put him on some version of a plant-based diet, some raw food, some cooked food, macrobiotics, cooked food, all of them raw, all of them, all of them wrong, all of them inappropriate for her neurophysiology, guaranteed to make her worse. So the first thing, I know immediately from the history, I'm dealing with a parasympathetic diet, but there's something else here that's kind of a clump of symptoms that by themselves may mean nothing, but together mean a lot. Uterine fibroids, ovarian cysts, PMS, fibrocystic breast disease. John Lee, some of you might have heard of him, now deceased, was a family practitioner out in Mill Valley, California, who first pointed out some 25 years ago that we live in a sea of estrogen. A lot of synthetic hydrocarbons and pesticides, phthalates from plastics, plastic off-gassed hydrocarbons, pesticides, dioxin, these all have an estrogenic effect. A lot of them actually, you know, estrogen has four, it's a four ring cycle molecule. A lot of them mimic estrogen, both in structure and in effect on the body. And he said a lot of these chemicals not only are estrogenic, but they tend to suppress progesterone. Women produce two main hormones, as, as you know, you took all took physiology, estrogen and progesterone. During the first two weeks of the cycle, estrogen predominates. Estrogen causes a proliferation of the endometrial linings. It regenerates after the, uh, the sloughing off from the period. The last two weeks, progesterone predominates, progesterone prepares the endometrium to receive the fertilized uterus should it occur, should fertilization occur. Now in our environment, Lee claimed correctly that we're, women are overloaded with synthetic estrogens from the environment, and birth control balls and other things, so they tend to have too much estrogen throughout their entire cycle, 365 days a year. And that produces a predictable pattern of events. Estrogen is proliferative. It stimulates the proliferation of breast and uterine tumor. That's what it's a uterine uh, cells. That's what it's supposed to do. It, it stimulates the regeneration of the uterine line after it's been sloughed off. It's a proliferative hormone. Progesterone is anti-proliferative. So estrogen causes st stimulation of all the estrogen-dependent tissues, including the breast, the uterus, and the ovaries. 
So with estrogen excess syndrome, which is epidemic according to Lee and other people who have taken up his mantle, produces fibrocystic breast disease, breast cancer. She didn't have breast cancer, but her mother did. Uterine fibroids, her mother had fibroids, she had fibroids. Endometriosis, uterine cancer caused by too much estrogen, even conventional gynecologists recognize this, and ovarian cysts. So she had the classic syndrome, according to Dr. Lee, of estrogen excess and progesterone deficiency, which is a setup for a disaster, including breast cancer and endometrial cancer. So the first thing I told her, I mean the second thing I told her, first I told her you're gonna to have to eat meat, but I told her we're gonna to have to put you on natural progesterone, not the synthetic Provera, which is not the same. You can't patent normal bioidentical hormones. Bioidentical hormones are hormones with the, with the exact structure as the hormones produced in the woman or the man for testosterone. Um, synthetic hormones that are prescription drugs are, are tinkered with because you can't patent a natural hormone, but you can patent a tinkered hormone. So they're all synthetic, but those are the ones that cause breast cancer and endometrium, that really cause the breast cancer problems in, in great amount, the synthetic hormones. So first thing, I'm gonna put her on natural progesterone. Second thing, I design her diet. She's an extreme carnivore, all the wrong diets for you know, 15 years. She needs red meat two or three times, and her eyes almost opened up. She said, I've been craving meat for 10 years, but I thought it was gonna be you know, my enemy. No, fatty red meat with the fat, grass-fed, of course. You know, beef cattle are supposed to eat grass. They're not, they're not geared to eating grains. And all these E. coli infections occur because in the, grass, in, in the non-grass-fed animals from the feedlots that are feeding them grains changes the pH of the stomach, and they develop E. coli. Grass-fed beef doesn't have E. coli in the stomach and won't poison you. It also has a completely different proportion of essential fatty acids and proteins. So it's got to be grass-fed, easy to get. And even those days, it was pretty easy to get. Um, the diet I designed her, we have special tests that we do, told me exactly what diet she needs to be on. No fruit at all, no grains. In 20 years, she's never eaten a grain. 20 years, she's never eaten fruit. She did well, she does well, with root vegetables, beets, carrots, potatoes, sweet potatoes, cruciferous vegetables, broccoli, Brussels sprouts, cabbage, cauliflower, but not kale, which is cruciferous, because that's a leafy green, too alkaline. Um, she does well, real well with squash. She doesn't crave fruit. She does well with nuts and seeds, which are very fatty. And the meat has to be fatty. The Eskimos knew that an all meat diet has to be fatty. They didn't know about mathematical percentages, but they'd worked it out, as Stephenson saw, as McGill University, when they studied the Eskimo saw, it was 80% fat, 20% protein. To survive on a high meat diet, it has to be high fat, as Atkins knew, it has to be high fat, not high protein. The problem with the paleo diets, which are very common today, it's high protein. It should be no more than 20% protein, 80% fat, if you're gonna be on a predominantly all meat diet. So I said it has to be high fat, otherwise you get Eskimos knew on a high, what we call protein, they know it as the red part of the animal, that you get sick, that it has to be high fat. And they would eat the fat, the fatty organs like the brain first. Stephenson pointed that out. So I said it has to be high fat, root vegetables, no fruits, no grains. To this day, she eats that way. Secondly, we put you on progesterone. Third thing, which is the real case, she saw dozens of doctors, and I, I don't say this you know, pompously like I'm so smart. It's tragic that so many of my colleagues don't know how to do don't know how to do a history properly. The most important thing in her history when everything crashed was a car accident at age 15. Why is that important? She had terrible whiplash. She was in a neck brace for a long time. You, you know, she'd seen, been seen at the Mayo Clinic. Any kind of head trauma is gonna, first, it's gonna change the, the structure of the skull bones. Skull bones are not fixed the way they teach in medical school anatomy, like cement. No, they move, they have a pulse. They're supposed to move. Secondly, any kind of head trauma, minor or, minor or major, is gonna affect the cervical spine seven cervical bones, eight cervical nerves. The first bone of the cervical spine, remember from anatomy, is the atlas, like Greek mythology. Atlas holding up the earth, atlas bone holds up the skull. B.J. Palmer, the founder of chiropractic, said the atlas is the most important bone in the body in terms of the nervous system function, although many have taken his therapy far from where he was. A lot of, a lot of degree, to much extent, he's correct. The atlas is important for a number of reasons. First, it is right underneath the skull, and when it's out of adjustment, the skull bones start shifting. You can end up with TMJ problems. The skull bones can move, put pressure on the brain. She was having that. I was sure of it. Secondly, the lower brain stem fits right. The atlas is shaped like a disc. All the cervical spine bones, remember, are shaped like this. The lower brain stem sits right into the atlas. And when there's a torquing in the atlas, it puts pressure right on the brain stem. Well, what's in the brain stem? All the autonomic centers. The autonomic nervous system goes crazy. Third point. Remember from anatomy, there are two vertebral arteries that go right through the cervical spine bones that feed the back third of the brain. When there's torquing of the cervical spine, it puts pressure on the vertebral arteries. It compromises blood flow into the back third of the brain. Now, yes, there are collaterals, of course, in the brain. You know, nature is protective of us through the, the, uh, the anterior arteries. But you don't want your vertebral arteries torqued and squashed. 
And the problem with the atlas bone, once it goes out of its normal alignment, it never pops into place spontaneously. Now, the atlas should be parallel to the ground and perpendicular to the spinal column. Even slight misalignment would put pressure on the brainstem, which fits right, the lower brainstem fits right in the atlas. And it, it'll affect the blood supply in the back third. And the symptoms can be variable with whenever the atlas is sublux, including my, often, chronically, migraine headaches, spaciness, fatigue, you know, they can't, the brain isn't getting enough oxygen, it weighs two and a half pounds, uses 25% of all the body's energy. Even slight, uh, that slight reduction in the blood supply to the back third of the brain can be a real problem. Now, of course, as you guys know, the, the visual centers in the occipital lobe, which is in the back of the brain. Very often when the atlas is sublux, people get visual problems. She reported as one of the side, side symptoms that later came out, she had, after the accident, she had a lot of visual problems. Now, I've been studying structural therapy for 35 years. A lot of them aren't that helpful. The greatest structural therapist who will ever live, in my estimation, is Roy Sweat, like perspiration, SWE18, Atlanta, Georgia. He's 87 years old, trained as a chiropractor at Palmer, which is the, the top-notch chiropractic college. We had a very interesting experience. Third year in the clinic year, you know, when you start experimenting on each other, in the clinic, one of his fellow classmates did a rotary break, which is the classic chiropractic maneuver where they take it and pop it back and forth. And after that rotary break, Roy had symptoms he never had before, numbness and tinkling down his arms, spaciness, cloudy headedness, and he was scared. He, tell, he tells me that, you know, I've known him for 27 years. He said it was really, really a very discouraging problem because he went to his professors and no one could help him. They would do the rotary break and made him worse. And he was getting neurological symptoms, which he didn't have until his fellow chiropractor adjusted him. And he said, I don't know if I can really go into this as a profession based on what's happened to me. He was very desperate because he was feeling lousy, struggling to get through school because suddenly he wasn't thinking as clearly. Learned about the work of John Grostick in Michigan. Grostick, great chiropractor, died in 1959 at a young age from a heart attack. And Grostick realized that the most important bone in the structure, as Palmer had said you know, 80 years ago, is the atlas. And he spent his life just adjusting the atlas, and he developed special x-rays to determine the precise angle of misalignment of the atlas. And he went a completely against general chiropractic with these rough adjustments, where he did a gentle adjustment, very gentle, you could barely feel it, only on the atlas. And he accepted Roy Sweat as a patient. Got Roy, after one adjustment, was well, numbness tingling resolved. And Roy became his protege. And when Grostick died, Roy took over that, that movement and eventually developed instruments that are so sophisticated that he doesn't even use his hands. You lie on a table, he, he, he worked with mathematicians, determines the precise angle of misalignment of the atlas. He goes with an instrument with a stylus used, using vector mechanics. It's so precise, the pressure is like a tap. You don't even feel it, but the entire spine will pop into place within seconds, and I've seen the fluoroscopies proving that. So I'm talking to her, and I said, look, there's no magic nutrient in the world that's gonna take care of a structural issue. Your atlas is probably a mess. Your skull bones are probably moved. She said, yeah, oh, yeah, I have, I have TMJ problems, yeah. I said, your visual, your visual centers are probably, oh, yeah, I developed terrible blurred vision. It's never really, it came on suddenly after the accident. I said, well, the blood supply to your occipital lobe is being compromised. You gotta see Roy Sweat. Roy Sweat's trained people, most of them aren't very helpful. I said, you gotta see Roy. Goes down there, one adjustment and her migraine headaches resolved. This is how good Roy is and why other chiropractors hate him. Their job's to keep you coming back. His job's to keep you out of his office and get you well. 14 years ago, I walked into a glass door in my apartment house that I thought was open. I didn't, was, was thinking about science, as my wife will say. Almost knocked myself out. Started having dizziness. My IQ went down 20 points because my blood supply to my atlas was affected. And I got through that week in patience. That Friday, I flew down to Atlanta. I knew where I had to go. He, Roy met me at the airport. He, he's a good friend. Took me to his office, adjusted me within 10 seconds. The dizziness and all that was gone. And I haven't needed another adjustment in 14 years because that's how precise the adjustment is. I mean, he's taking care of people like this that have terrible trauma. It takes a while to get them stabilized. Fortunately, he was teaching at Palmer in Iowa, not too far from where she lives, so she would go up and see him. So we did a, a whole series of things. She saw Roy Sweat, that took care of a migraine headache. So no supplement is gonna take care of a migraine headache when it's structurally induced. We put her on progesterone. That stopped the uterine bleeding within two cycles. John Lee said that often uterine fibroid bleeding is a result of estrogen excess, and uterine fibroids are always the result of estrogen excess. Progesterone blocks that, and her, not only did we save her uterus, but her fibroids regressed, even before she went into menopause. The other things like met Epstein-Barr and CMV, she had Epstein-Barr and ended up in the hospital with mononucleosis. Well, that's a, par a common parasympathetic problem. They're very susceptible to viral infections because their cell membranes are so leaky. Viruses, remember, reproduce within the cell, 
And with the leaky cell membranes, they very easily penetrate and they have a safe haven because once you're inside a normal cell, you're protected from the immune system. You're, you know, you're blinding the immune system. So that was, that was part of being parasympathetic. As soon as we put her on the red meat and the right su supplements, all these viral infections resolved. The, the, Uterine fibroids, ovarian cysts, PMS, fibrocyst aggressive disease, all resolved. Petite mild that she'd had, and the migraines, that was because of the structure and the compromised blood supply to the back third of the brain. Um, the hypothyroidism, as soon as their sympathetic system turned on, the asthma, pneumonia, was five times in 10 years, all that resolved. Basically with her, she'd been pushed so parasympathetic by well-intentioned, but well-meaning but poorly uh, thinking doctors that put her on various forms of plant-based diets that only made her sicker and more parasympathetic dominant. To this day, as I said, she eats red meat three, two to three times a day, the limited vegetables, root vegetables. She loves red meat. She doesn't want to eat anything else. She's of Irish descent and her, she has relatives in Ireland. They're way up in Northern Ireland. They're all meat eaters and they, they own cattle farms and that's what they live on and that's what she should have been living on. Not some fancy macrobiotic diet. That's not what she needed. So here's a case where autonomic imbalance coupled with structural problems, coupled with the hormonal imbalance because of the environment, all were very obvious in her first history. If you know how to take a history properly, if you always keep autonomic imbalance in mind. And if you don't, you, you know, it's just a lot of disparate symptoms that make no sense with the model from Gellhorn and Kelly and Pottinger. You're able to look at someone like this with her 12 medical problems, immediately see a parasympathetic dominant, treat it with the wrong diet, or got two parasympathetic dominant, ended up with asthma, pneumonia, allergies, all these things. Terrible head trauma, which is just another problem that added onto it. And um, the hormone imbalance caused by the environment. So she's done really well. Now her, her condition got a little bit more complicated because a year after she started, when she's in great health, riding again, she lives out in the West where there are deer everywhere, hits a deer. Yeah, wonderful Bambi deer. So they weigh about 300 pounds. And it, you know, the 200 people die each year from accidents with deer. Her tar car was totaled. She ends up in a wheelchair paralyzed. This is after she's been on my program for a year. Goes up to the Mayo Clinic and they say, you're never gonna walk again. Terrible car accident, her tar car was totaled. And they say you have transverse myelitis, which they thought she, because of the trauma, she now had a viral infection in her spinal column. She still had residual viruses at that point. And they said, you're never gonna walk again. I said, that's a lot of baloney. So she, Roy Sweat was teaching at Palmer. She, she would go there every month when he was up there teaching from Atlanta, and he would adjust her, and we put her on some antiviral herbs. Within six months, she was out of the wheelchair walking. Her career has never been more productive. She's, got a, she's gotten interested in sustainable agriculture and wrote, wrote a play on sustainable agriculture that's being toured around the country, and the Department of Agriculture has invited her down to speak about a few months ago. She's really, her career's just taken off. She feels great, she looks great. All her symptoms, all her problems are resolved. And here's a woman that, if, had she continued along the route with well-intentioned but wrong-directed alternative practitioners pushing her into parasympathetic dominance, she would have ended up with leukemia lymphoma and died. So it's, it's just an example of how using an autonomic model can really give you insight into how to deal with a patient, whether you know a physician or a chiropractor or an optometrist, you always have to think in autonomic physiology. And also, incidentally, your vision improved. Questions? We have time for questions. Kara, you tell me. You're the boss. Some questions. Yeah, this gentleman here. Well, first of all, you know, we can't raise the dead. If someone can't eat, they can't do our program. And, you know, we've taken patients out of compassion, young people with terrible, you know, they can't eat. They can't do the program. We, st we spent two years studying patients who didn't get well, which is a small percentage. And we can, we can get their supplement orders. There's only one company that supplies the supplements that meet our standards. And we can get their supplement orders and determine whether they comply or not. Of the group that didn't comply, nine out of, the group that didn't do well, nine out of 10 times it was compliance. Success rate, um, I, I avoid ans answering that question simply because it, it sounds like a reasonable question. But when you say, in fact, we've written an essay about it, which we're going to put on our website. It's been published, but we're going to put it on our website. You know, like breast cancer, there are all kinds of different kinds of breast cancer, ductal carcinoma in situ, lobular carcinoma, um, infiltrating carcinoma, poorly differentiated, well differentiated, moderately, all of them have different prognosis. Um, and then what, the size of the tumor, whether it's two centimeters, two to five centimeters, five centimeters or bigger, the number of lymph nodes involved, zero, one to three, three to five, more than nine, as I said earlier, whether it's estrogen receptor positive, progesterone receptor positive or negative, whether it's HER2 new positive or negative, there are about 25 different variables with breast cancer alone that determine prognosis. So if you have a 10-year survivor of stage one breast cancer with ductal carcinoma in situ that had surgery and came to us, 
and after the surgery and is alive 10 years later, then so what? I mean, that's, she had surgery, she's probably cured by that, which we recognize. On the other hand, if you have a stage four breast cancer patient which is in the brain, the liver, who's alive three years later, that's a miracle. So, you know, when you're having a private practice situation, we have people with all kinds of histology, all kinds of prognosis, all kinds of previous therapies. Um, it's like, it, it, it's not like a controlled clinical study, but having said that, we estimate that of the patients who are compliant, of that group, 80% of them do well long term. Um, some of them just, even the ones of that 20%, usually it's compliance, they just can't do it. Sometimes there are patients that do it well, that don't do well, but that's rare. It's really a question of compliance. And I don't credit myself, I mean, Dr. Beard was a genius about the enzymes. This gentleman here. Well, we have our own testing, and people say, well, so what? They, we can't go to your office, but you're, you know, all that. I understand. You know, it, it's really not that complicated. People should be eating the foods they generally like, and people should avoid experts. People run into problems where they avoid what their instincts tell them and listen to experts, like this woman following various vegetarian diets. People that are genetic meat eaters really like red meat. They enjoy it. They, they'd rather have pot roast than dessert. They don't crave fruits and sal they don't want to eat a salad. They hate salads. They force themselves to eat it. They shouldn't be eating salads. She never eats salads, this patient. Uh, so usually you, you should eat what you like. Genetic vegetarians don't like red meat. They feel sick when they eat it. They hate it. Their idea of hell literally is Christmas or Thanksgiving dinner. It's too heavy. It's too rich. They want to have a salad or a candy bar. Balanced people will eat at a smorgasbord and take a variety of foods. So you can usually tell by your own instincts. Um, it's not as precise as the testing we do, but, you know, because we don't have academics aboard, we've never been able to get our testing out into the world where it would be available to anybody. It's available in our office, which doesn't help. But you, having said that, it's, it's really not that complicated. You should follow your instincts and ignore experts, because usually your instincts are smarter than any expert. Any other questions? You've been a very good audience. I appreciate your patience over the last four-plus hours.